Today, we have Lee Davies, and I did watch him on Neil Samworth's podcast, so huge shout out to Neil Samworth. If you haven't seen the podcast we did with him, we did one in the Guildford studio, we did one in the Liverpool studio, Eddie Short's on, me and Wildman were quite dressed as if it was winter, and then we've always had a massive laugh with Neil, and it's great to see he's now got his own channel. So... If you want to watch prison guard stories, etc., please go down to Neil Samworth's channel on YouTube. And um, his stories are very hard-hitting indeed, which is exactly what we like on this channel. Now, Lee was a former prison guard who ended up in trouble and going to prison. So we got a twist on the usual story. And before I... Ask Lee how he got there. We're just going to jump right in with a story about when Lee came across three ex policemen in prison, ex policemen from Liverpool, who ended up in prison because they were robbing drug dealers and keeping the product and the profits for themselves, apparently. So. <laughs> Thank you very much for coming down from Lancaster, Lee. You're welcome, pal. Nice to meet you. Yeah, nice to meet you too as well. <laughs> and tell us then, you, you bump into three bent coppers. Yeah, <laughs> so, you know, your early introduction into life in closed conditions prison, uh, I come across three ex-job, shall we say, um, three ex-policemen from Liverpool, The Matrix. Uh, some of you will be familiar with that. Uh, What's drug, The Matrix? I think it's a drug squad, isn't it, in Liverpool? Like a, an intelligence-led drug squad. So I believe. Um, and yeah, there was three lads in there that were, it had come about, they were going to, I presume, drugs raids or drugs busts. Um, and shall we say, not returning the profits back to the station uh, one way or another. Um, and just a quick one on that. I was on the same unit as them, although I wasn't in the same cell. And after a year of being in closed conditions myself, I had an option to apply for Cat D which is open conditions, um, you know, a lesser category. Uh, and one of the policemen thought it might be a good idea to do this himself. Two of the others stayed in closed conditions, I presume fearing what might happen, you know, because as we know, in open conditions, there's a lot more opportunity to, you know, you know, become involved in violence or be, be caught up in it. Uh, but one of the lads uh, decided to follow me to Sudbury in Derby, a uh, big open condition place almost like an old RAF camp, um, just to, you know, to set the scene. Uh, you have your own key to your cell. Um, there's a lot more freedom. You can, in, you can go out to college courses. You can engage in, you know, all kinds of different things, charity work. And that's what they want you to do. Cat D, as you know, Sean, they want you to get back into the community and to start to show people that you've learned, you know, the lesson of crime, uh, to which we all have, haven't we? Yes. Yeah, yeah, we have. <laughs> Um, so, you know, this had gone on for a couple of months. I'd, you do your lay down period, you tick all the boxes, um, you, you say your please and thank yous, and they say, right, you can now go out to work. So I'm off out now at Derby College enrolling in an electrical course, which is now what I do for a living, knowing full well that I would never work for the Queen again. She, she doesn't like me. Um, she wouldn't even let me be a postman, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a true story. Um, so I've off doing the course in Derby College. The policeman, now uh, to give everybody an idea, it wasn't posted around the jail that I was ex-prison staff or he was ex-police staff for obvious reasons, as we all know. I knew maybe naively, as we've spoke, that I might be all right because I'd had no grief to a certain degree. Um, because I was doing what I was doing, and we'll get on to that. Um, but for policemen in there, it's a different kettle of fish. You know, you've got to be one brave bastard, really, to put yourself in that, or stupid, one of the two you decide. Um, so he has got to the same open jail. They've put him in the same cell as me. So we've got a share, we're on a billet, we've got our own key, and people can come and go as they please. <laughs> Cue the problem. <laughs> I'm out doing my course. He's now a trusted driver of the minibus that takes prisoners to Derby Town Centre to go about their work. And two days a week, I'd be in the jail working in a prisoner hub. Because of my ex-background, I was quite good at the paperwork side of things, and I would help lads 
if they were struggling with applications, court papers, et cetera, et cetera. So two days I work in prison. I'm sat in there and I work with two Scouse lads um, and get on really well with them. That's fine. I've gone back to my cell. This is in the afternoon. Dinner time's come. I'm pissing about on the PlayStation 2 because I've been a good lad. Um, and I've got a whack, whack, whack on the door. You know, the cell door opens and you think, oh, shit. And, the, the, you know, they're looking at me, in, intense look, and I'm thinking... Who's they? The two lads who I work in the hub with, the two Scouse lads. So it's bang, bang, bang on the door again, and I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell, here we go. So I've kind of opened the door gingerly, thinking, right, they know I'm an ex-prison officer. Are they going to come in and have a bit with me? So like I've said on Sam's, I'm looking around my room thinking, what can I fucking hit them with if, if we go at it, you know what I mean? Anyway, they've come in, sat straight on the bed, put the kettle on, lad. I'm thinking, thank fuck for that. So I'm now thinking, well, hang on, there's a reason for this visit. Right, we've got a problem. I said, okay, what, what's the problem, lads? And I'm thinking, shit, something's you know, going down here. Right, we know that you're an ex-prison officer. We've known all along. And I'm like, <laughs> fucking hell. And I was like, right, all right. Again, thinking, right, so if they know what is coming... And then, but the problem is, mate, uh, the lad you share a cell with is an ex-police officer. Now, I've at that point had to... I knew he was, obviously, Sean, because I'd come out of the same nick. I just wanted to get on and do my sentence. I don't want to be creating havoc. You know what I mean? I don't want to bring any heat to me because I'm a fucking ex-screw. So they said, right, the problem is, mate, he's an ex-police officer. And another thing, he's an ex-drug officer. Now, obviously, all the lads on my landing, you know, 50% of them might be drug dealers. So he's an ex-drug officer, and not only that, he's part of the Matrix, and he's been having people off, taking drugs for himself, taking the cash for himself, and this is a problem. And I was like, right, okay, well, what do you mean by problem? Uh, right, tonight, we really like you. The lads have said, we don't want you on the bill here tonight at 8 o'clock. Make sure you are not in this room. We do not want you involved in it. And I was like, involved in what? He's fucking getting it tonight. And I said, you know, being stupid, getting what? Kick it? No, he's getting it tonight, like that, that action. And I thought, oh fuck. So I'm thinking, I I have to be technically on the belay because if you go off the belay, you're then technically absconding. I know you're not absconding, but I'm thinking, fuck. What do I do with this, Sean? Now I know this lad has got three little daughters. I've seen his missus on visits in Shrewsbury. I've sat face to face with his family. I've I've sat in this room with this lad, and I'm thinking, fuck. What do I do now? I know he's going to get popped. So whether it be a grass, whether it be not a grass, I had a decision to make and I sat in my cell. They fucked off. I sat in my cell. I didn't finish my PlayStation game, as you can imagine. And I thought, right, you need to do the right thing here. I can't see someone's dad. I'm not whiter than white. Listen, I can't see someone's dad getting stabbed up because I've not fucking helped him. Doesn't matter what I think of the lad. Doesn't matter what I think of coppers. Doesn't matter what I think of anything. So I had that moral dilemma then. And at some point, my moral compass kicked in. I went and found a screw, which was which was obviously alien to me at that point. Uh, they weren't happy with what I've done. Um, so I found him and said, look, I've been given some information. I'm not going to tell you where it's come from, What? but I'm telling you something's going to go on this tonight in this fucking billet, and he's going to get it, so you better move him. Stupidly enough... I'm now technically a grass. So all they did straight away, Sean, they took me to the block, segged me off. He was out driving the van. They brought him back into the nick ASAP and said, you know, there's a threat to your life. He's blocked off. There's two sh uh, cells in Shrewsbury block. I'm both sat in there with him now and I'm thinking, I've just shafted myself up the arse here. They didn't know what to do with us for two days. He come in, he said, what's the problem? I said, well, technically you're the problem. You know, you're going you're gonna to get it. Um, nothing, nothing from him. Just like, oh, where are we going next? And I'm like, I've just fucking lost my King Cat D here, technically, and I've just lost my college course. All this had kicked in. So I've been sat in that cell for two hours then, stewing over, shit, what have I done, what have I done? Have I done the right thing? Are the lads going to fucking get me? Are they unhappy with me? It all, the mental game kicked in, mate. So he's come in, and I said, you're the problem. I've technically just fucking saved your ass. Nothing. No big thank yous, no back slaps, no high fives. Where are we going next? I was fucking, I was like sat there like that. So I managed to get a call to my mum and I said, I think my mum were coming down to Derby on the Saturday. Let's say this was the Thursday or Friday. I said, mum, 
this has happened. I honestly can't tell you where I'm going. They didn't know where we were going. We're in that block for three days because they didn't know where in the prison system to send us because of obviously now there's threats. They've, as soon as prison paperwork, if there's a threat to life, it's a fucking big hoo-ha, isn't it? Um, so we ended up, mate. I was in the car. We got chucked in a taxi. You can have your little £10 Nokia. We'll talk about them later. <laughs> you can have your £10 Nokia and I've got dzz, 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 loads of texts coming through on my phone. Obviously, all the lads have got my number in there because we'd go out working together. So I'm getting texts now and the names are coming up and I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell. And uh, do you know what, mate? Fair play to the lads. If you're out there, thanks for that because it's come up. We know you had to do what you had to do. Don't worry about it. It's no big thing on you. There's going to be no issue where you're going. So I'm like, again. So hold on a minute then. So in the lower security levels, mm. you're allowed to have a Nokia phone. Is that what you're saying? So in a Cat D, you will have, if you are eligible to go out to work yeah. and voluntary work and college courses, at the gate, you will have a locker. I don't mean a phone within the billets. Yeah. You have a, a normal prison phone that you need pin on that needs to be checked. Yeah. Um, but when you're in a lower cap D, you can have a mobile phone at the gate. Mm. You go to the officer on your town leave or your, your home leave. And as long as you've been a good lad, he will sign your rottle, release on temporary license, which basically says the prison will allow you to go out visiting fem family friends and you get issued your mobile phone because we're working in the town centre. We need picking up. And they can track you through that and everything. I don't know about track, but it's it's more of a communication device. They can ring you and say, you know, where are you? Why are you half an hour late back? Yeah. Oh, do you know what? We've got a flat tyre on the bus on the way back. Right, okay. And then they will check that. And can you call anyone on that phone and get on the internet? Uh, you can't get on the internet. It's got to be a very basic phone. So you're literally looking at your Nokia 3210s. Um, but you can technically call anyone. Um, as long as you there are no comebacks from it, um, i.e. a member of the public says, I've been getting calls from this number, they will contact the jail, you will then get it taken off you. you know, obviously, in Cat D open conditions, you are at the lower risk end, so there's no real... When I say no real, I've no doubt they will do checks, but it's not fucking, you know what I mean, like closed conditions where everything's stringently checked. So you're saying then that the guys from the prison who knew what you'd done started to send you texts yeah. saying... We know what you've done. We're still going to give you a pass. Yep, yep. Because you, you felt it was the right thing to do. Yep. I mean, I got on very well with the lads on the billet. I yeah. Got, I, I, the policemen didn't, but I integrated with them very well. Um, and thank yet again, thanks to them, that's not just down to me. But technically, I was one of the lads. Um, but although, obviously, they knew apparently what I'd done. Yeah. Um, so he's latched on to you then, the cop. Yeah. And you're in a taxi now. We're in a taxi now on okay. the M1 up to... They wouldn't tell us where we were going. Oh, did so, you say this was the prison where Sean, the Sean Bean thing, the time? Right, was so that's, that was the closed prison. So the, the documentary that's just been on TV, Time, Yeah. Um, I recommend it. Do you know what? As far as prison documentaries goes, I mean, you obviously know... Everyone's telling me what's watch yeah. the Sean Bean. I, I kind of cringe watching these, you know, police yeah. prison documentaries because I think it's just fucking not like that. But that one is about as close as you're going to get. Yeah. Um, but the prison, I noticed it straight away. Now, there's been a few documentaries recently. Shrewsbury now, where I was closed, in banged up initially, that got closed down because it's an old Victorian, almost castle. Maybe old 300 people. <laughs> it's spooky as fuck. Um, big, dirty old wings, you know, with the nets on. <laughs> people fucking shut the cell. It's got four floors, very condensed, 300 people in it. And it is, if you could paint a picture of a, a prison, that's what you would paint if you was a member of the public. So I've noticed it straight away. As it's come on the documentary, I'm thinking, oh, fucking, you know, like PTSD kicks in and you think, oh, I know mm. that place. And I swayed away from watching it for a few weeks, although everyone was getting on to me, you need to watch this. I mean, they know my background, so they were saying, you really need to get involved in this. And I'm like, I fucking really don't, because I spent two years there. <laughs> do you know what I mean? Sorry, a year there. Um, so, yeah, so where Sean Bean is, if you do get to watch it, his cell where he gets a kick in, I was four doors down from it, um, wow. which is weird. When you see it happening and you think, I can't hell, wow. you know, that's it. Yeah, That's where I was. It's surreal <laughs> in the sense. And you see all the, as you go downstairs, there's the pool table, you know, where people could get a beat in. It shows on there. There's a gate there where people used to line up for the medication. And images come back in your mind and you think, I remember seeing cues outside that gate. You know, of people waiting for methadone and people playing pool and even the noises are coming back and I'm thinking, yeah. wow. And he did. When I watched it, mate, I'm not going to lie to you all. When I watched it, 
I was, I could feel myself, you know, I could feel the anxiety. Yeah. After it, after it, I kind of calmed <laughs> down, but I'm sat there kind of watching it thinking, fucking, I can't believe that was me. I read a few reviews on it. One said that it was extremely realistic, but one person said that the only unrealistic thing was he had a mentor, like a staff member men was mentoring him or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that was, doesn't happen. That was a bit <laughs> off piece, wasn't it? <laughs> Almost stopped short of him giving him a cuddle, but yeah. <laughs> but no, yeah, it was good. It was a really good portrayal of how, I mean, the guy, I'm not going to spoil it too much, but the guy is a teacher and obviously he goes in there as a fairly straight-laced guy and it's his introduction to the, the criminal world as such. So the, that's the hard-hitting side of it. Mm. Obviously, when you guys watch this, um, the, there's an element of a prison officer story side to it that mm. <laughs> that you will probably relate to for what we're going to speak about. So, yeah, no, it's a good watch. I'd recommend doing it. All right, let's go back to the story then. You're in the taxi. Mm. What did you say? You're on the M1 or something? We're on the M1. Now I'm a Newcastle fan, football. Um, so I'm thinking, okay, am I going to end up in Newcastle here? This might be a touch. I can go on my town visits to Newcastle. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, you're not. Um, there's a small jail, open prison up there, which is closed and open, called HMP Kirk Levington. Mm. Again, an old stately building. It's got half its inmates, closed conditions. Um, half its inmates, it's got like a cat D stuck on the side of it. Mm. So we arrive there. Um, they tell us just as we're coming, it's actually based just outside Middlesbrough. A shitty little town in the northeast. Mm. Um, so we get there, you know, bags unloaded, two big burly screws on reception. Now, up until then, I'd kind of not had much to do with prison staff, um, purely for the fact that I don't think they were the biggest fans of what I'd done, as you could imagine. But also as well, I tried to distance myself from it because I didn't want people thinking, well, he's an ex-prison officer, is all fucking pally with the prison officers. I wanted to separate myself from that world because I knew that it probably caused me more grief. If I was going to do it, I was going to do it on my own, you know what I mean? I didn't... So we've got there, two big burly screws, and it was a case of, right, okay, name, that, that, as you do, search. There's your key. You actually had a key. Even though it was in closed conditions, you actually had your own room. Now, for the first time, you've been in prison. This is a monumental moment for any man in prison because I'd always had to be banged up, toed up with someone. And in Shrewsbury, you literally, it's a, a six by eight cell or eight by 10 cell. You're on a bunk bed. You've got a shitter in the corner. So you're having to sit with a fella who you might not know. You know, you don't know his background. You sat there watching him take a dump while you're watching Coronation Street. You're living in a toilet. You're basically. living, basically living in a toilet. It's not... Let's have it right. It's horrible, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Shitting, farting, wanking, picking the nose, exactly, everything. Yeah. 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 All and all his stress is becomes your stress and probably vice versa. If you want to watch Coronation Street, he wants to watch EastEnders. There's all kinds of incel, you know, anxieties and, and issues. Um, and if you get put in with a fucking nutcase, you're ruined. Um, so, so yeah, Sudbury was the same as I've told you. I was toed up with a copper, a little bit bigger room, a bit more freedom. So it felt like you had a bit of a life. You know, you could walk off down the toilet, down the shower. Uh, so I got to Kurt Levington and I was given a key. And I thought, Christ, a key? <laughs> There's your room. And I said, what do you mean, my room? And it was like, well, yeah, you've got a room. You're a single cell. Ooh, I was like, get better than that. Phenomenal stuff. Yeah. So he's gone off to do his thing. He's got a different room. So now I've kind of got that separation. I don't have to be seen as the lad with the copper or the lad with... So we've gone off and done our things. Um so I've told you I've done my lay down period at Sudbury I've started to do things like town visits where you can go out the jail on a Saturday from say 9 till 5 you can go out into the local town centre you can meet family to kind of integrate you back into society so I've done all that I've then got a home leave booked from Sudbury now, I'm going to say Sean this is now Christmas time so the home leave that I had booked was the first time I would have been allowed home throughout my sentence for three days. That was booked via Sudbury. Got into Kurt Levington. Clearly the staff fucking knew who I was. They didn't like me straight away, even though they don't know me. So I've gone to this place. They have a hub, the same as I described in, in Sudbury, but it's run by screws instead. So my beeline straight away is to make sure I've got this home leave because I want to see my mum, my dad, my family, the missus. I, that is my sole purpose. Gone to the hub. Two women in there. I can only describe them as fucking Sharon and Tracy. 
I've said, right, uh, you know, good afternoon, ladies, uh, etc. Um, I've my name's Lee. Yeah, we know who you are. I thought, oh, fucking hell, here we go. And I said, um, I don't want to bother you too much, but I've got a home leave booked on, say, the 23rd of December to the 27th. Wh- where's that booked at? And they fucking, I thought, I said, it's, it's actually booked through Sudbury. Well, that's Sudbury, isn't it? That's not Kurt Levington. So I thought, oh, here we go. This is the this is the trail here. Now, I've got a few stories like this of just random stuff happening. So I've said, all right, with all due respect, and you, you can kind of fool yourself. Go, bear in mind, I've been sat on the M1. I've been kiboshed in a segregation unit for three days. I'm ready for fucking blasting. I'm just ready for anger. So they've gone on that route, and I've said, <laughs> with all due respect, ladies, I've not come here through my own admission. I've not done anything wrong. I've come here you know, with no offence. I'm here because the prison service have transferred me. Yeah, we know why. I'm thinking, well, you're kind of answering your own question here. So I said, well, for what reason would I not be allowed on a home leave? Right, right, we've told you once, we've told you twice, leave. I'm thinking, is this fucking really happening to me? I've just <laughs> saved someone's life. All I want to do is see my mum and dad. Um, so anyway, this has gone on for two or three days. I've gone back again. Now, this time there's a different screw in there and... It was a, a, a man. I sat down. I said, look, I've, I've got a problem I need to discuss with you. Right, okay, what is it? And I've explained the same again. Meanwhile, I wanted Sharon and Tracy's come back in. I've told you the other night, you need to apply and you need to do a laydown period here. And I said, well, I'm not having that. I started to get off, you know, on my fucking IOS. And I said, I'm not having that. It fucking goes against all policy, et cetera, et cetera. I've done nothing wrong. I've got all the paperwork to prove that I'm eligible. I pass all the security checks. da 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 Go away. That's what you get. Go away. And I'm thinking, I'm, th- I'm thinking all along, fucking 10 months ago, I had your uniform on and you're giving me this shit. So I'm like, what do I have to do here? So I found uh, a woman in a suit walking down the landing and I thought, well, she looks quite, you know, authoritative. So excuse me, um, can I have a word, please? I've got a problem. And she said, I, I'm, I'm governor such and such. And I thought, fucking bingo, fallen on a governor. So I said, I've got a problem. I said, your staff are not dealing with it particularly well. I said, I'm such and such. She, I don't think she did know who I was. I said, I've, I'm an ex-prison officer. I've come here. I'm not asking for any favours. I just want what I'm entitled to. Right, okay, you're going to have to leave it with me a day or two. Lo and behold, fair play to her. She's gone away and sorted it. Uh, and I did get home on my home leave. Wow, usually you never hear back from them. <laughs> right, so... I t- do you want to say, I'll get right yeah, on yeah. that. Oh, I'll get right on it, yeah. <laughs> Fucking I'm still here six years later, rotting. Um, there's another quick one on that. I'll tell you what, we'll cover this one quick because we're talking about the yeah, two... Yeah, don't, don't cut any long story right. short, though. We've got right. all the time in the world. This, so, this is absolutely fascinating. So the two Sharon and Tracy's we're talking about. So you know in prison, for everyone out there who doesn't know, you almost have like an internal mail system. To get anything done, whether it be... Your teeth looked at, uh, a lump on your ass looked at, um, <laughs> a talk with a governor, a talk with probation, a talk with a drugs counsellor. You've got to put an application in, a shitty bit of paper. You post in a letterbox, usually on a wing. The prison officers, will, if they can be asked, will come in in the morning. You will have an applications officer. He will get all the list in front of him and say, right, Atwood needs to go out to the dentist. Davis needs to go to, well, whatever. Um, and it will get signed off and you will get a reply back under your cell door. That's technically what should happen. And it should be done really that day, if possible, um, because there are nominated staff to deal with it. Let me tell you, it isn't. Um, And shall we say, if said officer doesn't particularly like you or you've had a run-in, it's unfortunately, it's part of the the human nature. It shouldn't be because it's not professional, but applications do go missing, shall we say. Um, so these two ladies in this jail, because it was open conditions, stroke closed, you had to go into the hub to hand your application in. Now, I'm, I've told you the story that I've just told you. What do you think they're going to fucking do when I ask them if I can go out to the dentist? Um, cost me a lot to get these done anyway. Um, so I'm starting to put applications in like, am I able to attend? Because the college course had gone by the wayside. So I've now, looking at it from a victim mentality... I've lost two years of my life doing an electrical course because I've saved that copper. Listen, that's part and parcel of it. I'm not bitching about that. <laughs> I am. Um, <laughs> but I am. Uh, so it cost me two years when I got out. So I had to re-enroll. So I had to fund it myself. Um, so where was I got? Right, Sharon and Tracy. So I'm putting applications in now, Sean. Can I go out to maybe do a course? Can I go out and see the dentist, go to the hospital, 
etc, etc. Nothing's coming back, mate. Now, meanwhile, I know lads are putting applications in on the same day. But they're coming back the same day. <laughs> so I'm starting to, I'm really getting on it now and I'm putting apps in. Um, and I'm fucking twigged on at this point. I thought, they're just fucking me right off here. So this has gone on, mate, for six weeks, seven weeks. The anger's just at fucking fever pitch. The only thing keeping me going now, I had a purpose in Sudbury. And it was really open. I got on really well with the lads. In there, it was like dead man's shoes for six months. I was just rotting. So I've got on my eye horse now, and I'm thinking, right, how am I going to fucking work this one? Because I've got me, you know, me fucking shitted on now. And I'm thinking, I'm going to work it. <laughs> right, so there's a girl who works in education. It was now, so this happened at Christmas, yeah? It's now February the 14th, Valentine's Day, the day of love. Right? <laughs> now, there's a nice girl who works in education, very pretty. Um, so I thought, I, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to write a phony application. You know what's fucking coming, don't you? So I've written an application. Dear, let's call her Gemma. Dear Gemma, hope you have a lovely day. Happy Valentine's Day. Beautiful. Lots of lovely. Big fucking heart under it. <laughs> <laughs> now, bearing in mind, none of my applications have come back fucking around about six weeks. I posted that at half ten in the morning. I'd gone for my dinner. The door come off my fucking cell pretty much at about one o'clock. Two hefty screws. What the fucking hell do you think this is? I told I was being a clever cunt. I said, what? Sorry, what? what's that? That. Are you taking a piss? And I was like, what is it? And they, were like, <laughs> and they said, it's an application. I said, oh, you fucking do get them then. And they were like, why are you being a clever bastard? What do you mean? I said, I'll tell you what I mean. Six weeks I've been asking to go out to a dentist. Nothing's coming back. I said, you lot are fucking hiding my applications. All oh, right, we are, are we? Right, maybe you need to come and have a chat with your governor. As in, fucking hell, we, you know, we're going to send you back to closed conditions. Are you having an inappropriate relationship with our staff? And I'm like, I felt like saying no, but I'd like to. <laughs> um, she was nice. I said, no, no, I'm not having any inappropriate relationships with your staff. Right, governor such and such wants to see you. One o'clock, we'll be back to get you. Oh, fucking hell, here we go. So fucking taking me in, governor sat down, pulled the chair out. He said, no, you don't need to sit. I said, right, okay. So I stood up at the desk like that, two big hefty screws behind me. And I thought, one of them's probably going to sidewind me. And he said, what the fucking hell is all this about? And I said, do you know what? At least it's put me in front of you. I want you to know your staff are taking the piss. I'm here purely to do my sentence. I don't want any tr special treatment. I'm in here for my own doing. Everything I've done has got me here. All I want is what anybody else is entitled to. And I'm not being unreasonable. I've never caused your staff any grief. I hadn't, I'd been fucking literally quiet as a mouse. And I said, this is getting on my tits. I've applied for this, this, that, that. I started writing them down, the dates. Because you know, you've got fuck all else to do in there, have you? I started to become some kind of bookkeeper. <laughs> <laughs> so I've got all the dates and times written. And he was like, and he was like, oh, sorry, before that, he said, right, do you know where Home House is? I said, no. And he went, right, it's a cat, cat C that's down the road. You'll be going there unless you can explain this. I felt like saying, do you know what? Fuck it, you might as well send me back there because I'm rotting in here anyway. Um, I probably would have got done in in there. <laughs> so he said, right, explain to me. And I said, right, this has happened. There are all the applications I've written. Answer that for me. I've got nothing back, I swear to you. I, he's then, you could see the look on his face. He's thinking, for fuck's sake, this motherfucker's been logging it. So anyway, he said, right, just fuck off back to your cell. He said, let me leave it with me. He was all right, actually. He actually <laughs> calmed down. He was bouncing at first. Um, two big screws took me back to the cell. I swear to you, Sean, within... I'd gone off that afternoon because I'd worked in a workshop fixing washing machines and shit. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking man of all trades. Um, <laughs> so I swear to you, I got back to my cell. It was like fucking Christmas. Applications everywhere. It's like somebody, I swear to you, it's like somebody had had them in a drawer somewhere. I mean, how, how ridiculous, how pedantic is that? You know what I mean? So I'm reading through them and they've all been signed and I'm thinking, fuck, I've got about three dentist appointments today. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, no, it's just one of that's, that's, I mean, it's quite amusing, but when you're in there, you know yourself, the frustration's in there. That could, if I was of a, let's say I was in a lesser mental state, that kind of shit could technically cause ruptions. It's explosive. It's explosive, yeah. The slightest thing is magnified. Yeah. And people will just blow up and yeah. cause harm to others or themselves yeah. over tiny little things that the public think are insignificant. It is. And it, it, it literally is. It's a magnifying glass, isn't it, in there? Yeah. And let's say, for instance, I was a lad 
uh, a little bit highly strung. I could have quite easily just gone and fucking done one of the officers in. Now, if you look at that, who's created that? The officers. So one of their members of staff goes in, gets a fucking kick in, gets taken hostage. Who's actually caused it? So it's full of the systems, full of little little quirks like that. It's unfair, but hey, I knew I was going to get a lot of shit. Um, I actually thought it'd be more from the lads rather than the staff. You know, that was just my thing. But it actually turned out the other way around, if I'm honest. Um, so what happens to the cop down the run? Cop down the run, he was in a different billet to me. I'm trying to think if he ended up. I think he pretty much saw his sentence out without much more hassle, I don't think. Because at that point, you could technically lock yourself away. So there was no kind of milling around on corridors. I think he'd become very insular, sat in the room for the last four or five months of the sentence. Um, I think he was actually out a little bit before me, if I remember. So yeah, it wasn't it wasn't much to do for him really. Uh, another quick one, please go. Yeah, Kurt Levinson, right? It's just come to me now. So we're going to get into what I did, right? I was a quick synopsis. Prison officer got caught on the bend as such, um, doing something I shouldn't. Mean, and, meaning what? Uh, taking illicit items into a prison, um, or you know, drugs, mobile phones. Um, but within that, in my first few years of being a prison officer, I mean, you, if you've been in UK jail, aren't you? Visiting people. Visiting, yeah. So doing talks on the prisoners. wing, you would have, uh, the dynamics on a wing for staff are you would have a couple of officers on the landings, you'd have maybe a senior officer in the office, and you'd have someone, what they call in England, a cleaning officer. They would look after the cleaning party on the wing, the lads who would keep the wing, maybe the lads on the survey, maybe the cleaners, that keep the wing tidy. You would have a nominated member of staff who would look after that. When you're new to the game as a news group, you generally get lumbered with that job because it's quite in at the deep end. You've got to manage boys going off to work. You're in charge of numbers on the wing. So you need to know where anyone is at any one time. You're technically accountable. And you give it the newbies to kind of chuck them in and say, fucking deal with that. Um, so I was a cleaning officer on my wing, um, which was at Lancaster Farms, uh, which was a young offenders jail at that point, 21-year-old lads. A lot of lads in there from Manchester and Liverpool, two big factions. A couple of boys spread out all over the country, but mainly Manchester, Liverpool, going at each other. <sighs> hectic, man, hectic. Um, so I would be the cleaning officer, there's a lad on there. How fucked up is this? I'm in jail and I've heard it. Mr. Davis. This was when I was at Kirk Levington. So in the last few months of my sentence, Mr. Davis. Oh, fucking, you know, when someone calls you Mr. Davis, you think shit. So I looked around like that and it was a lad who was one of my cleaners on my wing when I was working as a prisoner. No. So it's gone full circle. No. Full circle. Now, it fortunately, it went well because I was take apart the me taking stuff in, I was actually, in my eyes, an all right prison officer, as in with the lads. I wasn't up my arse. I was quite a young lad myself at the time, so I was quite relatable to a lot of the lads in there. Thankfully, it went well for me. It was like, no way. I can't believe it. All the lads have been asking after you. Um, we hope it's gone all right. Have you had any shit? Uh, how's it going? Do you need anything? Because I just got in that fucking jail and I'm hearing that on the yard and I'm thinking, fucking shut up, man. <laughs> you know I mean? But no, it all went it all went all right. I had a few brews with him and that and just explained to him what had gone on. Wow. So he was actually in there at the time that I got lifted. Wow. He was one of the cleaners. Yeah. <sighs> Full so circle, man. Imagine circle. then, because you were working with the prisoners in your illegal activity, Yeah. that would have carried through and kept you in their good graces. It did. Um, to an extent. To an extent, mate, yeah. Be, uh, I, I didn't get any... I mean, I wasn't always doing illicit things. I'd done a couple of years in the job, and I'd say it was only the final year, really, that I'd become involved in doing what I was doing. Um, so it wasn't as if I'd gone in there to to do that or had any aspirations of doing that. It, it was situational. We'll get to the whys and what falls in a bit. But, uh, yeah, I was, I was treated all right on the wing, Initially, because I actually thought I was an all right lad. I'm quite relatable to young men. And, you know, I had no airs or graces about me. So I was all right in that sense. Then when I was doing what I was doing, obviously ever more so protected um, because I'm the source of, you know, illegal contraband, shall we say. But at the same time, mate, if you think about it, and I've spoke to staff afterwards, it was becoming obvious for them that I was getting no grief and that I was kind of the prodigal son 
So, so at that, that point, was a yeah, yeah, I'd, I'd yeah. lost all fucking you know reality and, and plot at that point, mate. So, so where, whereabouts were you born then in the UK? I was actually born in Lancaster. So in the jail, okay. yeah, I was born in Lancaster. So the jail that I ended up working in, I'd lived there pretty much all my life. They've got so a nice like, castle up there, haven't they? Beautiful. Yeah, you do not. You know what? That used to be a jail. Did it? Lancaster Castle used to be. It's very similar to Shrewsbury. Yeah. The documentary time. If you imagine that castle there, mm. that held three hundred prisoners up until. I want to say maybe f eight years ago. Yeah. Now it's beautiful, mate. Now they've opened it up, little cafes, restaurants in it. If you ever get up there, mate, it's stunning. Yeah, I've been up there. I went to a New Year's Eve thing up there once. Yeah, the years is ago. It a rave in a set rave on B Wing or summer or it was actually a yoga thing. <laughs> <laughs> Similar. <laughs> About six or seven years ago. <laughs> was it? By Lancaster Castle. Oh, yeah, brilliant. Yeah, yeah. All right. So you grew up in Lancaster then. Yeah. And did you have a normal upbringing? Normal, yeah, absolutely, mate. Um, normal in the sense of I was given a single parent, uh, sorry, only child parents. Um, so I was given lots of love. The, my upbringing, I, I can't have any bad word or grumble about it, mate. I was given opportunities, you know, albeit we weren't wealthy. You know, my dad was a fucking milkman, taxi driver, mum worked. But I had all the love that anybody could ever want, um, so when I later get on to kind of going on about how I've ended up how I have, I can't, there's none of it sort of relates to childhood because I had a, you know, a very supportive family. Um, and you got into sports uh, in school. Yeah, every opportunity, mate, that any young lad could conceivably want. Later in life for me, it wasn't enough, stupidly, you know, as an older man. I'm only say when I say things like this now, at that point, I didn't appreciate what I had. And for many, many years, I didn't appreciate what I truly had. Um, but yeah, so sport-wise, school was school was a breeze. Primary school, it uh, became quite apparent that I was a decent footballer, um, as do many kids have that dream sold to them and aspire to be. <laughs> you know, it's the golden fucking ticket, isn't it? Um, but, you know, but my inspiration wasn't that. I actually loved the game. Become decent at football, went on to high school. Uh, wasn't really interested in school, mate, to be honest. It was like young lads, you know what I mean? I was too busy interested in fucking women and football. If there wasn't a footballer or woman involved, I'm not interested, you know. And I, w I wish I had I actually had half a brain at some point. I wish I could have applied myself. I really do. And that's not me talking from where I've ended up. I've learned more through life than what I have through school. But I wish I could have applied myself. Um, you know, obviously I didn't have the, the acumen that you had. Um, so, yeah, football-wise, I eventually ended up it became apparent that I was a, a very good footballer. I ended up at Preston North End, a uh, professional club. Um, did all that, and that was my path in life. That's what I thought I was going to be. That's what everyone thought I was going to be. So I didn't really care much about life. I had a path. Subsequently, I got released from Preston, told I wasn't good enough. Um, For what, what? Did they give you a reason for saying you're was not a good new enough? Well, there was a new coach coming from Torquay United. Um, like football, football's a very cut and thrust kind of industry if your face doesn't fit one man does, one man thinks you're shit one man thinks you're amazing subjective it's very subjective mate it's it is what it is um so he's coming from Torquay. he's released a lot of the, the lads and he's brought his own lads in you know from down south or from other clubs that he'd been at so it was a case of right now what do i do now did that crush you psychologically being told you weren't good enough if, that, if you put all those years into it right so that ex exactly that mate and i've studied when i say studied i've done a lot of self-reflection over years that point there i think is prevalent it wasn't at the time it was just a big disappointment you know there was i'm not gonna lie there was tears in the car on the way home you've put all that time in your life people giving you yes 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 all positive you, you're technically a you know a mini celebrity around your young group and yeah and you get told you're not good enough and you think fucking hell well i've never heard that before now, as an older man, as we sit here now, clearly the thing to do would be to go to the next place, knock on the next door and say, I'm me, this is it, let's do it again. I didn't, Sean, because I've told you my mum and dad are not not in any way sporting, mm. they're not in any way involved in anything like that. Mm. All they wanted for their son is just purely, I hope he's happy, we'll give him love. If I could sport, tell me mum and dad now, I wish somebody had just picked me up, maybe not my mum and dad, picked me up, slapped me around the face and said, fucking get on with it, mate. 
but I didn't. I fell off the rails at that point. Perseverance is the key, isn't it? Absolutely, mate. Yeah, I mean, I mean that goes with with life, doesn't it? But I yeah. didn't have them life skills. Mm-hmm. You know, I was a young lad who'd been told I was good. How old were you at the point when they booted you out? Uh, about 16, 17. Um, okay. So then you think, well, what am I going to do in my life now? Fuck, what am I going to do? So I think I enrolled on a sports science course. Mm. You know, that was the the path that people were were taken at that point. It was either like computer courses. You know, we're talking like mid nineties now. You know, computer courses, sports science courses, and I did a, I did that, and it, but I didn't want to pursue it. I didn't want to pursue it anymore. The love had gone, Sean. Um, so I ended up going into the world of working, doing a bit of temp work for a company in the summer. I was offered a full time job. I stayed with them for, I think maybe six or seven years. You know, electric roller shutters, things like that. Just becoming a working man. I think probably later on after that, looking at it, it wasn't there wasn't enough adrenaline. It wasn't enough for me. There wasn't enough adrenaline. Um, there wasn't enough excitement. So I thought I need something else here. Were you still doing any kind of sports to keep that kind of energy channeled into something? I kind of lost the plot. Where I started going to watch Newcastle. I was going on the piss, mm. you know, because up until that, I'd led a very stringent kind of life where I was all my mates were started drinking started going out partying all that jazz and I hadn't I'd led a very sheltered very structured life to which I was happy with I then found that I wasn't good enough so I then started to go and watch the football instead with a few lads getting on the piss going out in Newcastle and that then becomes the adrenaline the kick the Saturday kick um and there is a lot of that there's a lot of that stuff that I geared all my life towards Saturdays where the adrenaline was, it's where you would go out after a game. You know, you'd have a drink, you'd have your football, you'd go out meeting women, probably going out to the rave scene, shall we say. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was, I'd found that, but after a while, I thought, I need to get back into football. So I come back playing semi pro, actually down in Burrsco, down in Liverpool, um, on the edge of Liverpool near Southport. So I kind of started again, but it was never the same. By that point, I was three or four years deep, and although I could still hold my own, I was never going to get anywhere with it. So I think the choice was then to kind of knock it in the head and just play purely local, you know, for a decent side with my mates and start enjoying life and football again, Mm. you know, in a sporting term. In the midst of working for this firm, um, I was approached, uh, are you aware what a retained fireman is? No. So... To give the guys an idea out there, you have a fire service. Um, some of it is retained, which is basically firemen on alerters. You would have a pager, usually in rural kind of villages, because they haven't got the finance to have, say, 10 firemen on that station because they attend three fires a year in the village. Mm. They would have a retained fireman. So you have a pager, usually a man like yourself or me with a job. Um, the pager would go off, you go to the fire station within five minutes mm. and you go out to the fire or the car crash or whatever. The public, you would never know. All you see is a fire engine. The fact is you might the lad might work at Morrison's or the lady in the front might work for the tax office. Mm. No one knows. So I was offered the chance, the fire service come to the place that I worked and they said, would anyone here be interested in joining the fire service? I thought, fucking hell, that sounds all right. <laughs> yeah, that sounds all right. I'll have a bit of that. I was still quite fit. Uh, I said, yeah, yeah, I'll be, I'm up for that. What does it entail? So you go off and you do your, you know, your fitness assessments. I think there was maybe five or six people that went for it. I think, if I remember, I was the only one from my work who who got it. Um, so I thought, oh, fucking hell, this will do. A little bit of adrenaline. Um, running up and down ladders and putting out fires. Yeah, I'm fucking game for that. <laughs> so, yeah, so I went to do that. And I was maybe a couple of years into that and I thought, I'd like to do this full time. So I thought, right, that's my path in life now. Forget the football bollocks, forget the whatever, forget the drinking, forget the women. Come and be a fireman. It's a career, you know, and it's a pension. And you, what we believe, you know, that's the, for a normal working man, that was my ceiling shall we say i wasn't business minded like yourself i didn't i wasn't really an achiever but i wanted something for me in there and the fire brigade give that give me that you know i was helping people yeah there was a fucking ego boost let's have it right 
you know, running around in a big fire engine with blue lights on. You know, <laughs> you, you do get a bit of an hard on sometimes. Um, so yeah, that was that was my path, mate, and that's what I concentrated on. I thought I'm going to join full time. Fire service is quite difficult to get into full time, and because the recruitment back in then, mate, we're talking now 2006, 2007, the crash. Technically, you know, for the services, there was a lot of cutbacks. They were looking to trim every service back, i.e. the prison as well. Um, so it was difficult, and I got offered up a job up in Grampian. Now, obviously, I'm from Lancaster. To be a full-time fireman in Grampian, it meant going up there on my own. I'm in the fucking middle of Aberdeen, and I thought, no, it's not for me. I'm just going to wait on a bit. I thought, you know, I'll get, I'll get there eventually. I'm just going to hold out for a bit. Um a couple of years have passed now. I'm still doing it part time at this point. So a couple of years have passed, and I'm getting nowhere with it, mate. I've gone to York, North Yorkshire. I've, you know, they I passed all their tests, and I thought I'll move to North Yorkshire. It's only over the border. I can come back, do four on, four off. They recruitment freeze on them, and it was just it kind of like all the fucking they weren't lining. I was not getting anywhere. Mm. So I've gone on holiday to. Turkey, a cheapy out of Do you remember when you used to be out of book holidays in town? They would have it in the window. 200 quid, Marbella. You go in there and it ends up 600 quid. But I think it was like, <laughs> honestly, mate, it was like 100 of, uh, 2006, 140 quid, one week, three star Turkey. And I thought, <laughs> fuck it, let's do it. So I rung the missus up. Right, come on, we're off to Turkey on Monday. And I thought, if the worst comes through us, we'll get there. It'll be some shit all. I'll book us in another hotel, but at least we've got the flights for 140 quid. So we get there and it's actually all right. Turkey's good, isn't it, for prices? I love it. Yeah. I love it. I love Turkey. I've, yeah. I've been back ever since. So we're sat there around this pool in this little jobby and my phone's ringing, ring, 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 mum. And my mum's like, mum, what do you want? I'm on holiday. You know I'm on holiday. Uh, the fire service has been on the phone. I said, oh, fuck. I said, they know I'm on holiday. And they went, no, no, no. They want you to go to Chorley on Monday. They've got a space on a full-time course. I was like, are you taking the piss? This was like, say, Saturday or Sunday. And I was like, oh my God. I said, Mum, I've just got here. I said, let me ring them now. So I've rung them and I said, what's all this about? You know I'm on holiday. He said, right, someone's dropped out of a course. We know you're, I mean, I must have been down the pecking order. Two people have refused it because they've gone off to do other things. Can you get to Chorley? We need you there. Eight o'clock Monday morning. I said, I can't. I've just got to Marmaris. <laughs> Marmaris is where it was. Um, so I've checked the flights. No chance. The only thing I could do, I think I could get into one of the London ones, I think around nine in the morning, and said, right, well, we, you know, we need someone there for all the admin. And I said, right. I got, again, saw my ass. Bad attitude, poor attitude again. So they know with the football. Now I'm getting this from the fire brigade and my head's gone at that point. I thought, <sighs> fucking, where, what do I have to do now? And I'm not playing victim. I'm only giving you an idea as to how my head worked at that point. It's very different now. We all know I should have got back on the wagon, got on it, Anyway, so carried on the holiday, was in a right stink. Got back, and this this is a key point, this one, mate. I've got back, and I've said to her, I don't think I'm going anywhere with this fire brigade shit, the missus at the time. She said, no, keep going, keep going. Uh, my girlfriend at the time, her mum, put a big star by this. Her mum worked in the prison service. <laughs> 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 and, there, and there the seed be sown <laughs> so did you have a nice you know something to the like of did you have a nice holiday yeah fire brigade run me oh you're joking why don't you apply for the prison service <laughs> sorry what <laughs> fucking I wish I could change that conversation now <laughs> why don't you apply for the prison service I said no nah, what, what, what the fuck would I want in the prison service I didn't know nothing about them at that point you know there was two prisons in Lancaster I knew that and I knew that technically <laughs> Prisons were bad. That's all I knew. So anyway, this has gone on. Fast forward a couple of weeks, couple of months. Prison service are recruiting. Why don't you put an application in? You know, there's fucking adverts now. <laughs> <sighs> She's like, well, it's, you know, it's X amount. It's 30, I think it was like 30 grand a year at the time. Much less now, mate. We can get onto that in a minute. Mm. Um, much less now. So it was 30 grand. Uh, it was a pension. Technically, there was three jails within 20 miles of me. You know, you've got Preston. Lancaster Farms, Lancaster Castle. Um, and I think at the time you applied for, it was like central recruitment in the sense if you put an application in, they would come back to you if you were successful with a number of jails that you could work in. So you didn't really pick your jail. You didn't say, I want to work at the castle. They come back with a list, usually fucking strange ways to be on there or something. So I've put an application in through gritted teeth. 
And again, I take full responsibility. I'm only saying it because that's that's how it happened. That's how the seed was sown. So I've put an application in. She said, oh, it'll take about a year to come through. Okay, now, about six weeks later, post comes through the door. <laughs> HMB <laughs> recruitment. Mm -hmm. um, so it's come back. You have been successful. Mm -hmm. Application. That we would like you to attend. You have to do basic testing, maths, English, all that shit. That was down in Preston. We'd like you to attend. That was a couple of weeks later. I've gone down. Da -da 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 boom. Off again. Oh, you won't hear back for a while. A couple of weeks later. <laughs> I'm getting off fire. This is getting serious now. I'm starting to sweat. <laughs> thinking, shit, what have I done? <laughs> so they then invite you for JSAC's job. Fuck it. To cut a long story short, role play. They want to see you as a member of the public, what you're like in certain situations. I mean, listen, we've both been in jail. The situations they put you in, they're not worth a wank. You know what I mean? You've got an angry shopkeeper. What, what's an angry shopkeeper going to do when you've got three boys coming at you with a load of pool balls? You're not going to relate back to your angry shopkeeper, are you? are going to fucking leg it. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, what did I do on my training? Well, I calmed him down. I asked him to sit down and put the kettle on while someone's coming at you with a machete. Um, <laughs> so no, yeah, you do like a job selection and they put you, there's a microphone in the middle of the room and they will send someone in the room. It might be someone who's sad. It might be someone who who, who needs uh, apprehended. It might be an angry shopkeeper and they want to see how you deal with it. The six of them, I think, in total, various different things. You then do some more testing after it, written, Probably, I think I remember about certain situations and how you would react. I think they call it psychometric testing. Um, so I've done all that. That was over in Leeds. Come back, thought no more of it, carried on with my life. Uh, and as you guessed it, postman again. The postman was a busy bastard at that point. <laughs> <laughs> so he's put it through the door. We'd like to offer you a place on a POELT course, prison officer entry level training. <sighs> I'm thinking, shit, what do I do now? Do I do it? Do I not do it? Do I carry on with my life? Do I carry on trying to get in a fire brigade that seemingly I can't get to? Or, and this is a big lesson for any youngster out there, don't settle for second best. Mm. You know, without sounding cheesy about it, I've settled for second best there. Now, where I've ended up is purely what I did. But by me accepting that second best, I put myself in that situation to then become corrupt. If I'd have stuck on the path... I'd have been in the fire brigade. We wouldn't even be having this chat now. So just a little message in there. Um, so, yeah, so I've gone and I've discussed it with family. I've discussed it with her mum. I've discussed it with people who I knew that worked in the prison service. And I thought, you know what, actually sounds all right. Oh, they, they picture it to be a fucking right nice job, working with people, helping people. Bollocks. Absolute bollocks. Um, <laughs> let's, let's have it right. It isn't. Um, so... Yeah, I've accepted it, and I think the training is, it was at HMP Garth Wymott, which is at the back of Preston. It's two jails next to each other. One is mostly sex offenders, and the other one, I think, is a Cat B off the top of my head, so relatively secure. So the, the entry-level training is there, and you go on at that time. It may have changed now. I'm talking 10 years ago. You go on a, I think it was a two-month course where they have you in a classroom, they have you in control and restraint situations. They have you various team building, all prison-based stuff. And I think at that point, we might have done, if I'm honest, it might have been one-day training on corruption in the prison service. Now, you guys know out there, one day of corruption training, the biggest problem in our jails at the moment is obviously contraband, corruption, things like spice, things like cannabis and officers bringing it in, because it's quite hard to get stuff into prison legitimately, shall we say, via visits, via whatever. So your natural source go-to, if you've got any clout in there, would be to get a prison officer on board. Um, so, yeah, there was a bit of training regards that. Uh, if I had my way now and if I had input into the training, I'd say fucking 50% of the training should be based around corruption, um, you know, and what can wait for you. Because let's have it right. I'll say this now in the middle of it, what I was doing was completely wrong, not only on a personal level, not only to the people that I worked with, but also the lads in there. I wasn't helping them. Even by bringing stuff in, you cause, albeit good for them at the time because it was a quick fix, uh, a head change. I've been in jail myself needing that. 
Um, it didn't do the lads any good because it can cause a lot of grief, a lot of violence. Um, so I know we're talking about it openly. I do massively regret what I did because it put a lot of people in shit situations. Well, let me just say something. It's unstoppable because it's an iron law of economics. Yeah. When the government, by drug laws, makes worthless plants more valuable than gold, that product is always going to keep flowing, no matter how many Lee Davies get arrested yeah. and put in prison. The drugs always flows into the prison. It does not stop one yeah. way or the other, and it gets more prolific, stronger, creates more problems every single year because of government policy. Drug laws have created the drug problem, and until the government reverses the root cause, this is going to get worse. Up, listen, absolutely, amen to that. Um, three things that make the world go around: drugs, money, sex. Um, drugs in prison. If if I was bought, let's say for instance, I was bought for five hundred pound, the money made in drugs, it doesn't matter. There's so much money to be made. They'll go and offer the next man seven hundred quid, a grand. It doesn't matter. It's just a, a perpetual motion, isn't it? Of, and it will never change. Like you say, until the government step up on it, and they have by the looks of things, they do token gestures. You know what I mean? They're, they're not asked about it, are they, really? Because it creates... If HMP isn't full, HMP is a hotel. Now, you imagine that as a Holiday Inn. If that Holiday Inn isn't full, Holiday Inn's going to go bust. So look at the uh, probation system, the police system, the prison service. They make money. Let's have it right. They're a business. The politicians, it, it's their cronies that own these businesses. Absolutely. absolutely. They want the status quo. Exactly. Yeah, and sickening. people like me are just a paying guest to a certain degree. Um, and guests create money. So until someone steps in at a higher level, we're going to be having this chat for many, many years till, till you and I have both gone off this planet, mate. So you said you were sat in class doing training. Did you have to do any physical training? Um, as regards what? Prep, push-ups and running and things. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking full, <laughs> yeah, full exercise session every morning. Um, yeah, you did, you did a little bit, but it was all... So you do a physical assessment before you go in you know, to show that you've got a certain kind of strength mm -hmm. and a certain level of fitness. Same with the fire brigade, they do things like bleep tests. So you had to prove that you was, mm -hmm. I mean, looking at some of them now, fucking, I think they must have missed the assessment. <laughs> um, and the weird thing is, when, when you're in there, so you do an assessment when you're going in and they obviously want you to be in, you know, trim and, and fit and healthy mind and all that. Look at some of the officers in there now and this is no slight on them. They, they you know, we're talking 50 odd year old boys and girls they're not doing any fucking fitness training. The only training they're doing, like I was doing when it got to me, the only training they're doing is that. So To mass incarcerate people, they've had to lower the standard because if you go back decades, the prison officers were like ex-military, weren't they? Serious boys. But now some people have described it as like your average Tesco worker can go and apply for a job at the prison. Exactly that. As long as you, yeah. can, as long as you can, let's say, hold a conversation to a certain very basic level. Let's say you can also pass a clean CRB. Mm -hmm. And even that, even, they're still even getting in with, you know, with you know with ABHs and stuff like that. As long as you declare it, as long as it's not mass and it's not drug related. And I even think, I think, I think you can get in, mate, with, you know, with low level drug charges, mm -hmm. depending on how far it is down the line. But you're right, especially in the private sector, prison officers now, I think their entry level pay and... I want to say it's 18 grand when they go in. I mean, I'm not slating 18 grand, but 18 grand for a youngster. And the, the officers are getting younger because they're painting the picture to the young ones that it's a career. Because where, like Neil Samworth says, where is there an everlasting supply of people needing work at the moment? Youngsters coming out of colleges who are young and impressionable in their life and they want a career. If they're not business-minded like yourself, they will look at the prison service and think, oh, fucking hell, that sounds all right. I get to wear a nice uniform. I get a bit of clout. I get to help people if that's what they believe they're going to do. But at 18 grand, I mean, what's that a month? Let's say, what, 1,200 quid a month-ish? And there's so much unemployment now as well. It's easy to take advantage of young people. Exactly, pal, yeah. exactly. So you're going in there, you're putting, let's say, for instance, um, and I know this for fact, you're putting a 21-year-old in there, and they do take them that young, 20, 21. I mean, how can a 21-year-old... I mean, there are always going to be exceptions to the rules or I've got different people that will have different skills. How can you put a 21-year-old in front of a very hardened chap, shall we say, who's been involved in crime all his life and expect them to have all their wits about them with 
in my personal view, with no real life skills themselves. Do you know what I mean? They, they've, been for disaster. they've been brought up on fucking YouTube for Christ's sake. <laughs> so it, 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 it's a recipe for disaster. And also, if you look at a lad in there, like I've said, you're offered 500 quid to bring a mobile phone. It's not right, and it wasn't right when I did it, but you can understand why someone might think if they're in a bit of shit in their life, they earn 1,200 quid a month. Someone says, I'll give you 500 quid to bring in a Nokia 3210 tomorrow and say no more. There are going to be some people that get caught, and there's a massive problem in the prison service at the moment. They don't tell you about it in the media because they're fucking embarrassed. The jail that I was working at, I know there's an ongoing thing up there at the moment. It's not in the media yet. And it was someone who slated me to high heaven. This, this is me getting a bit catty now. It was someone who slated me to high heaven when I got caught doing what I was doing. I was just been caught doing the same thing on a large scale. Now, part of me thinks, well, fuck me, karma's a bitch. But part and the media don't know about it. And I'm really intrigued to see where that goes within courts because I'm going to give you a snippet now. Ten years ago, I got a four-year sentence. Now, four years in British law is when you hit four years on the head, it's deemed as a serious offence. And when I say a serious offence, I don't mean, you know, gangster shit or whatever. I mean that it follows you for a good seven years after your licence finishes. So you trying to get back in the working ladder, so fuck, it's following you for 10 years. So I'm intrigued at the moment. The prison service, it's that prevalent that officers are bringing stuff in what they're being done now, Sean, the officers are being caught doing what they're doing. They're getting taken to the gate. They're getting the keys taken off them and fucked off. Not even sent to the police station or courts because it's that rife. And it's embarrassing for it's, them. It's then. embarrassing. Um, and again, if we look at it for the lad's point of view, if it's that prevalent, why are the prison service not doing anything about it? When I go in, I got sir. I worked there for, say, three years. I reckon I got searched twice. Why isn't there as they do at strange ways, they have a full, you know, a machine that screens you on the way in. Costs some money. Why isn't every jail got that? Costs like some sandwich, money. It costs some Maximizing money. Maximising profits. And are they that asked about it? It gives you, if they're exactly. not, if they're not going to put them on every gate, that gives you an inkling. They're not asked. So your son and daughter's in there. Again, take away what I've done. I didn't help. Your son and daughter's in there and the prison service are not fit for purpose because they're not installing these machines at every gate. Like I've just told you, I was searched twice. Again, go back to the young prison officer that's there now. They're earning 1,200 quid, 500 quid to bring a phone. If I'm searched twice in three years, if you look at the balance of probability, <laughs> it, it's fact. So you end up at Lancaster Farms after your training. Training. So I'll, I'll give you a... So training was, say, two months. In the middle of that, mate, what they tend to do, they'll send you back to the jail that you're going to work in, um, albeit not allowed to kind of, you know, involved with prisoners. They will send you back to that jail for a couple of days, um, shall we call it, suck it and see, have a look at what you're going to go into. So you'll be with an officer and you'll just walk around the wing and obviously all the lads on there, hey, oh, the newbies here. You, you can tell them, you know, you've got your hair cut, fresh white shirt on, looking fresh as a daisy and they know straight away. So I walked in there, that was an eye-opener. First I, day. First day. Because you're not a fully trained prison officer at the moment. You're just someone who's training to be one. So you're chucked on a wing. And on a wing in Lancaster Farms is... It's a split wing. You've probably got 80 lads on either side. First thing that hits you, mate, you open that door, is the fucking noise. It's like... It's like chaos. You've got 80 lads shouting across at each other. Doors banging. People shouting, fucking pass me burn, do this, do that. Oi, this, it's just overwhelming, mate. For someone who's never been introduced to that, it's scary shit. I've done two days there, and at that point, alarm bells have started to ring to me because I thought, what the fuck have I let myself in for here? And at that point, I should have just said, here's your fucking keys, do one, I'm off. But I didn't, because I was embarrassed. I didn't want to admit to anyone that I'd made a mistake, and I didn't want to, because, you know, there was an element of bravado as well. I was a young lad, all my mates are saying, Oh, I was fucking prison service going. I can't turn around and say, oh, well, actually, it's fucking horrible. I'm going to shit myself. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, yeah, so I've gone back to jail and I've, the seed's been planted there, mate. I've thought I've, I've made an error. But I've gone on with it through ego, through bravado. I've gone on with it. Um, it was the biggest mistake I did, really, by what I was doing. Should have chucked it back at him and said, not for me, thanks. 
So so uh, you had a fresh meat. Yeah, exactly. Fresh meat scenario. And all the lads, they were all 21. Liverpool, Manchester, some big rum old lads. Um, and at that point, I was a fairly naive, skinny little thing. Um, and it just wasn't... Looking back on it now with a bit of humour... It just wasn't for me. Whoever fucking thought that I was going to be a prison officer? <laughs> they must have been pissed, I tell you. Um, so, yeah. So I've gone, done the rest of the training. You go back to your jail and then you start on your wing. Again, there was maybe six or seven new prison officers all dispersed around the jail. Um, so then you really do get into the nitty gritty. You then become, like I say, the cleaning officer. So now you've got, on the wing, you've got a big board. You've got 70 lads going past you. Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, have you done my application yet? Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis. And I swear to you, mate, it is 24-7. It is a very stressful job. Um, anybody who does it, you've got my respect to a certain degree. In fact, you have, because it is difficult, mate. You're on there. I'll give you, for example, first few weeks, I'm on the wing. I've used this in Neil's. 140 lads either side, six prison officers, three on either side, 140 lads. I'm sat on a wing with 21-year-old lads who were FD in Liverpool, who were FD in Manchester. Their interest isn't, isn't really in the screws. They don't, listen, keep under the radar. They're all stuff's going on in the jail. They're against each other. You've got fucking lads banging each other from Liverpool, Manchester. You've got Manchester versus Manchester because within that, around that time, there's four or five gangs, and I'm not going to name them, but we all know who they are. There's four or five gangs that have got boys on the wing all from them different factions. It's, so, it's okay to name gangs unless you personally don't want to. Yeah, well, no, but it means, you I know. I guess it's yeah. like Salford, Moss Side, yeah, Gooch. Yeah, all that jazz, Dodd yeah, yeah, and all yeah, that. Yeah. So they're, they're in there having their own gang wars, then throw Liverpool into the mix on the fucking same wing. It, uh, uh, <laughs> I mean, look at me, I'm not exactly Hulk. <laughs> you know what I mean? You're in the middle of it, fucking pool balls going, there's bangs. I was... The alarm bell was going 10 times before I'd had a bacon bun, mate, in the morning. You'd be rolling around the floor with six 21-year-old lads trying to fucking split up whatever. One of them's got a pool ball around his chops. And you're in the middle of it thinking, it's 9.30 in the morning. Let me get out of bed, man. This is what blows my mind, though, no, because in America, everything is bolted down. Like, you're not going to hear of pool balls, pool sticks, weightlifting equipment. Yeah, no. It'll be instantly weaponized. Yeah. But all that stuff's allowed in the UK. Fucking 21-year-old <laughs> lads. I mean, the, the, Neil Samworth says how you did it in there. I mean, it is the most mm. supercharged. You've got 21-year-old lads. They're full of fucking adrenaline. They're full of sperm. Gladiator school. Gladiator school. So then, like I said, chuck Liverpool into the mix. It Fucking hell, it's mayhem. So anyway, the first, one of the first associations, which were lads are allowed out at night... All the doors open, so if anything's built up in the day, all the doors unlock. There you go, lads, crack on. It's like fucking Royal Rumble, like WF. Um, fucking Hulk Hogan coming in with big leg drop and that. Um, so the first association, I'm a newbie at this point. I'm sat there, there's a big TV, and you're nervous, mate. I'm not going to lie, I was scared. I really was scared because I look round and I think, it's going to go off over there. And it's going to go off over there. Then lads are on you as well. Right, can you sort this out? Can you sort that? You've got to have eyes in the back of your head. I'm sat next to a woman who's, say, maybe 50-odd, 60. Bless her. And I'm looking, thinking, the fuck is she going to do if it goes off? <laughs> I'm sat next to a woman next to me who's about eight stone. I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not a big lad at all. I'm sat in the middle of these three people and I'm thinking, really, what am I going to do? Where's the fucking nearest door that I'm going to run to here? But you can't, you've got to get involved, you know, that's the job. And it's a judgment call that if it's going off in corner, you've technically got to go and get in the middle of it. So in America, right, as soon as something goes off, the guards have a button and a SWAT team comes running in quite quickly. Or so big you, goon yeah, squad, big yeah, goon yeah. squad. <laughs> did, you have, did, did, you have, did you have that kind of backup? Well, there is, there's backup, right? So you've got a radio, yeah? Yeah. Now, you've got a radio with a little red button on it, which is basically like an emergency button, yeah. which would alert the, the control room that there's a problem on that wing. Dotted around the wing are red buttons. Mm. Even the lads could press them. So let's say there was a kickoff going on and the lads thought it was getting a bit tasty because there's, you know, there's twos landing. It takes a screw a good, well, a good half a minute to get up them stairs mm. and then get involved. So if you've got a lad who's getting a kick in, he might go and press that button himself to get, like you say, the goon squad. Mm. So what happens then is you'll press the red buttons. So six staff are on that night, 140 prisoners. There are four more wings on the jail. They've got the same on. So you press the button, 
if they've got available staff, now bearing in mind we're talking about prison service cuts, I've told you that I'm sat between two women. If they've got available staff and they've not got their own shit going on, they'll release one or two members of staff from another wing. Now, they might be running, Sean, 200 metres down a fucking jail. So it's, it takes them a little bit to get there. Now, you know as well as I do, a flashpoint in a fight can be over in 10, 15, 30 seconds. So, yes, there's backup coming, and that's what you hope, as a prison officer, that's what you want to hear. You want to hear gates coming. But if you're a lad in there, I think, it's not fucking safe, is it? If you're waiting a couple of minutes to someone to come and save you, it'd be brain damaged stuff, couldn't it? Yeah. Um, and if you're looking at it from a, a governmental point of view, why why are you putting three staff in with 140 lads? You're not helping them. It's the same in America. They've got two guards watching 200 prisoners in medium security. Yeah. And that's just to keep the overhead down, to keep them, to maximise the profits. Fucking unbelievable. Warehousing people. Yeah. The ratio of guards to prisoners determines how much money they're going to make. Does it? Yeah. So if you, look how much you got paid guard, right? Yeah, yeah. So if you've got 10 guards watching 200 prisoners, it goes from, what do you say, 60 yeah, grand yeah, for two yeah. officers yep. to 300 grand? But the, but, but the playing with people's lives, it's like Russian roulette with people's lives, isn't it? But they've it? already calculated like yeah. the cost of that to maximise the profits. Fucking dirty bastards. Um, again, I'm, I'm not, I wouldn't slate low, uh, ground level staff. This is all obviously management and above, isn't it? And again, governmental. But... How can you justify that? So what was the first time it went off? The alarm bell. Uh, You've seen something going off, something violent. something going off. I'll tell you when it went off. So I was on a landing. You would, this is very low level, but it was my first introduction to how things can go wrong as a prison officer. So I'm on with a big lad at that point. On a Sunday evening, you get banged. I mean, I know the lads are banged up a hell of a lot at the moment. Um, so I can only imagine what it's doing to people's mental state in there. They're banged up literally 23 hours a day. Um, in there, when I was working on a Sunday, they would call it ED. So they would be banged up, say, early evening. And you would have, on a Sunday, you would have a cold meal delivered to your door. So you would have a sandwich pack delivered to your door, some hot water, bag of Rice Krispies for your morning breakfast. And behind your door, lads, for the night, night duty officer would come in. Banging up on ED, and with a lad, I'm pushing the fucking little trolley like a Doris. He's opening the doors. Jones it, here's your bag, da-da-da. He's opened the door and this fucking lad's right in his face. Something had gone on in the wing in the day. He'd had a set to with this lad verbally on the wing, locked him up, I think, in the day and said, get behind your door. He's obviously then sat in his cell boiling all day, isn't he? He's fucking getting riled and he's seen the lad that's going to open the door. He's opened the door and he's in his face again and he's gone for him. Now, I'm there, sat behind his trolley, dishing out the cups of tea as a new officer. <laughs> I'm thinking, fuck, what do I do now? Because these two now are rumbling on the fucking floor. And I'm thinking, well, what? Right, it's fight or flight now, isn't it? So I've had to get involved. I have I think, if I'm honest, I've got hold of it. He was a big, he was a big lump as well. I've got hold of his arm. I've kind of, you, you see in our training, you're taught to basically lay on limbs or lay on an arm and then put them into a, a controlled lock to then bring the prisoner up safely, to then escort him down the segregation. That all fucking went out the window, mate. Like I said, <laughs> training-wise, it's all very nice saying you bend my arm there and bend it there. But when you've got a big hefty lad in front of you, swinging like an helicopter, that goes out of the window. So he's rolling around on the floor with him. So I pretty much just jumped on him. I only probably weighed about 10 stone at a time. He mm. probably would have chucked me around like a wet tracksuit. But um, yeah, so I've just jumped on him, dived on him. And I think I've just got hold of his face and I've got hold of his face like that just fucking hoping for something to happen. I think at that point, one of the officers in the office has seen what's going on. Bells have gone, control and restraint. But that was my first introduction to it because I was then part, because I jumped on his arm, you then have to take control of that arm, put it in a twisted lock behind the back. Somebody brings his head down and he's walked into the segregation unit. So that was like, fucking welcome to this world. I've now got a raging lad who's spitting feathers at me, thinking I'm a bastard because I've stopped him battering the other officer. So it was just, it was a rude awakening, but you've got to get involved. That's your job. So does that person then continue to like harass you because he feels that you did get in the way of what he's doing? <laughs> I think I think with that lad, no, he didn't because I think the adrenaline of the situation, I think sometimes you probably won't remember who's involved. Mm. He's on the floor and all he, can, all he can see is a load of white shirts. I didn't have any grief with that lad after. Um, I think he was actually down the seg for the next week. Um, so we would come back onto the wing. He would then come back in on, I think he got basic regime. Mm. 
So basic regime, for people who don't know, is when you're in prison, you have, let's call it bronze, silver, gold. It's all based on your behaviour. Um, if you're a model prisoner, you attend courses, you're polite to staff, you don't get any warnings, you'll be on gold level, you can have like a, a TV, you can have a PlayStation 2 with no connectivity. Um, basically, the luxuries any prisoner can get within reason, as long as you behave yourself. So he was put down to basic, so he would have his TV removed. Mm. So he's fucking sat there reading, you know, Woman's Own or whatever for a week. Um, and I think you've got put on basic. And I do actually think, I actually think he apologised, if I remember. It's in his interest, really, isn't it, to get back up to, you know, to, to gold regime. Mm. But on that wing, there was a habit of TVs would be taken out of cells and all of a sudden there'd be TVs arriving in cells. Mm. So again, that causes issue because if you've got a big rum lad who's a big player, he's lost his TV. He then goes down to the little skinny lad at the end of the wing who's a very quiet lad who's in there for whatever, causing no nonsense. Where do you think that little lad's TV is going to go for the night? And that was a hard thing about being an officer and there are checks, you've got to do checks in the morning and the night time. TV's just ending up in cells that weren't supposed to be there. And you think, mm. but it's all, it's, it's, it's kind of gang culture in the sense of bullying because the, the big boys will just go and take off the little boys. It's, it's very simple, isn't it? Survival of the fittest. Yeah. So what was the next situation? <laughs> um, what was the next situation? I'm trying to think. There was, I tell you what, there was, there was a restraint of a lad in there. We'll touch on this. Um... In prison, because the state of the mental health system in this country um, is in disarray, you'd be lucky if you can get any mental health help um, via the NHS. They are struggling to find places to put challenged people. Shall you know the old mental hospitals? They've all gone, technically, haven't they? Mm. So you're now you've got a void within the system. The hospitals, let's say there's a young man who's got learning difficulties, who's in a bit of trouble all kinds of problems. Hospitals can't house him. Um, there's no mental units anymore or secure units. There's the odd secure unit, but the, the, the volume are now being housed in prison because you will often find that because of the frustration that these these people have, they will commit silly crimes. Or self-medicate Or self-medicate or, you know, self or whatever it may be. And you find in the prison system, there's quite a lot of lads, probably young girls, that are struggling like that. Prison in America is the biggest houser of the mentally ill, and it has been for decades. Yeah. So if you can look at... So you've got a lad in there. We'll, we'll come on to him specifically in a minute. If you look at the lad in there, he's struggling up here. He's now in a prison situation. He's surrounded by 80 lads. You know, all the noise, all... He's scared. He's vulnerable. He becomes a target. Mm. Um. So... <laughs> I remember one day there was a lad in there, we'd got him in there and we were forever trying to get him out to a secure unit because he was he was committing stupid things and he was, you know, causing trouble on the wing, just purely out of frustration, I think. I think one one day one of the officers had gone in and he, he just got fucking walloped one of the officers. Mm. But he was a big lump as well. And, you know, and you'd often find people with, shall we say, some problems, they have a, a strength about them. You know, there's an absolute relentless strength. There is. I mean, there was a saying in our jail, don't fight a Rule 11. Rule 11s are the people who are classified as mentally ill. Mm. I remember the head of the White. He was a Golden Gloves boxer. He'd won every single fight, and then he fought a Rule 11, and he quit being the head of the Whites yeah. after that because that fight lasted so long. He's, his knuckles were all bust up, and his, his, his hands swelled up to the size of a grapefruit. He kept knocking this guy down and it was like the fight was over and the guy would get back up again with his strength. No fear, no, no. J jumping no. on the wall like Spider-Man and jumping on his back and everything. Just fucking spinning web. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> Peter Parker was in there, everyone. Um, if you, yeah, want, if so... you want the full details on that, I'll read it in my book, Hard Time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he, um, yeah, so I think he'd gone in there. This lad had been frustrated. He'd been bouncing around his cell like an absolute scolded cat. The officer had opened the door and he fucking took a wallop for the officer. Now, obviously, this this lad had then come out onto the wing, and I just remember three or four of us having to go and restrain this lad, and he, he, he didn't feel pain. There was no pain. There was, you know, you were putting him in locks. He was just fucking smiling at you, and you think, shit, me, man, he's gonna full on do me in a minute. Um, so, I think, yeah, again, I think he was he was probably the next one, and that was on another wing that I'd worked on. Were you getting used to it by this point, or was it did you, your adrenaline go off the scale every time? <laughs> I don't think you will ever lose the adrenaline in that situation. I think if you did lose it, there'd be f 
something wrong. So I think you need that adrenaline because you never know what's coming next, mate. I mean, I've... Was it getting a bit less scary each time? Yeah, I, th I think it was. I think when you heard that bell initially, it's like it, it's, it's full on. You, you Straight away, all the senses are alerted. You're tense. You're fucking dry mouthed. And I think when you heard it, yeah, you do become a little bit immune to it. Although in that situation, I remember... <laughs> I remember back on my wing, there was a lad in there, and you'd, in the English cells, there was a very thin, thin glass in the middle of your door. Mm. Now, I remember again, I think it may have been handing out something on the wing. I just remember looking, because you have to open the hatch to do a cell check. Mm. I remember looking in like that, seeing a lad kind of come towards the glass, and all of a sudden, boom, straight through the glass with like a, like a razor blade on the end of a... Like a toothbrush through the melted glass. in straight through the glass bump. So you guys don't have even have plexiglass that they can't break. Maybe they do now, mate. Maybe they don't. I don't. But he's straight through the glass. It had come through the glass, and I thought, "Fucking hell!" Wow. Now whether it was aimed for me, I don't. I don't think it was aimed for me. Yeah. But things like that, you would, yeah, all weird kind of shit like that, mate. That looking back on it now, I think, well, that was pretty crazy. But you, like you say, you do become immune to it. You just go about your daily business. You sweep it up, yeah. and you're then because there's no. We're coppers. Let's say coppers go to an incident mm. uh, and it's been stressful and it's been hypercharged and they've had to detain someone. They can then remove themselves. They're going to sit in the fucking back room or Greg's down the road and they'll sit and have a debrief and a coffee and it all returns to calm. You know as well as I do, in a prison, there is no chance for calm because the next cell down, you've got the same. Now, I'm not saying, listen, these are just bits that I'm using. But there is never silence. That's one thing that I noticed. And when I went to prison, that was the hardest thing that I could deal with. You, ne you never got more than f five seconds of silence in any given opportunity. In working in there, it becomes fucking noise all the time, the white noise all the time. And it's it weird. It does eat away at you. Subconsciously, I was going home, and then we'll get to where I ended up. But I was going home, and all I'd want to do, you know, your mates would be ringing you, and I'm thinking, oh, what I do is just fucking sit in a room Mrs. is like that, meep, 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 meep. and you think, shut up, I want silence. I don't want anybody to speak to me about prison. I don't want any men to speak to me. I don't want you to speak to me. I just want silence with this nice fucking red wine. That's what I want. People watching this then who are considering joining the profession <laughs> might want to take that. Yeah. As, um, it's, it's, a, it's such a negative energy. There was a journalist in America, and he wanted to write about a prison, and the governor wouldn't let him in. Yeah. So he applied to be a prison officer and got in. But within six months to a year, he was coming home and being abusive to his family because that energy had just consumed him, that toxic, negative, dangerous, constantly on yeah. edge, constantly adrenaline going. Yeah. It, it changes you psychologically. Massively, mate, massively. And it's I think Sam's talked about it in his book. I noticed a big change in my relationship uh, when I was working in there. I was with a girl for quite a while, mate, and... It did start to go downhill at that, especially when I started to do what we'll get on to doing. Um, it it started to eat away at me. I become more withdrawn. Uh, I certainly wasn't a happy. I'm, I'm a fairly happy-go-lucky lad, um, and it, that wasn't me. It did change me. Um, people did start to notice it, so they've told me. But at the time, I was that hell bent. I couldn't admit defeat. I couldn't say it's not for me, because you know what? Sorry, we're as humans in the UK or as we're growing up, we're customed and conditioned to thinking you need a job to pay the mortgage, to pay the car, to then buy the three bedroomed house. So you need to keep moving forward. And I thought the prison service was going to allow me to do that. So I was just doing what a normal working man was doing. So what other challenges were there at Lancaster Farms? It was the hard, the thing as well is when you're new staff, you have a lot of staff who've been in there a long time. Now, they become hardened, like we've just talked about. They become hardened to working with the lads. Now, I'm not going to go as far as saying they don't care about the lads, but some, there are good and bad in everything, in every walk of life, electricians, prison officers, podcasters. Um, there are good and bad. So some stuff in there, you're keen when you're young to help people mm. in there. You know, you want to go and sit in cell 10 and speak to the lad and maybe try and get him on the phone, maybe try and give him an extra touch. Staff, I found that hard to deal with because I was getting told by older staff, oh, what the fucking hell are you doing? Why are you doing that? Oh, it's not worth it. It's, and I'm thinking, well, I do what to help them. Mm. You know, I'm not in here. I'm not in here because I'm some power-pissed idiot 
who, who wants a white shirt. I'm in here, like we've just discussed, I'm in here because I took a job, I get along well with people and I'd like to help, not by taking drugs in Sean, but I would, in the early days, I wanted to, in, you know, immerse myself in it and try and get some out of it myself. Mm. But I was met with quite a lot of negativity from the staff in doing that, um, to which I was thinking, well... Because uh, there's an us versus them mentality that is prevalent, and I saw new officers come in, mm. and they would be called fish. You got fish prisoners, fish guards. Yeah. These new officers would come in with helpful looks on their faces. Fresh, fresh people. But then six months in, the faces have turned to stone, yeah. and they've gone to the us versus them mentality because prisoners have tried so many games and to play so many tricks on them, yeah. they've hardened up to it. You've got that, you've got the prisoner's side of it, and you've also got the staff side of it saying, you know, who's this fucking little idiot on the wing who thinks he's great with the prisoners, who thinks he can make a difference? Because they're 20 years into their service. So they were fish, and now they're fucking dinosaurs. To, you know, that mentality. So it's a hard one as a new member of staff going in there, finding your pecking order within the staff and also finding your pecking order with the lads in there because, mm. like I've said about numbers, you don't want to upset them in there because you're on a loser. Mm. You know, you start giving it the big epaulette, man, and I'm this and I'm that and I'm Mr. This and I'm that. You're, it's only going to end up one way. And, you know, I'm not saying violence all the time, but you're not going to have a good relationship. And you spend 12 hours of your day there for the next 30 years of your life it's a lot easier if you get on with someone. Yeah. You know, I took it to the nth degree, but if, that was a challenge, mate, finding the pecking order. All right, so how soon then, after you had been working, did this pressure come on to you to bring things in? So I'm going to say probably around about 18 months to a couple of years. All right, so before we talk about the pressure then... Mm. Was are there any other like major incidents that happened in that eighteen months that you've not discussed? I do remember the lads coming on. I wouldn't say it was an incident, but I remember thinking at the time, "What an absolute bell end!" Um, do you know the lad who? I think his fucking name. Let's lad... keep let's keep names out of it. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm trying to think of the, mm. the you know the instance. You remember the young lad who got shot in Liverpool? Who the drama that was on TV. There's so many shootings in Liverpool and stabbings. You know. <laughs> well, yeah. It's not narrowing it down, is it? <laughs> uh, the there young was one lad, just the other day. Yeah. So there's the young lad on the bicycle who got caught up in a shooting, an Everton fan. I think he was called Reese Jones. Oh, he the was young an lad, innocent yeah. kid, wasn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. What, yeah. You know, what a fucking shame. Um, I remember the lads, because at that point, like I say, it was housing people from down here, was the jail. I remember that lad coming in and... When you say that lad, you mean the guy who, who shot him? Yeah. And Reese died? He did, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the lads, I mean, you, you all know who, who, who I'm talking about, but I remember him coming into the farms. Uh, I mean, I'd, I'm like I say, I'm talking a good 10, 15 years ago now. I don't know the guy personally, but the attitude of it at the time, I, I think that kind of hit home because it was big in the media. I would go home at night and then, you know, you would read bits about it, about certain trials and whatnot. And that's that's mm. the thing in the prison service. You would you would kind of look at trials and think, oh, I wonder if he's coming into the farms. You kind of wonder. Mm. You become, in a weird kind of twisted way, you become very interested in crime because you hear about it all the time. And someone will say, oh, that's such and such, the wherever. And I just remember meeting this guy who was, he was on my wing for a bit. And I thought, fucking hell. And I, did, I used to go on thinking about it. And I think, it's, you know, you've done something like that and you're coming on here walking around this wing thinking you're Johnny Big Time. And he, was, he wasn't, he was, he was an absolute no one, but you do, it does grudge on you at night. If you're having your glass of wine at night, it, subconsciously it's in there and you're thinking, on the computer as well, you'd go on and read. Now, I, I was a big one for not doing this, but I'd, I'd have to sometimes because you have to log into prisoners. Um, you had a system at the time, I can't remember the name of it now, mate, it's irrelevant. You would have to make comments uh, as a personal officer you get given six or seven lads and you interact with them all week. If they've got any problems, they come to you. You're their go-to. So you would have to go on and write reports. And every now and then you would catch yourself looking, obviously, at a fence. And some of it was, you know, was disturbing. You know, for someone who's not accustomed to that before it, you'd read some of it and you'd think, fucking hell. And you've got, you've got 70 on there. So it does. It does get to you. And if you're not screwed on properly up there, it does start to plant seeds, I think. How were the prisoners treating Reese, uh, the killer of Reese? 
I don't... I think he got one or two digs, but I don't think it was anything... Uh, on there, anything went... You know what I mean? I don't think he was getting... Just a madhouse. It's just a fucking madhouse, mate. I mean, there's, there's loads of stuff on YouTube of lads doing videos, and, and I look at it now and I think, fucking hell. Right? So lads who are prisoners just illegally doing videos and putting them on YouTube. Yeah. From Lancaster thing. Farms. Yeah. So if people go on YouTube and put in Lancaster Farms, yeah. will loads of stuff come up? Yeah. People are flopping around on Spice and stuff. Flopping around on Spice. There's there's one on there at the moment. I can't remember the name of it to type it in on YouTube, but it's basically a fucking party going on. I've seen where they're just like spiking people on Spice. Spiking people. It's like, it, like, it's like a New Year's. It might be New Year's Eve party type. Lancaster Farms New Year's party. It's just fucking, it just looks like Wigan Pier. Even spiking the staff? I don't know about that one, mate. I've seen, I've seen, I saw something on that. Yeah. Um, all right. So, how did this pressure start to come about? Do you like? Had some of the prisoners got really pally with you? I think it was more. Yeah. There was. When I say pressure, I never had a gun put to my head, um, so to speak. The pressure was that I was quite familiar with the lads. Like I've said, I was a young lad. I'd got on well with them. I kind of liked it that way, that I'd kept them within distance. Um, and I think they saw probably at that point weaknesses in me. Um, again, I'm going to say this because this I can look back and say exactly how it happened. Don't blame them at all. It was all me. I, I did everything. I chose to do what I did. Um, say They've obviously seen weaknesses within me. They've seen me probably not coping with the job particularly well. Um they've seen maybe a change in me, like you've said. So these lads have been with me now for maybe, what, six six months a year over if they've been doing their sentence with me. So they may have seen me change and they've thought, let's try it. Let's try it. Now, I was a cleaning officer quite a lot. I'd have real close contact with the cleaners, pretty much in and out of the cells, even sometimes just sat on the end of the bed talking to them. You know, if they've got an issue or whatnot, I'd go and have a fucking game on, you know, FIFA football or whatever. <laughs> if I had a spare five minutes... You know, I'd go and interact with them because I enjoyed it. I didn't like walking around the wing on my own, being isolated and being this. It wasn't for me. So one of the lads had come to me. I was in the middle of the wing by the pool table. I remember it come to me and said, can you just nip in and see, for instance, Smithy? Um, he's, he's upset. So I've gone in, kind of opened the door. He's on the end of the bed, obviously been crying. Uh, I said, is everything all right, mate? What's going on? Can you, can you put, shut the door a bit? So I've shut the door a bit. I said, is everything all right? He's visibly upset. He said, it's my dad. Now, I know the lad. I've told this on Samworth's and people have said that's bullshit. This is the fucking 100% truth. I know the lad's dad was very ill and I know he was in hospital. And he said, uh, I need to speak to my dad. I've got no phone credit on my phone, et cetera, et cetera. At the time, the lad called me Davo. Oh because I was relatively familiar with the lads. And again, the staff have obviously picked up on that. Dave, oh, please bring me a phone in. And I thought, and I just said to him, no, there's no chance of that, mate. I can't. I'll try and get you a little phone call. No, mate, I need to, phone. I need to speak to my family. I need to speak to this. But and proper going, get, getting upset. So I've said, no, mate, I'm sorry, I can't. I've gone off to my dinner, thought no more of it. Now, what you should do as a prison officer at that point is put a SIR in, security information report. So anything that you see on a wing, anything, any conversation that you hear with prisoners that you think might be an issue of security, it is your duty and your job to write an SAR out. I've heard Atwood speaking to Smith. They're going to fucking do cell six in tonight. Put it in security. Security come down and deal with it, which are a separate entity. Security are the brain of the jail, the hub of the jail. They gather evidence all the way around the jail to find out what's going on. Um... I've come back. I didn't put an SIR in. I've gone for my dinner. Uh, I've gone to play five-a-side football at dinner time, uh, and then come back to unlock prisoners again at one o'clock. So do they know this is like a test? Yeah. They know you've not filed that the prisoners. So that's the first like green light for that's, them. That's fucking all systems going in. Yeah. That the seed planted, and I've not, I've not gone off my tits at him. I've not said you know you cheeky little bastard. Why are you asking me this? I've gone. No, mate. It's not going to happen. I'll get you a phone call. I've done it, like, <laughs> I've done it, I knew full well in my, I was struggling in my own life at that point with this job, I was heavily involved in drinking at that point, mate, I was, I was going under, the relationship was going down the pan, so I'm not screwed on up here, they've then sown that seed, 
I thought, no, it can't happen. It can't happen. I'll give you, I think, I'll give you 400 quid to bring me a phone in tomorrow morning. That was his words at the time. I said, no, it's not going to happen. Gone off to play football at dinner, five side football. They've, like you've said, known that I've not put it in the box because nothing's happened over dinner because it would be a matter of minutes. If an SAR went in to security, prisoner has mobile phone, you're talking minutes, it'll be down, fucking cell would be all over the shop. It'd be like a car crash on the M6, mate. <laughs> um, come back from dinner, I'm cleaning officer again, so I do all the unlocks. Do all the unlocks, and I'll mark the people off the wing. Uh, such and such, right? And I'm left with the six cleaners again on the wing. People who are medically unwell, people who are not going to work, people who are behind the door because of uh, discipline. So I've gone into the cleaners, right, lads, can we do, you know, get that floor cleaned? Can we clean up over there? Can we do this? And he's on, the, Dave, oh, please, 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 please. Uh, it's going to be, I'll, I'll say nothing about it. It's going to be a one-off. Ah, da, 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 da. Now I'm thinking at that point, Sean, and he said, I'll give you 400 quid. 400 quid waiting for you. I mean, how pathetic is that? If we think about it now, 400 quid to where we're going to get to in a bit. <laughs> fucking 400 quid. It's not even a... F uh, anyway, it's by the by. Mm. At that point, I'd had a figure in my mind, 400 quid. It's about $650. $650. Now, at that point, like I said, I was probably only earning 12, 1,300 quid a month. Because you start... It's, 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 basically, you build up your, your salary over a four or five year period. So you then get to 30 grand a year, however many dollars that is, I don't know. Um, so he's put 400 quid in my mind. I'm not doing well in my life. Uh, I was bordering alcoholic at that point anyway, I think. I was going home every night to get away from the stress. Straight away, the first thing I'd do before I'd even feed the cat would be straight into the cupboard, red wine, bath on. I wasn't dealing with it, mate. I wasn't strong enough to job. He's put the figure in my mind. And I've gone away again. I've just walked out of the cell at that point. I've not said anything to him. I've walked out of the cell. It's on my mind all afternoon, thinking, well, I can probably get away with it. I've gone in the cell again. I said, right, a key moment this, right. It's a one-off, and I'm doing it because you need to speak to your family, and I know your dad's in hospital. I wasn't. I was qualifying it in my stupid mind that I was technically doing someone a good deed. I wasn't sure that it was because I'd had some money put in my mind. That's all it was. But I thought, well, if I just tell myself I'm doing it because his dad's unwell, I don't feel as bad. <laughs> what a fucking idiot. Eh? <laughs> so <laughs> I said, right, how does this work? He went, right, I'm going to give you a mobile number. By then, I'd already, I'm already in then. I'm fucked. I'm hooked. Fucked and hooked, pretty much. I'm going to give you a mobile number. You need to ring this number when you finish work. And how I was finishing at, let's say it was a day shift, so it would have been five half five. I've got a mobile number in my pocket. I've not put an SIR in, so technically I've breached my job code. So all they need to do is go to the staff and say, well, actually, I've told him to bring a mobile phone in this afternoon, and they'll say, well, where's your SIR, Lee? It, well, I breached, haven't I, already? The trust element. So I've gone out of the jail with a mobile number in my pocket. Now, thinking that I was smart, I thought, oh, well, I can't ring it from my phone. I need to go to, we used to have pay phones back then. I thought, I'll drive out of town. I mean, how fucked up is this, the fact that I've just left the jail, locking lads up. I'm now thinking about how I cannot be caught doing something <laughs> illegal. I mean, what, the hypocrisy in that is fucking phenomenal, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so I've gone to a little village, pay phone, quid in, rung the mobile number. Uh, are you such and such? Are you Lee? Yep. Where are you? So we're probably about 10 minutes from the jail. Right, okay, we're, we're at the bottom motorway services. So now it's really started to hit all. I'm thinking, shine a light. I've just agreed to meet someone. I've agreed to do something in the jail. I've agreed to meet someone. What if they fucking do me in? What if this is all... Paranoia's kicked in then, Sean. <laughs> I'm like, shit. <laughs> Who's going to come? They might come with one of them. I, You know, as a prison officer, let's face it, you're not very well liked. Maybe I was, I was naive, I was stupid... <laughs> So I thought, right, I said, right, well, I'm in such and such car. I'll come down and meet you now. Right, we'll see you when you get there. I'm thinking, well, they haven't told me who they are. So I've driven in, and there's a car pulled up next to me. Um, two lads are in it. I've kind of wound the window down. I looked across there, give it the nod. Wound the window down. Uh, I just got uh, fucking ro something rolled up, chucked at me. You, Lee, yeah, right. Something chucked up, a little package, about year big. 
and then some notes rolled up, chucked at me. Right, okay, seen a bit, off. I'm sat in an holiday in car park then thinking, what the fuck have I just done? <laughs> you know what I mean? What the fuck have I just done? But I've now got 400 quid in the car. I've now got what I believe to be a mobile phone in the car because I, I didn't have anything to do with the packaging of it. It was already packaged about yay big. Also, it could have heroin or anything in it. You don't know, do you? I was, it was told to me that it was a mobile phone. I believe it was a mobile phone. Later on, I don't think it was, you know, we'll, as we'll get to. Um, so I now think I've got a mobile phone in my car and I've got cash in my car. I've now then got to drive home to the missus and at that point, a very fucking large red wine. So what I've done with the money, I've put it in the you know, spare wheel, I've put the money under the spare wheel in the car. I mean, I'm not exactly a criminal mastermind here, am I? <laughs> <laughs> uh, and the phone, I've done the same under the wheel. So I've gone to home, you know, how was your day? Oh, shite, I don't want to talk about it. Put the TV on all night and sunk some red wine, thinking I just need to go to sleep. Mm. All kinds of games, all kinds of mental gymnastics going on then. Um, thinking, well, if I don't take it in, wh what's going to happen to me? I mean, let, let's face it right. I don't know what could have happened to me. I could have been quite easily taken hostage there. I could have been filled in. I could have had anything done to me. But I'd lost the fucking plot with the job, with my life, with where I was going and with my morals. So the morning's come. Uh, I'm on an early shift, which would be only till dinner. So I'm thinking, oh, fuck it, if I can just wing, wang it till dinner, I then get out. So I'm thinking, I'm going to get this telephone in jail. Now, as I've said to you before, there's no real security procedure, albeit now and then you might get a tug. So I thought, well, shall I edge my bets or shall I wait? I've told them it's coming in today. So I've stuffed it down. I think I've put a pair of underpants on. Fucking fucked up this. A pair of underpants on, a pair of shorts on, kit on. Because when you go in, you've got a lot of kit around. You've got a radio, you've got a baton, you've got everything. So it wasn't too drastic. Um, you know, no porn star penis or anything like that. <laughs> Um, so I've gone into the jail and I'm going into the gates and you're now starting to look around the car park thinking, is this a set up? Is it set up? Are there any police here? Are there any looking around? You're fucking paranoia all the time, mate. I mean, it's just not worth it, is it? 400 <laughs> quid. I mean, come on. Um, so I've gone into the jail. When you go through in an English jail, you go through the visitor's gate to where you can engage with reception, visits, whatever. And then as you go through the second gate, there's fucking signs everywhere that say if you bring anything past this point even if staff anyone uh, mobile phones lighters anything like that contraband you will face criminal charges etc maximum 10 years are you at this point trying to like keep a straight face and not give away what you're doing uh, exactly that exactly i'm a fucking bumbling mess um i actually think i played it quite cool but so you go to the gate you get your radio i'm bravo one today give me the radio they give you a set of keys Engage with a little bit of staff on the way in, gone through the second door, and now it's serious, because if I do get tugged now, it's game over. Gone through, you walk through the yard, so there's three or four staff at that point walking on, and then you all walk off to your wings. And now my wing's at the very bottom of the jail, so it's like the walk of shame, mate. Um, I've got down there, the gates have opened. Now the cleanest cell, face. This lad knows that I'm on this shift. The cleanest cell faces the door that you go in. Now, as I'm walking in, he's like stood at his window and I've looked like that and he's gone as if to say, are we on? And I've just nodded. Got into there, opened up for the unlock, done the cleaning board, you know, routine, 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 nothing untoward. Didn't engage with anyone to, to bring it on top. As the morning's gone on, I've walked into the cell where he was, kind of shut the door behind me. There are only cameras, obviously, as you know, you can't have cameras in cells, uh, only on the main wing. I shut the door, come behind the camera, because I knew where the cameras were. I just basically got it out of my package, pardon the pun, chucked it on his bed and said, right, that's it, no more, don't ask me again. Knowing full well, Sean, it was going to ask, it was going to happen again. So again, qualifying in my mind, that's it, I've done it, fucking don't ask me again. So... Exactly. Two or three days have passed, I think. Um, now, obviously, I'm, I'm aware now that there's a mobile phone on the wing. I, listen, mobile phones were found 
I wouldn't say they were massively prevalent at that point. They were mobile phones in jails. They can be brought in via visits. At that point, the wing, they weren't good on security, physical security. You were still getting tennis balls lobbed over onto the onto the yard with things like drugs in. What um, year are we talking about? Talking 2007, eight around that time. So Lancaster Farms, the wing I worked on, was on the perimeter. Behind there is a load of woodland. So there's nets kind of covering half the yard, but you can get fucking pigeons. People cutting pigeons open, filling them with stuff, fucking tennis lobbing the pigeons over in the vain hope that go prisoners go on the yard in the morning and they get to it before an officer does so they can get contraband. Weird. Weird. Or the other route is get a screw on side. Allah. So, yeah, so that had gone on two or three days had passed. I've got 400 quid in my car still. Thinking, well, what to do with it? You know, it, it's stupid, isn't it? Thinking, oh, I can, you know, I can buy this for the house or I can buy that. You're then grabbed by the cash, aren't you? It's a very irrelevant mount compared to, you know, some of the lads that you've had on here. Right, same lad again. Two of them in a cell this time. Same lad again. Uh, they will, we need to do that for us again. I think this time was a little bit more, like 450 quid, 500 quid. And I'm thinking... I've already committed this sin. I already know. Deep down in my mind, Sean, I know that this is on a, I'm on a trail of destruction now. But like I said, I was deeply involved in my own inward thoughts and <laughs> alcohol at that point and stress. Um, so <laughs> they've said, right, we need you to do it again uh, soon as well, quick. We, we, can someone meet you tonight? And I'm like, it's only three days ago that I'd, I've met someone. Right, it's 500 quid there for you. You know, that's like pretty much my wages. In what three days? <laughs> so, so you could make in a night in in three days you could make more than for the month, pretty much. Wow. Now, to anyone in any industry, forget the morals of it, and I'm obviously deeply regretful for what I've done. In any industry, your industry, in whatever, if someone says you can earn what you're earning a month that you're technically busting your ass for, in I mean, that's how we all got caught, isn't it? I'm sure that your story is very similar. You know, there's a there's a pot of gold somewhere <laughs> and, and we think, well, let's get to that pot of gold as soon as we can. That's us as humans. That's us as criminals, ex-criminals. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so that pot of gold was at that point 500 quid three days later. So I've, I'm now starting to spend it in my head. I'm thinking, you know, I can buy maybe a new bloody car. I can buy her a new dress etc cetera, etc cetera. start to become materialistic governed by the dollar so i've said right okay there's no i did think about it briefly but it wasn't a case of me going off the wing again and having a fucking mental breakdown in my head about it it was like right okay is it the same drill is it the same number i'm now on that path there's no turning back now right okay no problem i'll see him tonight same again same drill finished i met somewhere completely different this time, so I'm now starting to think, is someone following me? Is this a fucking setup? Paranoia, paranoia. Right, I'll meet you. I think it was like two junctions down the motorway or something stupid. So I've met them. Exactly the same again. Package of money chucked in my car uh, and a package similar to the size of the one, the previous one. So I'm now thinking, well, it's the same drill. It's another mobile phone. You weren't tempted to open it? No. Maybe I should have done, maybe I'm wrong. I just thought I don't want to tamper with it. Um, because I, I'm i pretty damn sure they would have known that I'd tampered with it. We like weighing it, like see if it was Well, yeah, phone. exactly. There was always intrigue there and I'd smell it. And at that point, there wasn't any smell to it. So I, that's why I, in my mind I was thinking, well, maybe it is just a mobile phone. So now we've got 900 quid in the car in <laughs> however many days and I'm in the full-blown path of destruction now. I'm now going home and I really am hitting that. Not only that, because I'm nervous of going into the jail. So the second time, I told him I was going to bring it in the day after. Paranoia kicks in again and I'm thinking, in my mind, oh, I'm not. Um, because I'm thinking, well, if somebody's there waiting for me, but lo and behold, there wasn't anybody waiting for me. So I thought then, maybe it isn't set up. Maybe it is just what it is. So I think the day after that, I'd actually taken it in because they said, have you brought it in? And I said, no, I haven't brought it in today. I can't bring it in today. Um, the research team's on the gate. I mean, there wasn't, but I was testing my mind if there was. The day after I've brought it in, 
exactly the same again. I think this time I've hidden it in... I don't know why. I'm trying to tra you know cover tracks and... I don't know why I'm playing my own game. This is the, the tiring side of it. You're playing your own game now <laughs> whilst they're playing their own game. And in the two, there's a whole world of confusion. I've gone into the laundry, which is off like a, a room off the, the spur. And I've hidden it in there because I knew the cleaners, I would unlock them first. So I've got the control who's going to go in that room. I've unlocked them and I've said, you need to go and tidy the laundry up on the third shelf. You know what I mean? Giving it that third shelf. So lo and behold, nothing more said on the wing that night. Fucking hell, it was a stink of cannabis, wasn't there? So you knew then? Oh, I was thinking, oh, fucking hell. So there was a mobile, I know there was a mobile phone in there because I actually saw it later on. And so I know there was a mobile phone. But obviously there was there was a smell of cannabis and I've... But having said that, that wasn't... That wasn't untoward. There would be sometimes, because let's face it, there are drugs in prison. It wasn't just me, and I'm sure it isn't just me, and drugs were finding their way into that jail, like I've just described. Perhaps you're telling yourself cannabis isn't the hardest of the drugs. <laughs> Possibly, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'm now double paranoid because I'm thinking, fuck me, that package I've brought in is now stinking this wing out. I mean, I'm sure the lads were very chilled out, but... And there's there's another talking point, isn't it? A lot of people say, should we allow uh, cannabis into jails or whatever? I think it's a recipe for disaster because I think, like we spoke about before, pack mentality, bullying. If you're an addict to anything, and I've been there myself, if you're an addict to anything, when you've used your supply and you're a big FD lad and you've got clout on the wing, you're going to go and take the next man's supply. So I think legalising it in the prison system or introducing it, I don't know how it would be done, mate. I mean, what, what do you think on that? You know what, I've not even considered that. But um, most people have got drug problems. Yeah. And they probably shouldn't be... They should be getting counselling and help and tools to yeah. deal with their drug problems, yeah. Yeah, not yeah, encouraged. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. But I think also, I mean, there are a lot of... There are people, well, I wouldn't say they're activists or whatever against it, but there are a lot of people who say... It should be legalized, maybe on the streets. Oh yeah, I mean, I'm, I mean, totally, I yeah. I'm totally for the legalization of all drugs on yeah. the streets, right? Because that takes it out of the hands of the mafia and puts it in the hands of the government, yeah. which takes all this crime from knife crime in London to hundreds of thousands dead in Mexico. Yep, all that should be minimized. Of course, it should. Yeah, and if you have a shop that you can go to and get it, there is there is no reason for people to go around chopping people up, is there? Exactly, all these shady drug deals and kids getting sold toxic substances. It ends, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But like you say, why hasn't it? Because the status quo is what makes the entities profiting from it, the parasites, the most money. Yeah. Agreed. Totally agreed. So, all right. So you take your second one in. There's the weed smoke on the run. Yeah. You're paranoid. Paranoid skits up to death now, mate. I've gone home. <laughs> is, you, is your missus noticing a change? Well, obviously, yeah. I mean, you know, she's probably wanting nookie at night and I can't get my head straight. You know, I'm worried about <laughs> what's going on in the morning. Cat's looking at me as if to say, you're a bastard. <laughs> <laughs> you're not feeding me when you come in. You're going straight to that cupboard. <laughs> and so, yeah. And it's like the greed factor. Like, I've got almost a thousand now. This just keeps growing and growing. <laughs> what, the, the seed is planted, isn't it? Like, where can we take this? We're going to take over the world. You know, that yeah. kind of, yeah. you know, it's really, it's silly, but that's how I started to think. Um, so, yeah, it was suffering at home with her. I remember the second time... So we'll go on to the third time now. Mm. Now, I'd, I would, I guess another week had passed. Um, it wasn't... Another week had passed, and I was asked by the same people again. I said, just fucking calm down for a week or two. No, well, well, we need this, we need that. Now is the hook of... I'm now thinking, well, they, I've done it. They know what I've done. So I have to say yes, morally to them, to cover my own ass, because otherwise they're going to go and fucking say to the officers... He's been ringing in drugs. And, uh, you know, the threats of, right, well, we'll tell the jail. So, I've, like, the very first time, you know, like, they had the, the sub story about yep. the dad and you said that was genuine. But yep. has it gone now to, like, just can you bring one in? They're not, like, coming up with backstories. No, there's no backstories now, mate. It's just purely business. Um, it's just purely a transaction. They know they've got me technically on side on the wage bill. Did they just... ever threaten to, to turn you in? No. So what's happened is I brought the third package in. I'm really struggling to sleep at that point. So I'm not just drinking red wine. I'm now drinking bottles of night nurse at night. 
because I know, you know, I'm not getting to bed until late at night because I'm up thinking about it. She'll be in bed. I'm up thinking about it, thinking about where's it going to go, where's it going to lead to. You know, I've let everyone down. All the personal stuff comes into it, all the emotion, all the guilt. And with that um, comes more stress, more anxiety, more drink, da, da, da. Maybe cue more money, the need for more money to to offset it. Um, I've done the third drop and I've said, really, that, that's enough now, lads. I can't, I'm running the risk here. And then it become, well, no, you're not. Sorry, well, no, well, no, you're not because, you know what I mean, you... We, We've got people waiting for this stuff in here. Now, if you look at the people that were talking about the gangs involved, them lads were, say, the age of 21. They're not the kingpins or the, the, the big boys, are they? They're purely at a lower level, call it a, a branch of the business, shall we say. I mean, you, you'll know more about this than me. Like salespeople um, and foot soldiers. Exactly, exactly. So I'm dealing with low-level people, albeit very intimidating people in certain instances big name gangs um well no you're not because they're expecting it to be brought in and i'm thinking oh fuck it now again at that point i was powerless sean i was scared um again i'd again i want to say it all again i'd committed to doing it no one forced me to do it i chose that path myself but at that point i found myself scared and also trapped by greed so it was it was kind of if we talk about this adrenaline thing and this, I, I was living a very turbulent life, uh, a, a, an almost alter ego as such. I was going home at weekends having to play happy family man, knowing full well that I was picking up drugs and stuff from someone who I didn't know to take into a jail. So it was, was it 500 quid every time? Yeah. And how did, did the frequency increase? Yeah. So now you've got involved. I can't remember exact details on the amount of times that I did it then. So the, so that side of it was the, a Liverpool connection, yeah? Now comes a certain amount of period on the wing where I'm just going about doing that for them. Let's say it's once, twice a week, yeah? Varying size packages. I now know, I'll be honest with you, I now know there's cannabis in there. Purely by smell. I think I actually got searched in the middle of it all, but it was on a day that I didn't have anything. And I think that was like, whew, alarm bells. Did you not like, could you not like um, tell the people, look, I just got searched, we've got to lay off this? Which there was a lay down period of maybe a couple of weeks, a month mm. of saying, listen, I've been tugged and no one else got tugged. I mean, they did, but no one else got tugged. So I said, there's always snitches. Is that someone's going to like try and curry favour by turning you in at some point. But in jail, people turn people in for, 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 can be to, because they've got themselves into debt and drugs. Yeah. Um, they can turn themselves in because they want to move to a different prison. Um, they can turn people in because they want a two weeks on the health care because they're scared shitless of what's going to happen to them. Yeah. It's always, a name will always get you somewhere. Mm. And it's, that's how it ends up in the end. As we? word spreads what you're doing. Right. Inevitable, one of those snitches is going to ca get catch wind. Of course there is. Yeah. Um, and let's face it, the lads that are in there, like I was in there, we're not in there for being honest people, are we? Letting fucking grannies cross the road. So you were all, you know what I mean? You're always, you're in and around that environment and in that environment comes fear, pressure, people cracking. Yeah. So we've, I've laid off it for a few weeks. I've come back in and the other side of the faction, the Manchester side, a very hefty lad involved with one of the big ones, who I knew was involved with one of the big ones on the outside because we used to have crack about it, has said, pretty much, I know what you're up to. It's quite common knowledge um, between us. I said, all right, okay. And he went, right, I've got 500 quid for you. I need you to pick this up for me tonight. And I'm thinking, fuck me, I've now fucking got Liverpool. <laughs> I've now got Manchester knowing what I'm up to. So you become now technically a fucking bitch, don't you? Let's have it right. You're on the payroll of Liverpool. You're on the Manchester are trying to get you on board. And let's say, I think Manchester at that point were heavier. They certainly seemed heavier on the wing. Um, and by heavier, I mean bigger influence, a bit naughtier. Right, I need you to do this for me tonight. I uh, actually got on quite well with the lad. So I was like, oh, fuck, my head had gone, mate. I just said, right, okay, where do I need to be? And that's how it started with them. So I've now got Liverpool. I've now got Manchester. Now, you can imagine what's going on if we talk about drug wars. Let's look at it at very 
uh, magnified on that wing. You've got two rival drug gangs of two cities now crossing horns because of what I'm doing. I mean, how fucking stupid was I to, uh, to think that it was ever going to end anything other than this? So <laughs> I've done that for that lad. Things are going all right now. Um, kind of servicing them both, albeit once a week, twice a week. I'm thinking there's enough, because obviously it was being dispersed around the jail. So there was, you know, there's plenty of clientele, I guess, for them. There was not too much problems at that point. There was no big... <laughs> Violence on the wing, shall I say, was quite low, because I think everybody was wanting it to keep it under wraps. Unbeknownst to me, I spoke to staff later on, and they were very suspicious of what I was doing, because like I've said to you early on, prisoners would... I was the golden child. Now, why would you be a golden child as a screw? You're either a really, 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 really nice man, which I was, or or you're on doing something that you shouldn't be. You know, it doesn't take a genius to work out, does it? Did any staff members confront you or, mm. like, say, look, the suspicions about you? Nothing. Nothing. But I later found out that they were, they were watching me. There was a dedicated search team that the prison service had that were watching me via other staff. So technically, grasses. Um, but there was nothing, I'll tell you exactly how it come to a fucking halt. How, how far into the smuggling are you at when it I comes to a halt? I reckon this has been going on about a year. A year you got away with it for. So that's racking up a lot of 500 quids. No, exactly, yeah. <laughs> but if you look at it over the 10 years of my life that I've lost, yeah. if you obviously divide that by, it's, yeah. it really isn't a lot of money. But Did you at least like... Get your money's worth out of, out of it to an extent. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I went on a few nice holidays. <laughs> um, Back to Turkey. <laughs> I bought half a turkey. <laughs> oh, these t-shirts. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, yeah, it was just... I mean, it is quite amusing in a weird way looking at it now, but yeah. it's very, very serious. And again, I don't, I don't condone it. Yeah. Um, so we've got Liverpool on the spin. We've got Manchester on the spin. Yeah. Problems have occurred, I think, within the Manchester side of things. Someone yeah. had got in a bit of trouble on the wing. This is going to back up what we're going to say. Mm. Someone's got in trouble on the wing, has decided to put themselves... <coughs> sorry, in trouble with the Manchester side. Has put themselves in healthcare. Mm. Come up with some tit and tat story. They need to be transferred to healthcare, which for anybody out there, healthcare is a separate unit, quite safe for people who are medically unwell. And you would find that lads, if they were savvy enough, would put themselves in there for respite off a wing or to hide because they know no one could get at them because they have different movements from the rest of the prison. So he's put himself in healthcare. Um, and I thought, okay, you know, what's going on here? I spoke to, spoke to the one of the staff. I said, what's happened with, you know, such and such? Oh, he's, he's, he's lost the plot. He's, he's having a mental breakdown in healthcare. And I'm thinking, mm. oh, shit. You know what I mean? He's, he's heavily involved with what I'm doing. So I'm now thinking I need to get over to healthcare to find out what's going on with this kid. Now I'm, there's a part of me that thinks if I go over there, it's going to look very suspect because why would a wing officer be going to healthcare to, to just see how someone is when you can just pick up the phone and say, you know, how is ex-prisoner? So I'd refrain from doing that. Now this is quite amusing for the people at home, but for me this is a shock or a moment. I've got a week off, I think, booked annual leave at that point. So we're in the summer, beautiful weather, and I've sat in the garden. And I don't want to say it right now because I know people don't like it, but I've opened a, a red top newspaper. Middle page spread, mobile phones in UK prisons. Listen to this. And I'm thinking, I'm sat on my own in my garden now, beer by the side of me, no one around me, and I'm looking at it. The picture of the guy that is in health care is on, on the centre page spread of the sun with a mobile phone like that taking a picture of himself in a cell. And I looked at it and I thought, oh, shit. I'm thinking the game's up here. What do I do? The only thing is, it said um, this prisoner was from Lancaster Castle. Like I've said to you, it was an adult jail. So there was there was kind of discrepancies in the story and it was basically going on about corruption in the prison service and prisoners having access to mobile phones in the jail to then go about their criminal activity. So I'm looking at this in the middle of the paper, in the middle of the garden, thinking, 
oh no, this is not right. This is not happening to me, this. So alert. Now I've still got at that point, mate, three, I think three packages. At that point, they were loaded up, ready to go in. I wasn't meeting them once. I would meet them, take three or four packages off them, say, right, see you in a month or whatever it may be. I had three in my house to go. So at that point, I thought I need to get out of this game no matter how. Couldn't you get the packages back? I don't know. How do people are expecting it to be in there. They've already given me money. But with the newspaper article, that know. was like the last straw. Oh, mate. It's, it, looking at it now, what I should have done at that point, yeah. exactly that. But I was in, I was engulfed in fear, I was engulfed in greed, and I was engulfed in <sighs> bullshit. My head was up my ass. Full-blown alcoholic at that point. Like I said, Jeez. I was sat in the garden. I'd probably three or four cans deep Jeez. and reading this paper in the morning. Yeah. Um, so I've got three packages in my house and I thought, I'm going to get, I need to get out of this prison service. I need to do whatever I need to do. I've got some money to get me going. Um, and I thought, they're really on top now. Now I thought, I might have a stay of execution here. I might have a bit of time. The morning after, I was on a super early shift, which is uh, a 6.30 shift till 12. It's like the Rob Bruce says, I'm going to do that one last job and retire, isn't it? It fucking is, isn't it? <laughs> you know what? It's, just, it's like a boxer, I just one more match, you know, one more fight, and then get sparked out. This is so sad, you're so likeable as well. It's like, <laughs> you just fell into this. <laughs> <laughs> so, three packages in my ass. I'm on an early shift. Mm. I'm thinking now, just get rid of the lot. Get rid of the lot, Lee. Do it. In one go. In one go. So you've got three packages of, say, oh. mate. <laughs> you know what's coming, don't you? <laughs> oh, fuck my life. So I've literally loaded up the underpants that morning. I must have looked like, you know, what was that guy on Desperate Dan with the big bollocks? <laughs> what was his name, him? <laughs> um, so I've loaded up. I've gone into, again, scoping the car park. It was very quiet at that point in the morning, mate, because you're on a super early, so you're the first one onto your wing, i.e. fucking down there, done. How's, that, you, how's your heart at this? Gone, gone. I was probably taking all sorts at that point just to calm myself down. So in the first gate, like I've told you at the prison, not a problem. In the second gate, get your radio, get your keys, and I'm fucking scoping around now. And now I'm walking like fucking John Wayne. I'm struggling to walk properly. There's a door just as you go out into the yard. It opened and it looked like that. And this guy looked at me who was technically a governor, a PO they call him at the time. And he said, have you got a minute? I said, yeah, 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 what's up? Now at that point, I had a little sports bag at that point, you know, for the gym, at the dinner, whatever, sandwiches in, a little sports bag. He went, uh, come in here a minute. So now it wasn't untoward that he'd say, can I have a word? Because he might say, an officer, he might say, listen, we've had a bit of trouble in Buttermere that night on the wing. Just be wary of cell three, four and five. So it wasn't untoward that he would say, can I have a minute? Can you come in here a minute? I said, yeah, yeah, problem. He said, have you got, he said, I don't want to ask you this. I played football with this lad. He said, I don't want to ask you this, but have you got anything on you today that you shouldn't have? And I said, uh, no, no, I've just got my, my bag and my, you know, my sandwiches and that and my football kit. And he went, I'm going to ask you again, have you got anything on you today that you shouldn't have? I said, no. He said, I don't want to have to do this, but I'm going to have to take you upstairs. There's a dedicated search team with dogs and dog handlers there uh, ready to search you. We've had intelligence. And I thought, <sighs> now at that point, I knew, I knew I was going to prison. At that point, I knew I was gone. I was a goner. So I've walked up the stairs like John Wayne again. There's two, I think there's two dogs there, FD screws. Uh, dogs, and I said, I knew the game was up, Sean. I said, look, I'm just going to hold it there, lads. I said, this, this is what you're after. And they were like, all right, thank you very much, but we're still going to have to search a full strip search, full shebang, dogs. Gone into the room. Now, at that point, and this is no word of a lie, and I don't know how I did it because... On bail, I was an absolute emotional wreck. At that point, I've turned into fucking Superface. I knew the game was up, and I don't know where I've heard it. You know, when you hear it on TV, I'm not going to speak until my solicitor gets here, and right to remain silent, all that shite. I took in the governor's firing questions at me. Who are you, who are you fucking involved with? Who are you doing it with? Da, 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 da. Two big screws there, and I'm thinking, oh, fucking hell. I said, Lust, with all respect, 
I'm sorry, but I'm not going to say anything now until I can speak to a solicitor. So I sat there in silence literally for about half an hour. They've said, right, the police are on the way. They're coming to get you now. So it's now's your chance to tell us who you're involved with. And you know as well as I do, if I start blabbing out names, it, do, it doesn't benefit me in any way, shape, or form. It'll all be used form. against you. It'll all be used against me. There's, there's nothing uh, positive to come from it. Um, so there was no names mentioned, and it's been well documented throughout that I've never, certainly never mentioned any names, which allowed me a a violent, free stay in prison, I think. Um, so I'm sat there now waiting for the police to come. At that point, the jail started to open up. All the officers are coming in. Now, I, like I said, they all have to walk through the yard to get onto their wings. Two police people turn up. I've looked at them and they've looked at me and they've gone, and I recognise them from town drinking. And they've gone, is everything all right? And I just went, oh, don't ask, don't ask. No, it's not all right. <laughs> so they've said, they've, they've been informed by the governor and by the search team what's been found. They're obviously putting in evidence bags, three packages, you know, and it, subsequently it turned out to be, I think, two or three phones and probably about nine ounces of cannabis. So, in you know, the old weed. Um, <clears throat> so the police have then said, right, the jail's opening up now. If we take you down in cuffs, it's going to cause alarm. They said, we're not going to put cuffs on you. We want you to walk out into the yard with us. And I'm now thinking, everybody's going to see it. Everybody. Walk into the yard with us. Get in the back of the police car as if you are coming to the station with us. You know, to sometimes you might have to do that. Go out to a court or something like that. And they said, we'll put the cuffs on you in the back of the car. So right. So I've driven through, you know, the entries into prisons. The gate staff are now looking in the car as if to say, that's a prison officer in the back of there. So I go out of the gate, obviously looking up thinking... In my world's just ended. It hasn't ended yet. It, it gets worse, this. <laughs> Trust me, the day of all days. So I'm driv driving out of the, the car park. The two police have turned around to me in the car and said, we can't take you down to Lancaster Police Station. We've got to go to another job. However, there's a police van around this corner who's going to take you down to the station and you'll be processed down there. So I've now got cuffs on in the back of the car, you know, the band cuffs. Got out of the car, two police people have let me get out. This guy has come from the van, this fucking big hefty copper. He's come and grabbed the cuffs, dragged me down like that, dragging me along like this, so I'm now pretty much like that. This is like in a car park around the corner from the jail. Obviously, he's got wind of it on the radio, and he's thinking, I'm fucking big time here. I've gone to get in the back of the van, and he's dragging me in the van, like pulling me in a van, so I had a bit of a to-do with him in the car park. I'm like, what the fuck are you doing? We've got to the police station. Obviously, I'm quiet. I've had 10 minutes now from the jail to the police station to get my head straight, put myself in focus. What's the story? You know, what are we, how, what, how are we going to play this? I get out of the police station in the holding area, secure area. He fucking drags me out of the van again. And so I've had, a, a, again, another little to-do with him in the corridor. So a few more police have come down into the thing, into the holding area. And I'm like, will you fucking sort this idiot out? Um, so I've gone in there, been processed... Uh, they've said, right, okay. Now, if you can imagine, Sean, at that point, I've got full screw kit on, epilepsy, white shirt, um, you know, all the belts, the boots and all that. So I look like a copper, technically. So in the holding cells in the police station, prisoners can see out and they've seen a white shirt with epilepsy go into a cell thinking it's a copper. So there's fucking bang, bang, bang. There's a fucking pig in here. There's a pig in the cells. <sighs> I don't know what I said at that point. I probably said something like, fuck off, I'm a prison officer, so I don't know. So I'm now sat in a cell. <coughs> the world is ending quick. They left me in there for... I've gone in at 8 o'clock in the morning. I was in there still at 8 o'clock at night, awaiting to be seen by a solicitor because they were gathering... There was two detectives... They've sat me in the room, a solicitor's come, and it was only a duty solicitor at that point. Couldn't get hold of mine. I didn't have one at that point, Sean, because I've never I've never fallen foul of a criminal system. So I don't know who I'd have rung as a solicitor. I've no idea. I'd probably rung my dad. Um, <laughs> so I'm said, right, this is the duty solicitor. I've had a quick chat with him for 10, 15 minutes. He said, what's gone on? I've told him he's gone, oh, fuck. <laughs> uh, and he said, right, my advice to you is at the moment, everything is no comment until we can get... Do you know what I mean? Some more foundation to this and find out what they have. So if you can imagine now, I've got a solicitor here. I'm here, still in full screw kit. They're sat opposite me. There's a woman and a man. 
good cop, bad cop, literally. He's opened the interview, right, Lee Davis, da 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 you've been caught with, you know, well, you know, what's asking me questions, who you're working with, we know who you're working with. Then the interview, after about 10 minutes turned sorry, he went, look, we know you're involved um, with a high-level uh, community doing this in London. And I was like, I looked at the solicitor and I thought, I've only ever been to London three times and that was f twice to see Oasis in fucking Finsbury Park. <laughs> and once, once I think I'd gone down there working. And I was like, sorry, what? And he went, we know who you are. And he said, we know that you conduct this kind of activity in London, in jails. And I'm like, whoa, this has taken a whole new level of shit, this. And I'm not involved with anything like that. It was purely me doing what I was doing. <laughs> he was fucking throwing everything at me saying, will you be looking at 10 years? And I'm like, what the hell? Now, obviously, he was trying to scare me. <clears throat> and they were trying to work out whether I would admit to anything. I think there was a big problem in London at the time. I think they were trying to find out if I was linked to it, thinking that I'd shit myself and go, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm involved in it. But I wasn't. It was totally so far from the truth. So they've gone down that line for, it must have gone on for about an hour and a half, mate. Just no comment, no comment, no comment. You know, we've, we've all seen them on TV, haven't we? And it literally was. At the end, I stopped him at one point and said, I'm just going to say no comment to everything, so you might as well just finish it now. But they have to follow the, the process. So I've come out of there. Now, my head's up my arse now. I've still got my little sandwich bag, by the way. Now, I thought I would go straight to Magistrates Court, straight to Crown Court, remand. That would be my thinking. If they thought who, who I was, who they thought I was, orchestrating it in London, you'd think they would just remand me. But they didn't. They actually bailed me. Fucked up, innit? So now he's, I've got a charge sheet, charged with, you know, I've picked up my little sports bag, still with my ham sandwiches in, bingo. <laughs> and they've said, can we, um, they said, where are you going? I said, I just want an hour out of here just to clear my head. And they said, no, we can't let you do that. Uh, you need someone to come and pick you up because this is pretty traumatic. I said, no, honestly, I'm all right. Oh, fucking hell, mate. My dad, they opened the door, they'd rung my dad. Um, he was stood at the door and I thought, oh, that's, I think that's when it hit home. You know, when you see your dad's face, oh, it must I mean, they're, horrible. yeah, they're horrific. I mean, they're, they're great people. They're not involved in. What was the first thing he said to you? Do you know what he said? I had my bag. He took my bag off me and I thought, well, I'm going to get a crack here. He said, I bet you've had a better day, aren't you? And I said, do you know what, dad? Yeah. And he went, come on, uh, we, let's have a talk about it before we uh, go and see your mum. And now when he said to my mum, I thought, oh, okay. What was the, the talk like? The talk was, he said, look, what's gone on? Now, there's a backstory to this. Rewind about two or three hours. You're allowed one phone call in a police station, yeah? So I've rung, I think at the time, I think I did ring my mum, thinking she didn't know what was going on. So I just rung her and said, hiya, mum, you all right? I'm just down at Lancaster Police Station. Um, I've only got a minute or two. I'll give you a ring later on. I'm just, I'm working down there today. Phone call finished. I'm I'm starting to blub on the phone now. Right, all right, I'll speak to you in a bit. I'll speak to you in a bit. Right, so I haven't told you this, but on the wing that I was working, I was going on with another girl, as in having relations with another prison officer, because I was a dickhead, Sean. I was an absolute dickhead. So I'm having relations with another prison officer on my wing that knows my girlfriend. What a fucking dickhead. <sighs> She, when I've been tugged in the morning, she's ran to the fucking governor. Horrible woman, by the way. She's ran to the governor, gone, I'm not involved with what he's doing. I'm just sleeping with him. No. <laughs> so she snitched herself out. So the governor, what have I told you before, who works at the prison? My girlfriend's mum. <sighs> she's got wind of it. My girlfriend's mum gone rat. She's told my miss. I'm in the police station at this point thinking nobody knows what I've done. Oh. Every fucker knew. Everybody was waiting for me when I come out. So talk about days, right? So I come out and he went, we're going to have to go and have a chat with your mum and uh, your girlfriend's on the way up as well. Uh, she knows. And I said, she knows what? And he went, she knows. How long had you been with your girlfriend? Six, uh, six years. Did you have kids with her at that point? No, no. Just engaged. Just engaged. So I'm on my way up to see my mum. As I arrive, dad's asked me in the car, what's been going on, son? I've told him the truth. I've said, look, dad, I'm involved in a bit of summer. And he said, my dad's very matter of fact, he said, what are we looking at? And I said, jail, probably for a while. Uh, got there, my mum, bless her, she's not, she's a, she's a lady lady, if you know what I mean. She's a nice little lady. Uh, not a bad bone in her body. She went, 
bless her, her words to me, Lee, well, if you just tell them the truth, then, you know, the police will understand that. I said, Mum, it doesn't work like that. It absolutely doesn't work. <clears throat> so I'm sat on the set here at my mum's house telling her what I've done in the nicest possible way. Um, trying not to scare her too much because she's like, you can't go to prison, you can't go to prison, you're a prison officer. Bang, bang, bang on the door. Fucking oh, fire. The girlfriend's come flying in. You bastard. Boom. Obviously, she's found out. Her mum has rung her. So I've lost my job. I've lost my career. I've pissed off my family. My girlfriend's found out that I'm dotting someone else. Her mum's screaming on the fucking garden path uh, and it's you know you dirty bastard mate it was it was the day of all days it really was <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody's had a worse day than that and i mean i've been flipping about it now but it was it was the whole world crashed <laughs> you know what i'm saying mm. so yeah that's where we were with that so on them people when you go through the court system you i had to answer to a magistrate's date for people in america magistrate's court is a, a lower level court where you would answer minimal crimes. If they can't deal with it, I don't know the exact stuff behind it, but if they can't deal with it and it's a severe offence, it gets transferred to a high, a crown court and then on, so on and so on. So the magistrate's court date was maybe... So, right, let's get this straight. So I was bailed. Hold on a second then. So after you miss his lamp, yeah. <laughs> Did you like, what did you say to her? What comeback can you come from that? What did you say to her? I just said, I'm really sorry, I'm really sorry. And she was just in a rage. Now, I still live with her at that point. So, right, that's it, you can, you're can. you out of the house, da, da. My cat's at home, and I'm thinking, I just want to know my cat's all right. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. you know? So, at that point, I was bailed to answer magistrate's court. Now, because I've not been convicted of an offence, technically, in employment law, the prison service can't sack you. They've got to wait until you convict, even though I was caught red-handed. So they probably would have had a case for getting rid of me, but they didn't. Kept me on the payroll. So I'm sat at home, on bail, answering my magistrate's court date. Lee, we can't deal with this offence at Mag's court. All you've got to do, I think, is... I think you've got... You can give an indication of the plea that you're going to give, but I didn't. Still in talks with solicitors, still trying to get the story straight, still trying to work out what is the best way around this offence? Did you get the evidence against you, the paperwork? Um, I think because it was, because I was red-handed, I didn't see it. I didn't get that until I got to Crown. Like what led to the investigation? No, in, no, in, they in didn't. The they didn't allow okay. anything like that. But I think because it was prison service stuff, mm. they, there was probably a bigger operation going on. So I was never privy to exactly what they had on me, mm. apart from the red-handed catch. Um, so I was on bail, answered the Mag's court date, went to Crown Court to give pleas. Uh, I think you maybe have a couple of Crown dates. At that point, it was at Lancaster Castle. They actually held a court up there. Um, and the judge, I'll be honest with you, the judge at the time, he seemed, I wouldn't say he was going to give me an easy touch, but he seemed all right. He seemed, he wasn't roasting me too much. He took on board everything. He's, I think he even said at one point, I can understand how this can happen. So I'm now thinking maybe I've done a lot of research at this point. Bearing in mind, the Sun again had written an article on it saying that um, Lancaster Prison Guard um, will be facing 10 years behind bars. So obviously my fucking mum's seen it, everybody's seen it, and I'm thinking, shit, me. Fuck. And did you know at that point you would have to do 50% if it came in at 10? Yeah, yeah. Um, there were still IPPs knocking about at that point, um, but I think there were more 50-50s. The only thing I did know is that I'd done a bit of research into sentencing, as we all do when we get, and I thought, you know what, they're actually talking shit here. The maximum they can give me. I think the maximum was a six or a seven. More likely a four or five on a real good day, a three. There was a few women that were getting caught with prisoners, having relations, taking phones in. They were getting like fucking two years, three years. So I've got it in my mind. In actual, when I went through Crown Court, the guy, he was all right, and I thought, he's, he might give me a touch here, I might get a three and a half. Lo and behold, it come to the big date, sentencing date. So was there a trial? Yeah. Um, it come to the big sentence. Well, I'd gone guilty straight away. I chucked my hands in. You went guilty. Get, went guilty so straight away. So it's just like away. a pre-sentencing so Pre-sentencing yeah. report. Um, it was good, due to be heard at Lancaster Crown Court. Now, I was still being paid by the prison service. 
I got a call from Lancaster Crown Court and said, I'm really sorry, Mr. Davis, your court's now been transferred to Preston Crown Court. Now, I'd geared myself on bail for a year of that day, of saying bye-bye to your mum, your dad, and everything was in order, finances, to go on that day. They've said, I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, your case has now been transferred to Preston Crown Court. And I'm like, well, that's a bit fucking strange. This guy's been with me all the way through. It's actually now going to be heard by judge. She was a woman. Um, by a different judge. Now, alarm bells were ringing, and I'm thinking, why is this? He's probably put a report in, looking back, saying, I'm going to give this lad three and a half years. Crown prosecution have gone, oh, fucking no, you're not. So then they've given it to this other woman, let someone else have a look at it. I've gone down there. She said, right, I need a little bit more time to look at this. Sorry, I tell a lie there. I've thought, I've got two more weeks freedom. So I fucked off to Egypt, <laughs> as you do. Fucked off to Egypt, sat in the Sharm El Sheikh, Hilton for two weeks, sorry, a week, come back, get my head involved in going to prison. Preston Crown Court comes, loads of people from the prison are there, loads of people from the press are there, the court is obviously full of people interested in this ongoing case. She said, she's looked at it apparently for a week, and she said, right, okay, Mr Davis, she tore me a new arsehole, and I mean tore me a new arsehole in front of everyone, and you are involved in this, you are involved in that, uh, you are corrupting young men. Uh, it just, honestly, mate, she ripped me a new one. And she said, I don't know what to do with you. I need a few more hours. And I'm, I'm looking at me, mum and dad are looking at me, and people are looking at me and saying, is this fucking bird for real? How and long it, were those hours? Not very little, well, not very long, because down from Preston Crown Court, there's a Wetherspoons. I went for a pint <laughs> of Guinness. Because she actually released me out of the dock, because she was confident that I was not going to abscond. I'd, I'd attended every... You know, I wasn't of the, you know, the the finance to abscond, shall we say, a risk. So I had a stay of execution, a couple of pints and Wetherspoons with my old man. <laughs> you don't expect that, do you, on sentencing day? Um, and, then back into, <laughs> and then back into the dock, ready for her to go again. And she said, I can see no less than me giving you, it was like concurrent and consecutive for contraband, cannabis, um, what did I call it? Conveying an article into prison. So all in all... She'd give me four years on the nose. 50% that you had to do. 50%, two years in jail. Now, four years, as we spoke about previous, if you hit four years, crimes leave footprints on future job applications, uh, future prospects, um, and four years on the nose will follow you seven years after your licence finished. So I got sent to jail May 2010. I did two years in jail. So released May 2012, you do two years on licence to complete a four-year sentence, 50-50. That period there, seven years to leave the footprint, doesn't leave your sentence until 2014, seven years later. So it's only just come off my record clean. Now, when we talk about committing crime, and i am give you the figures before of 400 quid, 500 quid, it doesn't matter what it is. It's cost me cost a lot of people the hurt that I caused, uh, the anger, the destruction that I give myself throughout in the middle of this. I don't know if you want to touch on that. Um, but it's taken almost 11 years for me being able to apply for a, a reasonable job again. So is it really worth it for that 400 quid that day? Is it really worth it? And is it really worth youngsters saying, and I know it's an easy route out sometimes to make a quick book, but it will follow you and it causes more destruction. And you had a cocaine addiction throughout this as well. Massive. Massive, mate. On bail, as I said, I was still being paid by prison service. So I was still getting, you know, your th I was at that point probably 1,400 quid a month. Um, I'd become very insular. I didn't want, I was scared to go out because people were asking me in the streets. Um, everybody was interested in what, because I was a decent football. I was fairly popular within our community. So everyone knew me. So as soon as they saw me in the street, whether it be they were genuinely interested in it or whether it, you just wanted to find out the story, every corner I turned, what's going on? What's going on? When are you going to prison? How long are you going to get? And I'm like, it, it fucking, my head was ruined. Like I said, I was already a big drinker. Back in the 90s, as we spoke previously, I'd been out and about on the party scene, on the rave scene. Um, and I think subconsciously, my brain thought, how do I ease all this guilt, anger, pressure, disappointment? Obviously, the drink. I then started using cocaine to the point of not where I would be going out into bars having a, a really fucking nice time. I'd be sat at home with a bag of cocaine, 
snort the fucking lot of it. Then you need the alcohol to bring you down. Then you're down in the morning. You need the cocaine to bring you. It, it was just an endless seesaw of absolute shit. You, you were shit. blocking out the trauma of what you were going through. Absolutely. By medicating. Absolutely. And plus yeah. as well, factor into that, I'd got medication off the doctor. So I was on, they gave me some fucking hell, some tablets that they used to give to people in the World War or something that would... What were they called? I honestly don't know. It might come to me in a minute, mate, but he prescribed me them straight away for people who were going through hefty trauma. No Xanax. I don't think it was Xanax, no. I'll try and think of, I'll try and think of the name. I'm on, I'm on some at the moment, a very mild one called Brintelex. Mm. They're quite a mild uh, anxiety mm. kind of tablet. And I mean, my intention is to come off them. But I tried throughout all this, mate, throughout the last 10 years, they've prescribed me all kinds of shit. But ultimately, mate, it was me giving myself a hard time. Um, and that, that went on for a long while, mate. I mean, I was going on a slippery slope for a long while after prison. The day of your sentencing then, did you, like, dress a certain way and have, were you allowed to bring things into the prison system? You probably knew all the rules from your yeah, I mean, previous job. Yeah, I mean, I'd, I, I think at the time, I think I'd put a suit on, you know, to, to kind of show that I was, you know, I didn't want to turn up in a fucking England top. Mm. Um, I think I dressed accordingly to think, you know, the judge might think, well, actually, the lad's remorseful. Didn't fucking work, did it? I might as well have turned up in my shorts and T-shirt. Um, I took a bag with me that you can go into prison with, i.e. toothbrush, underwear, you know, some tracky pants. But when you get into clothes conditions, you get issued with prison issue clothing. So obviously your underwear and your toothbrush and your basic toiletries you can take in. Um, but as regards taking your own stuff, you get that handed to you later on as you come down the, the security ladder. So take us, what happens in court once you're sentenced? Do the guards just come and handcuff you? <laughs> You're in the dock, you're in an enclosed dock, um, so there's no chance of jumping the dock in, in Preston. Um, it's, it's, it's not actually prison staff, it's G4S staff who are a, you know, a third party to the prison service, government funded maybe, I don't know, private company, sorry. Um, so they initially, they didn't put cuffs on me because it was an enclosed situation. You then get taken down to court. As you come out of the dock from public view, they then put the cuffs on you to walk downstairs to then be processed in the cells downstairs. Um, the funny thing is that I knew quite a lot of the staff in Preston Crown Court, so it was a very surreal experience of them thinking, what the fuck have you done? But, so I was sat in the cell, unbeknownst to me, I thought I would go to the local Nick, again, being naive. Were your mum and dad waving to you as you were going? <laughs> like in the court? No, it was just a disappointed, sad look, mate. Was um, it? Yeah, I mean, I didn't, again, I didn't show any emotion at that point because I'd tortured myself through the, through the last year with it. It was just uh, tears mm -hmm. constantly. It, jail was a different kettle of fish. Um, I managed to turn the emotion off. Um, but then again, that had repercussions later on. Because mm. um, I think you do, you have to kind of act up, I think, in jail, don't you? And certainly with my ex... Uh, employment status I had to mask a lot of the the traits that I would have um you know to, to obviously not bring it on top that was an ex-prison officer but yeah I'll tell you a fucking funny story about that in a minute I mean need not have bothered um so I'm sat in Preston cells I'm thinking I'm going to Preston Crown Court 10 minutes 10 minutes away I'm sat in the cells now till courts in England shut around tea time I'm still sat there at six or seven at night with a few court staff. And I said, what's going on? Where am I going? They said, we don't know. No one's told us. The prison service, um, like a hotel, have to accept you. So, like, the governor is a maitre d'. So, we will look at me. They knew this case was going to happen. So, he's looked at it and thought, fuck that. I'm not having a prison officer in my jail. Because <laughs> it could have been hefty, that. So, I'm now put on a sweat box, prison service transport, which is an experience in itself. Fucking horrible, small little window, stinking of piss, uh, dark, horrible, noisy. And you sat there in it, literally in a box, literally a box with a little peak glass that someone can speak to you. I'm sat there and even then they didn't tell me where I was going. The girl who got on was a girl who I knew. She was, uh, they have to have someone in the back to, to stay with you. And she said, we're going to Shrewsbury. And my exact words were, where the fuck is Shrewsbury? <laughs> it's in Shropshire. And I thought, well, that sounds far away. <laughs> you know, like you're going on a jolly. Mm. I said, well, well, I said, well, where's Shrewsbury? And she was like, well, I don't know. The sat-nav says it's like three and a half hours away. 
I said, shit, three and a half hours. Because I'm now thinking, well, what about my family? Visits. Visits, family, all that. Got to Shrewsbury. It was a very long journey, that, mate. There was a lot of soul searching going on um, and a lot of reflection. Albeit, I mean, it was a very traumatic day. And then you sat in a box just with yourself. I don't think there can be... I mean, that's prison in itself, really. Get to Shrewsbury. Very oldie worldy Nick. Again, go and watch that drama, Time. You'll understand what I mean. You go through the big doors, a little cubby hole, reception staff sign you in. Walked into the reception and I could tell straight away. I mean, now the jail is locked up. We're now talking 10 o'clock at night, half 10 at night. That doesn't happen in prison, by the way. It was only because I didn't know where I was going. So I've gone into the reception staff. They've obviously had to stay on, so they're pissed off as it is, you know, because they've had to wait to sign me in. Right, over there, search. Yep, fine, bang. Given them some shitty grey tracksuit pants, three sizes too big, and a jumper, six sizes too big. Um, prison officers said, right, you're going to be on the top landing. Now, I'm getting myself in prison mall now. And I hadn't eaten at that point, mate, for, I don't know, late afternoon. I'd had a sandwich out of the court. Your stomach kind of goes into knots, though, doesn't it, after sentencing? Well, all that tension, all that yeah. adrenaline, all that... Um, nervous energy is all then there and trust me there's no toilets on sweat boxes um so we said you're going to be on the fours landing tonight of this big victorian building have you had anything to eat so no i haven't he said right we've got something for you he handed me like a takeaway box i've opened it there was probably i think 20 odd cold chips so i've been in weatherspoon i've been in weatherspoons at dinner time for a couple of pints i've been given 20 cold chips fucking 10 hours later <laughs> so yeah that's that was a harsh lesson that was a slap in the face straight away as if to say you're just a shit bag now there's your 20 cold chips <laughs> so they've taken me up to they've taken me up to the fours landing that was a long walk so you're going upstairs up to the top there's a prison officer that met me there he said right okay you're going to be in cell nine I said, right okay opened it up now i'm thinking oh maybe i'm getting a room on my own like i've talked about before I've opened it and there's a guy sat at the back of the cell. It's cut, so like the chair, there's a bunk bed here. There's a chair at the back of the cell. You've got a TV on a wall here uh, and a desk to do your letters and your, your admin. He sat at the back of the cell, rolling in his mouth. He said, all right. Now, bear in mind, I've been to Egypt two weeks before. I was fucking suntanned up to death. I looked like a party boy. He sat at the back of the cell and he looked a rum lad. There was, you know, scar down his face here. And I thought, this is fucking not happening. He said, all right, mate, in a Brummie accent. I said, all right, pal, how are you? And he went, yeah, come in. And I thought, again, paranoia thinking, is he going to fucking attack me? How am I going to hit him? What am I going to hit him with? All oh, bollocks. And he said, sit down if you want. I sat down. Now, I didn't know at this point, but Shrewsbury had half the population was sex offenders. So they were on one wing. Half the population was normal location. But I didn't know this. I couldn't research where I was going. So I've got into the jail and he sat down. He said, are you a nonce? I said, what? He said, are you a nonce? I said, no, I'm not. No, I'm not, mate. And he went, well, what are you in for? I said, and I couldn't say, oh, I just went, drugs. Technically, I wasn't lying. There was drugs involved. I just said, oh, drugs. And he went, right. He said, if you're a nonce, you're not staying in here. I said, trust me, mate, I'm not a nonce. And he went, right, all right. Anyway, that was that. He said, do you want a brew? <laughs> now, Mary, I've just done me 20 cold chips. And he said, do you want a brew? I said, mm, yeah, 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 I'll have a brew, yeah. And he sat me down. He's added me like a biscuit, fucking canteen biscuit, the free ones that you get. And he said, there you go. I said, all right. And he went, you're on the top. He'd had the, the, you know, the bunk bed underneath. He said, you're on the top. Do you need anything? Have you got a toothbrush? I said, no, no, I'm all right, mate. I've got my toothbrush here. Because um, he was, he, he, lo and behold, he was the cleaner on that wing. So he looked after all the lads that come on the wing. He would make sure they had towels. He'd make sure they had kit, all this. And he went, do you need anything? Do you need any soap? And I'm thinking, all them stories about soaps in prison. I'm thinking, do I fuck need soap? <laughs> so um, I said, no, I'm all right, mate. Honestly, I'm thanks. And he went, right, all right. So I've got on the top bunk. Lights went out. And he put, I think, Family Guy on. So Family Guy was on in the fucking TV. <laughs> I'm on the top bed. And I mean, imagine, try, imagine trying to process what's just happened that day. Been in Weatherspoons. I've been four years up my ass in court. I've got 20 cold chips. He's asked me if I'm a nonce. 
He's given me a cup of tea and now I'm watching Family Guy. But the day before I was at home, it's a lot to take in for someone, isn't it? I mean, you've you've been there yourself in much <laughs> worse surreal, con- much worse conditions than me. But I think when Family surreal. Guy come on, that just blew my head. <laughs> so all I've done, I've laid on the top bunk, everything going on in my mind. Um, I tell you, like just before that, I did a very quick phone call to my mum. Uh, I'm not going to lie, mate, I broke down. No one was on the wing. I could hear the nervousness in her voice. She said, are you all right? Are you all right? And I was lying. I said, mum, I'll be fine. Everything's fine here. It's all right. It's an all right place. I mean, mate, I'd, I'd fucking crumbling inside. So I had to have a minute or two to get my head together before I went in that cell. Um, I think he could probably see that, which is why he said, look, just sit down, do you want a brew? But obviously he had to ask me of, of the offence because he knew the clientele that was in there. I didn't. So I just thought it was a random question. So, yeah, the next... I think that night, mate, I must have got three hours sleep maximum, and that's on and off because I was just... I remember being laid there. There's no curtains in this cell. There was a little window, so the daylight was coming in. It was May. It was the end of May, so it would be getting light at, say, half three, four in the morning. I remember just being sat in this fucking cell, looking out of the window, thinking, I don't know how I'm going to get through this. I don't know how I'm going to do it. But the morning after came... Doors open, as you know, bump. My, it's my first introduction. And I knew maybe it was a good thing that I'd worked in a jail because I knew what the routine, routine would be. Yeah. Maybe it wasn't a good thing because I also knew the shit that I could get myself into. Mm. So I don't know. I don't know if that was good or bad. Um, I've gone out onto the wing, doors opened. I've gone out straight to the office, to the prison officer and said, you know, I knew the drill. Can you sort me these telephone numbers out on my pin phone so I can then notify family where I am? Uh, again, put it on an application. <laughs> that was the start of my application trail. Um, so, yeah, the, the first few days, mate, were quite <sighs> surreal. Nervy, surreal, anxious. People were coming up to me, saying questions all the time. Are you a fucking nonce? No, I'm not. I'm just like, why are people asking me if I'm a nonce? I, mean, I don't fucking look like a nonce. I, mean, if, I don't know what a nonce looks like, but, you know, what? it, it was that all the time. And I said to this guy, and he said, you know why they're asking that, don't you? I said, no. He said, because it's full of them in here. I said, what do you mean? And he said, well, it's a sex offender's wing. It's where you do your induction, and then you get distributed. The nonces will be on there. And I said, right, all right. Now now I'm clocking it, why everyone's on that case. So anyway, the first few days have gone on. Everything's been all right. I'm expecting maybe some violence, maybe some cracks, maybe some whatever, nothing. And I thought, okay. So now I've relaxed a little bit. Now I've started to think, well, how am I going to go about this two years of my life? How do you get around it? Um, so I've started like going to the library and stuff, trying to get any books, anything, mate, that could get me hands on. Um, a quick one, fast forward a month or two in that jail. In the UK jails at that point, you had cell cards outside of your cell. So you could see who was physically in that cell. I don't know if it's the same in America, mate. A cell card? Yeah, almost like a, an ID card. So, oh, I so, see. So I in see. that cell is uh, Atwood and Davis, and there'll be a little picture of you. Guards have it on a computer and a clipboard. Yeah. We do have little IDs, but we have to clip them to our top when we go and get our chow. Yeah. 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 So they would, you would be able to identify who's in that cell, mostly for the prison officers, not for the lads. So I remember the lad coming back to me, who I was padded up with at the time, the, the brummy lad, and he said, have you seen that cell card next door? I said, nah, I'm not interested, mate. And he went, go and have a look at it. Do you recognise the picture? So, I, you know, as, as I was passing, and I've had a look, I didn't want to fucking pry too much because if he had come out of his cell and said, what the fuck are you looking at that for? So I've looked at it and I've thought, no, I don't recognise him. Over dinner, he said, you don't recognise it, do you? I said, no, I don't. I, I don't recognise the name and I don't recognise the picture. I said, why? Should I, should I know who it is? And he went, don't know. This has gone on for two or three days, and I'm thinking, oh, okay, now, who is it? So I, I'm now looking at it every time I go past to try and work out who it is. The name doesn't ring any bells. So he's come in, and he sat down. He said, right, I'll tell you who it is. I said, go on, then. He said, I think I know who it is. I said, right, go on, mate. This game's getting boring. So he showed me a picture, and I've looked at it, and I thought, nah. I said, no, nah, that's not him. No, nah, it's not. It's full of shit. And he went, look at the eyes on the way past. So I've looked at it again. I think I've even got on Tekken cell card. He might have fucked off to work. So I'm at Tekken cell card. I've looked at it and I've thought, nah, I don't know. 
so anyway, it transpired that it was the lad who, and I don't think he's well liked in the, the media, is the lad, you remember the little lad who got done on the train tracks, the little baby? Oh, we're talking about um, the Bulger situation. Mm. And um, I had another prisoner, ex-prisoner. I think I saw it, the lad. Joey the... Barnett with the tattoos yep. down his face. Yep. Yeah, 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 I saw him. So he ran into this guy. So there's Venables was the perpetrator, wasn't it? Yeah. And Bulger was the victim. Bulger was the little baby. They've so I was it. in America when this happened. So yeah. people were criticizing me. They say, how can you not be familiar with this case? Yeah. This doesn't get reported in America. Yeah, you know? it was big. I mean, I, I would have been, um, I don't know the timings of it, but I remember it being all over the media. Now, obviously he would have, been, they were children themselves. When I say children, they were, I kind of think, 12, I want to say around early so early looked, teens, 12. Yeah. Since then. yeah, so they, they took a baby on and, yeah, well, let's not go into it, but they were kids themselves. So for me to meet him, I met him as an adult. Now, what has happened is, he has been in jail, obviously for the, the nature of the crime that he's committed, they've given him a new identity. So there was two perpetrators then? There was two of them. Are you talking about the same perpetrator that Joey Barnett talked about? I think so, yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, let's, let's call it Venables, yeah. even though that's not the alias now. They were given new identities. Yeah. So he, I've then really gone into it. This guy was a very withdrawn guy, wouldn't come out of his cell much. Um, wasn't in any way, you know, engaging with anyone. He was just very solitary. He actually come round to borrow some coffee off me or something. So I got a real good look, and I fucking thought, do you know what? It actually could be. Now I shouldn't have done it, but I've gone to the officer on the wing and said, off the record, I've opened the door, shut the door, and said, you know, can you look at this application? And I just said to him, I got on well with the officer, by the way. I said. Just tell me one thing. And he looked at me like that and I went, the person who's next to me, there's a lot of uh, noise on the wing about who it might be. And he went, right. He said, I don't know. I wouldn't have information to that. You know, I'm not privy to that information. He said, even if it was who you think it is, I wouldn't know. And I just said, to, and he looked at me like that and I just said, so it's not the person that I think it is then. And he went, Believe it or not believe it, that was that. And I said, say no more. And that was that. I didn't do anything with that. I just wanted to know for my own peace of mind. I've just been a nosy bastard, but I wanted to know for my own peace of mind. Because you do, you want to know who you're in close proximity to. Me being an ex-prison officer, you had to have a nature of that about you because you needed to know who you were dealing with. So again, I think that carried me through. I want to know who's living next door to me. To a certain degree, I want to know who I'm living with as well, for fuck's sake. Um, so yeah, that that was one in there. So did anything happen to Venables? Uh, I don't think it did. No, but he got moved fairly soon after that because I think it become. I think there was a lot of people making it was, a lot. It was building up. It was building up, and I think he'd already been moved around, given a few new identities. So I don't think it was. I, I think people knew, but I don't think anything happened to him in there. Any like, other high profile ones? Um, I think that was about it in there, mate. I don't think. I mean, going to. Going to Sudbury, I mean, fast forward down the line. Um, so you, mo you got moved from Shrewsbury yeah. to Sudbury. The natural progression in your sentence, mate, is obviously to do your closed conditions. And then if you tick all the boxes, and when I say that, I mean nature of offence, uh, what your record's been like in jail, um, what you know your aspirations are, you can actually apply for a lower security category. So in England, it's called Category D. Um, you've got your Cat A's who are big high risk. You know, people who are involved in high-level crime. Cat B's are like your locals. Cat C's. And then Cat D is your open prison. Open conditions, low security, people trusted to kind of integrate back into communities. Um, I don't know if you'd have, do you have that system in America or is it... So in America, it's super max, max, medium, minimum. I think sometimes you get like a high medium as well. Right. So they are the levels. The varying levels of who you are, what your crime is, and how you're behaving, really, yeah? Exactly. You have an institutional risk score. Yep. If you're a 5'5", five five, you're the yep. highest possible. Right. So you see that in Supermax. So, but it's so different from the UK system. Like, there's just nothing you can be, you know, they don't yeah. like pool balls and no. all this stuff. I don't think the, it sounds like a, let's face it, a much safer system. 
I mean, it, I don't know if it is or it isn't, but... Structurally, it is safer. Yeah. But it's actually way more dangerous than yeah. the English system because yeah. of the maniac, cold behaviour of the people. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All the gangs, the drug gangs, the violence, and the they do get weapons anyway. Yeah. They make shanks out of fence. They make paper shanks. They get... Um, they strip metal. They find metal. Yeah. I mean, the ones that obviously in England are that, you know, with the blades, you get given a razor. Yeah, the double razor. The double razor and whatnot. Yeah. Um, you know, they're usually put in, melted into toothbrushes or anything, you know, plastic yeah. cutlery from the canteen. Yeah. There's all kinds of ways, isn't there? River um, rocks, yeah. in socks is, yeah. is one that they use, yeah. So the, the, the progression to go from Shrewsbury would be to go to an open prison. So I'd uh, technically kept my nose clean, pardon the pun, mm-hmm. um, for throughout my period. Um, I'd engaged in what they wanted me to engage in, but they couldn't, in a prison service, they try and engage people into courses. The only thing that they could offer me is fucking maths and English at a very basic level. I mean, what, you know, no disrespect, there are a lot of lads in there that would benefit from that who've probably not had, you know, an education like we may have had. But for me, what benefit is doing a fucking maths course? Yeah. There was no real, you couldn't apply for outward courses at that point. A third of the prisoners couldn't read all right where I was. Right. And there's a high school diploma thing. I was actually the teacher for it for a little bit. Right. I can't remember what it's called now. Um, yeah, but um, that's what they, they need, isn't it? Job skills and education. Some, but they something don't, to keep they your head busy. Yeah, something yeah, to keep yeah, your head busy yeah. in there, mate. I mean, we know the, the biggest killer in there for me was boredom and monotony. Yeah, yeah. And plus the talk is all on the wings. There's a very low level of stimulation. Mm. It's all talk about who's doing what. Who's what the they're in for? Who's the biggest? Who's the biggest? Uh, exactly. And, yeah, and I wasn't. I didn't want to get involved in yeah. that. So we've gone on to. They've said right. Your options are. Oh, I've not told you the inside time story. No, go on. Right. This is a belter. This one. So four or five days in, there is a magazine that's distributed to prisoners in the prison service called Inside Times. Uh, they used to have. I can't remember. The other one was called Converse. It's a, a magazine that's distributed to every cell or for prisoners to pick up that's got things like legal letters in it, legal help, prisoner stories, little things for them to do. Um, <laughs> five days into my sentence, uh, a prison officer came into my cell and he said, have you got a minute? I need to have a word with you ASAP. I said, right, okay, what's up? He said, governor, the number one governor wants to see you. And I thought, mm, maybe he just wants to discuss you know, my job. He's took me into the office, big ivory office, big lovely table, as they do. Um, and he said, uh, Aya Lee, you all right? Now, obviously, for him to say, Aya Lee, Aya Lee, you all right? Yeah, I'm all right, yeah. You know, how was your first few days gone? I said, yeah, all right, yeah. Uh, we've got a, a problem. I said, go on then. He said, are you familiar with the Inside Times? I said, yeah. And he put a copy of the Inside Times on the table with my fucking picture on the front of it. <sighs> Cover story. So... Cover story's gone. Big problems now in my mind. I'm now thinking, oh, shit, the prison sir. And I said, all right. Well, I said, well, you know, that's all right. He went... No, everyone in the country now knows who you are in the prison system. Everyone in the country knows who you are. Not only that, this paper has been distributed in this jail under every door this morning by one of the night staff. And I thought, yeah, all right, likely story. So everybody in that jail now, now knows who I am. Five days into my sentence. Now, I was kind of looking to keep it low-key. He's still with the big guy with the scar on his still face. Still with the big guy with the scar on his face. I've got back. So he said, what do you want to do about it? He said, obviously, it's a risk. And I said, no shit, it's a risk. Um, and he said, right, what do you want to do about it? I'm happy, to a certain degree, I'm happy to go off your instruction. Do you feel safe? Do you think you're going to get dotted? And I said, well, I said, he said, what What can we do? I said, and I thought, ah, I'll get back up north. I said, I tell you what, I'll feel a lot safer um, if I can be transferred back up to, you know, my home area so I can see my family and visits. And he went, it's not going to happen. I looked at him like that and the anger kicked in. I thought, hang on a minute, you've just fucking distributed my mug all around this jail. Now you're telling me I can't go back to my own area, but you're asking me how I feel about it. I just (laughs) said, look, do what you want. I said, do what you will. It's now on your head. I'll go back on that wing and it's on you. Get me out of here. And I did, I did, I did, I lost the plot. I, I shouldn't have done it, but I just said, get me the fuck out of here. You had a lot of tension at that point. Got back onto the wing, 
got back into my cell. <laughs> this lad sat there with a massive grin on his face. And he's like, do you want a brew? <laughs> I said, yeah, go on then. And he went, drugs then. <laughs> he said drugs and I went yeah drugs <laughs> he had the paper like that and he went fucking better suntan now aren't you because it was the police mugshot that the police had used and if you google it it is horrific honestly I look, I look in a bad way so yeah so you have been outed 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 in the jail um, so yeah so the couple of lads they actually did come to see me and say, you know, obviously we're, we're aware now that you're an ex-prison officer. Uh, keep your head down in here and you'll be all right. Uh, you know, we'll make sure you're all right. Um, so again, you're thinking, fucking, what do they want from me? <laughs> I can't do all now. I haven't got any keys. <laughs> <laughs> the keys have gone. <laughs> um, no, yeah, so it was, yeah, it was all right. It was, I'm not going to sit here and lie and say I got, there was a few offers of violence. There was a few schneid comments. Um there was a few altercations, maybe a bit of argy bargy, but nothing, you know, nothing untoward. Um, and again, I think that comes down to them, them lads that are at the back because I think people knew that, you know, I then frequented with them. Let's say I went to the gym with them, you know, I was on the wing with them and having a brew with them. So I think people kind of knew that they had to just leave it be. What happened with the argy bargy? Uh, just down in the gym, we'd had a couple of flare ups down in the gym. Um, more to do with, you know, playing things like five-a-side football, you know, a little tackle there, but all of a sudden you've got two or three lads pushing you around. Not because of the football, just because of your ex-job, you fucking screw, you fucking pig, you this, that and the other. Just little things like that. You know, nothing nothing major, mate. Um, so then you get moved to an open prison. Yeah, so we've we've discussed the, the, the story in regards Sudbury, haven't we? Yeah, you know, you so, know, the, the, so we, the start, police officer. we started out. Um, how did you end up meeting that police officer? There was three yeah. police officers in the beginning. How did you end up meeting them? Right, so I'll, there was actually, I'll, I, you've just reminded me, actually, I'll tell you a story about another police officer that come in. Um, so I've met them. I've gone down, first couple of days, I've gone down onto the server. You had to go down all the way, down the falls, little server at the bottom, which they show in the documentary. You you would go in there, the prison officers would watch you walk in. Three lads stood behind the servery, dishing out your meals for the day, your drinks and whatever. Um, and one of the lads has said, I am mate, you're, you're Lee, aren't you? And I said, yeah. Thinking, fucking hell, this news travels fast. Oh, you're all right, uh, you're all right, I'll come and see you in a minute. Um, so a lad come to see me just after servery had finished. I'd gone down onto the ones. Um, if you're out there, Ryan, hope you're all right, mate. Um, he'd come and said, look, I know you're an ex-prison officer. He said, I said, right. He said, I'm an ex-prison officer. I said, right. <laughs> you're right. And he went, yeah, you, you, he'd been in there at that point, I think maybe a, a year, six months. So he was into the, the tune of what was going on in there. He said, you'll be all right, just keep it under wraps. And he said, them three lads there? I said, yeah. And he went, they're all coppers. I've gone, what? No, they're not. No, they're not. And he went, yeah, they're all, he said, so just keep your head down and you, you'll be all right. So anyway, it transpired there were three policemen from Liverpool, like we've said on the story, but I presume we're gonna, that's going to be put in uh, regards to the policemen. People who watched um, the very beginning see that story. Yeah. Um, it's, what's interesting, this is all a function of drug laws again. Mm. If drugs were legal... You wouldn't have been in your position, and these cops wouldn't have been in that position. It, exactly, it feeds into it, doesn't it? It's yeah, a, it's a yeah. big cesspit. So yeah, it transpired the three policemen from Liverpool who were were in there. I think they were they were doing between four years and six years for what they had done. Um, again, going out to do drugs busts, drugs raids, uh, and re not returning the profits, drugs or cash. So they were they were six months into their sentence. So they were all I was new. But obviously that lad coming to speak to me saying, you know, you're an ex-prison officer. During the midst of my prison sentence in there, the year, one of the prisoners, you have what you call in prison um, a listener. Someone who people go to um, if they're struggling. It'll be another prisoner on prisoner. So if, you've, if you're doing a long sentence, they would engage prisoners to be listeners. So if somebody was struggling um, with prison life, you could go and speak to another prisoner. And no matter what time of night, if you say, I want to speak to a listener, an officer would generally go and put you in the listener's cell. Listeners would get privileges, like, you know, uh, extra gym, extra whatever. 
Um, I wasn't a listener. However, the prison officer, knowing my background, came to me one day and said, can you go and have a word with the lad in cell? I was a cleaner on the wing at that point. I mean, how fucked up is that, Sean? I used to have a cleaning party, and now I was, I was fucking mopping landings. And what a fine mop it was. Um, <laughs> so he said, can you go and have a word with the lad in, for instance, cell 10? And I've looked at him, and I said, why? And he went, please, can you just go and have a word with him? I th you know, I think he's struggling a bit. I said, right, okay. So I've walked past the cell, and I could, you know, it was a fairly diminutive kind of guy in there with his head in his hands on the desk. Uh, so I've gone in. I said, is everything all right, mate? I said, I'm, you know, I'm Lee the cleaner. Uh, if you need any mops, fucking whatever, toilet rolls, you come and see me. I'm in that cell down there. Is everything all right? Uh, yeah, I'm all right, mate. I'm just, just, yeah, I'm all right. And I'm thinking, can Ali, you seem a bit down. I said, well, what's going on, pal? And he said, are you, you Lee the ex-prison officer? I said, yeah. Why? And he went, I'm an ex-police officer. I said, right, okay, right. Uh, I said, well, I said, you'll be all right, mate, as long as you keep your, you know, yourself to yourself and don't go putting your head above the pit. And I said, what? And obviously I knew what these lads were in for, the other ones. I said, what's, uh, oh, why are you in here? What, what have you ended up in here like? He said, oh, I said, oh, I was just, uh. I said, go on, tell me what you've ended up in here for. What he was doing, <clears throat> he was a traffic cop. He was pulling over young girls, shall we say, attractive young girls, uh, suggesting that they had something wrong with their car. I mean, this is dressing it up. Suggesting they had something wrong with their car, um, going round telling them that he was going to arrest them um, if, if they didn't pay him in kind and the, the, uh, the crime would go away as such if they give him favours. You'd watch that movie, what was it? The Bad Lieutenant, I don't Har know. Harvey Keitel. I don't know, I've not seen it. He like he's pulling them over, like, and he's Is getting it? his getting his thing out and he's like this, like talking to him, like he's all coked off. These girls are getting pulled up thinking they've got a light out, and all he's wanting is his little man sucking. Oh my god. So yeah, so that I think he'd ended up I think they deemed it pretty much as like almost like rape, sexual assault. Yeah, really. it, that's a whole yeah. new level, isn't it? It's not yeah. drugs, it's sex offence. So yeah. he would be classified more harshly. So he, because he was harsh, I think he ended up getting a five or a six, and I think he had to go to a specialist unit, uh, and I mean a specialist unit for sex offenders. the prisoners would do him. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, that was another one I forgot about him, actually. Wow. Um, yeah. So there we go. So we moved on to Subri. And as I said, you know, the story with, you know, the copper in there, um, you know, which we've heard at the start of this. So he gets put up the wing from you. You get split from him at that point, don't you, Subri? In Sudbury, no, what well, the copper who followed me, yeah, no, he came into my cell, didn't he? He come with me, but didn't he end up getting his own cell? That was in Kurt Levington. Oh, I've jumped yeah, yeah, to yeah. Kurt Levington, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah sorry. no, that was Kurt Levington, yeah. So, um, Sudbury, what other incidents or high points or low points were happened in Sudbury then that we've not covered? I think. Do you know what? Not a lot happened. The, the thing what struck me about Sudbury is when you've been enclosed for a year. You know, I'm talking enclosures in a really dark, old, dingy building. What surprised me at Sudbury was the openness of it. So, therefore, the maybe the risk of violence. At any one point, anybody could have absconded. Now, at any one point, somebody could be rushed into a cell and fucking no one would know about it. For the next two or three hours, you, you've got screws coming around doing checks at dinner time, in the morning. You could be left in a cell for two or three hours, mate, like I've described to you, them two lads who come in to see me. So it is, um, you really have got to have your wits about you in there and you really do keep your mouth shut. Certainly for me, for my job, I got on very well with the lads again on the wing. As I've said, they looked out for me. Played football in the football team there. They've got a team that play games on the pitch at weekends. So, you know, at one point I'd looked across the defence. I was passing to a double murderer. You know, I'm passing a ball over from left back to right back. A lad who... It was an armed robber, prolific armed robber, and like I say, two, a double murderer and a, a fucking a, a very violent man. And I'm thinking, this is fucked up. I'm playing football with these lads, but they're just lads. Exactly. You know, they're just lads that have... You realise that everybody's human. Yeah. And some people make mistakes and it, it shouldn't define them for the rest of their lives. Of course. I mean, who We're am all I just to a few here? mistakes away from going to prison, aren't we? I mean, listen to my story. I'm, I've got four years in prison. I'm, I'm a criminal. 
But yeah, look at the story that I've had. We're only ever one stupid fuck up, and it doesn't matter what it is. Um, they're just lads. And I've always found in prison, as on the street, if you're respectful to a certain degree, you're going to get respect back, um, and you don't go messing people about. And it kind of it stood me in good stead, mate. And it also stood me in good stead. They knew that I'd never put names in. Uh, I've had coppers coming round to my mum's house, CID, saying they were trying to scare the shit out of my family, saying um, your house is at risk because of what he's done. Um, I've come into my mum's house. There's, some, there's a guy sat there with a cup of tea, and he said, I'm such and such from CID. And I went, right. And he said, you do know you're a, a, a big risk at the moment and your properties are at risk. I said, no, they're not. They know they're not at risk because if they were at risk, I'd have known about it from now. And I also knew that I hadn't had anybody off, Sean. I hadn't told on anyone. I hadn't had anybody off. So he was. I just said, look, with all due respect, mate, I suggest you leave. I'm not interested. So Sudbury then <coughs> is... Um... No, nothing too much other than what you've already told us happened. Yeah, as I say, we got Kai Bosch, really. I mean, I, I didn't have much Kirk time to bed Levington. in there. Kirk Levington. Yeah. Where the yeah. hell's that? Uh, near Middlesbrough. Oh, near Middlesbrough. Yeah. So they put you back up the country. Back up the country. Again, they wouldn't even <laughs> entertain putting me... Because now, it, they their excuse was, well, you know, a whole prison system knows now that you've stopped a copper, you know, from getting dotted, so you now are at risk. It was bullshit, but yeah. maybe I'm being naive, mate. I don't know. How was it in Kirk <coughs> Levington then? It was, apart from the staff, like I've spoke about earlier on, yeah. apart from the staff, it was a very, it was dead man's sentence, mate. There was nothing mm. there for me. Mm. I couldn't go out to do anything. I'd lost the college course. It was just pretty much sat in a room for, for the last four or five months of my sentence. I didn't. I stopped at that point, my family coming to see me, because mm. I, I couldn't justify having people travel two, three hours. You know, my parents were young. You know, my friends were, they had kids. I, I don't want them driving three hours to see me to go and have a coffee in fucking McDonald's in Middlesbrough. Mm. I couldn't put them through it, so I stopped people coming to see me and just said, look, I'll see you when I get a home visit, you know, and I'll try and spend a bit of time with you then. But I think it was just gearing myself for getting out. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was pretty much seen, seen off. So you had your town visits then and then employment after sentences for prisoners. This is the big, when I come out of prison... I was thinking about this on the car on the way down. If trying to get this out the right way without sounding stupid. <laughs> so if you're engulfed in a, in a life of crime as a youngster or as a person, whether it be through family, friends, you, are, you will see that destruction around you. So you will see maybe a parent, a brother go into prison. You will maybe see things that you don't want to see. You automatically, what I'm trying to get to here, how am I trying to get to? What I'm trying to say is, for me, falling off that ladder of being a law-abiding citizen to finding myself where I'm going to find myself in a minute was a massive fall off a ladder. If a lad gets sent to prison who's involved in criminal activity, I would guess that he would probably expect at some point he's going to get sent to prison. So I, in my mind, think that he's maybe fallen two or three rungs down the ladder. Still devastating for the family, the impact. But for me, I couldn't get to grips with from where I was to where I was. Does that come across? Do you know what I'm trying to say with that or not? You cannot reconcile in your mind mm. the, the like, um, seismic shifts that have occurred that have put you where you, you were. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's a lot of time to adapt to your charges and your incarceration. Yeah. And it was five, six years before I got out. If I had got after two years, I think I was still in shock for the first year or so. Would you? And because I was fighting my case for 26 months... Once you sentence, there's a whole new level of adaptation after that. Yeah. So you've done two years. You've gone through the shock of being, you know, all this stuff happening. So your mind must be pretty, pretty scattered still. Scattered, mate. And I think yeah. it was. I thought I would come out naively. I thought I'd come out and I'd just get a job and I'd crack on. Mm. I, 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 I truly believe the hardest part of my sentence was not in jail. Bail was tough, but I think coming out of prison, the first, I remember one of the coppers rung me. Nice lad. He rung me and he said, when I first got out, he'd been out six months previous. He rung me and he said, Lee, if you need to ring me, ring me. It, it, you're going to have, you're going to have a, a high as such and then you're going you're gonna to feel it. And I thought, why are you telling me that? I'm, I've been fucking released. I'm fucking out. I'm back in the world, you know. Everybody can fuck off. I'm back. 
I was wrong, mate. I'd, I'd lived on, I'd, I did all the going out stuff again and getting back into life, going out on a Saturday, back into being a piss head, playing football. Because under, underneath, I hadn't dealt with what was going on. I'd got through a period, through a brave face, and there's a lot of stuff that I've told you there that looking back on it now, it, underneath, that would have been some fairly hefty traumatic stuff from a lad who's just, who lives on a fucking street who played football. So I didn't know what was going on inside, but what was happening was, again, I started doing the masking thing, the drinking. Self-medication. Got back into self medic back into cocaine, back into party. Before we get to this bit though, of the story, what was yeah. your actual release like, the day of your release? It was... <sighs> there was tears in the car on the way back. My old man picked me up. My mum and dad picked me up. There was so, tears. So, so, right, you know your day of release, do you? Yeah, you inside? know, yeah, you do, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, you've got all this property, are you like... Saying goodbye to people in prison, are you giving them your property? Yep, you give it out anything that you can give out. Um, I give out to lads on the billet. Um, you know your release date, so I'd already started to do that, giving away clothes. and Because you want to separate, in my mind, I don't want anything coming out of this jail that will ever remind me of this shit ever again, whether it doesn't matter what it is. So I'd started to distribute everything to people. You say your bye-byes, you get a few numbers. Listen, when you're leaving jail, it's like when you go on holiday, you want to keep in contact with everyone. It's fucking bollocks. Did you yeah. have a post-release plan? No, not really. They, they, they couldn't offer me anything, Sean, because there is a void for someone like me. How do I say it again? Lads who have not had opportunities that, I had, that I've had would be given opportunities. What do you offer me that... I don't want to sound like a twat when I say it, but what, what are you going to offer me? What can you give me? You're not going to read, you're not going to... Because you wasn't disadvantaged. I wasn't disadvantaged. I was from a, a working class uh, background. Seemingly, I was all right. Seemingly, I had opportunity. I had a family. I had support around me, which they would have probably noticed. So they've probably thought, this lad's going to go on. He'll get out and he'll fuck off and he'll, he'll get back on the ladder. It, it wasn't that way at all. I, I couldn't deal with it. Take us through the moment of the staff coming to release you. <sighs> Well, you, you actually walk yourself to the reception. How do you so, know to go there at that point? Well, on the morning comes, so I'd been up from, say, six that morning. You know, fucking hell, let me out, let me out. So you go up to the reception two or three times. Right, can I go now? Because my mum and dad, I've told my mum and dad to be in the area from seven o'clock onwards because that's an unlock. No, you've got to wait till 10 or 11. So I kept going back to the reception. Can I go now? Can I go now? No, fuck off. We'll let you know when you can go. Right, okay, so a screw comes to get you through the door, reception want to see you, you're off out of the billet like a shot, straight up there, <laughs> and you have to do a bit of paperwork on release, you have to go, you sign on to a compact to say, I will attend probation this afternoon, they want to see you on your day of release. What for? I've no idea, because you've been living in open conditions, but it's just another hook that probation have got on you. I want to see you this afternoon. Right, all right, fine. So then they sign off, you get a, a travel warrant, a release warrant of 77 quid. Now, if you think, as again, like I've said, I had a lot of support and backup through family. I had somewhere to technically go and live. I stayed with my mum. If I was a lad who didn't have anywhere to live, didn't have any family, didn't have anything going for him, as in support, how far is 77 quid going to get you? In America, it's $50. Gate money. <laughs> have a nice day. Have a nice day. <laughs> By the way, when you run out of money at six o'clock, what's this lad going to turn back to if... He crime. can't crime. Come on, brings exactly. them right back. Oh. As soon as they come back, sixty thousand dollars of taxpayers' money. Purpose, <laughs> exactly. Our point. Client initially. for life. Client for life. Yeah, client yeah. for life. Holiday and like I said, the holiday inn needs its rooms filled. <laughs> and who, who's more vulnerable than someone who's just left jail because they <coughs> they don't know where they're going to stay. They don't know how they're going to feed themselves. They're scared. Uh, they're apprehensive. Only thing they know is crime. What the fuck are they going to do? What does a dog do? Just returns to the place where he last got fed. Crime. So the staff um, that you're interacting with as you're getting released, mm. are they being nice to you now? Yeah, generally, yeah. It was the two big fellas, they were reception staff, they said, just make sure you don't come back, look after yourself. And it was just, it wasn't so much handshakes and fist pumps, but it was, thank you, gentlemen, see you later. Did you have, like, prisoners you'd actually really bonded with who you thought, like, I'm going to miss these guys, blah, yeah, blah, blah? We do, becomes, it's it's like a pack mentality, isn't it? You, yeah. know, you, be, you do become accustomed to it and you do... You know, they, they've been technically your brothers and your family for the last two years. Mm -hmm. And if you've been in a jail for a length of period, you know, for a length of time like the first year, 
you do become friends. And I, I do keep in contact with people now, and it's like 10 years later. So you do, you do make friends. Um, what you do with that, if you're involved in crime, it can also be a nice breeding ground for, yeah. you know, external activity. But What clothes are you wearing for your release? The release, I think I'd, I'd got a pair of jeans from a charity shop. Um, I was doing some charity work out at a charity shop and they were like, I think they were like DK and Y jeans or whatever. <laughs> so I'd put them on a uh, polo shirt, aftershave, you know, just to make yourself feel. Yeah. Because that's the thing in there, isn't it? You lose all things like haircuts, mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Things like that. You, you lose all the, the niceties in life. Yeah. You yeah. really are stripped back bare, which in some ways is good. You go into survival mode. All you're worried about is food, cleaning yourself and sleep and safety, mm -hmm. you know, the, all, the very four simple things in life. So when you put a little bit of aftershave <laughs> on and a fucking nice polo top, you think, wow. It is just raw animalistic survival, isn't it? <laughs> it it mm. fucking is. Yeah, it, yeah. And even, you know, someone messaged me the other night on YouTube, mm. you know, what did you eat in prison? Well, I don't know how I've got through it, but I've lived two years on noodles, tuna, and cooking hot dogs in kettles. I lived off stolen cheese from the kitchen from yep. a cartel guy mexican cartel guy and um <laughs> peanut butter peanut butter on toast i mean it, to staple foods because you don't touch even in uk prisons the, the meals are not good they were cutting back all the time so what you think is a meat dish it put me every off, day it, I my little kid sized milk and my peanut butter and the day i got back to my parents house in witness yeah. and we, we went to the asda or wherever <laughs> I got the peanut butter and milk, mm. took them back to my house, tried them, Condition. and almost threw up. Honestly, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't touch couldn't do it. it. To this day, I cannot drink milk, but I did. It took me about five or six yeah. years for me to go back to eating like peanut butter. All right. So the flip side of this for me is, I used to have a dish in there. I used to put noodles in a bowl. Mm. I used to put a chicken soup, cup of soup, in with them because you could buy cup of soups off the canteen yeah. to make it thicker. I used to boil hot dogs in the kettle, chop them up and put it in for a meal. <laughs> Fucked up this, innit? The other one I used to do was noodles, tuna and Encona hot sauce. Mm. I had it last week. I still eat it now. My <laughs> mind is conditioned to make that meal. It's fucking weird. It really is weird. Some things stay with you for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. So if, if if prison's taught me anything, it's it's how to feed myself. On All the right. Bed. So so you, you how long is it you're waiting around in the prison before they release you? Uh, I think I was sat at reception for maybe half an hour. Oh, it's not bad. It's not bad. I mean, it, it was quite a pleasant release in that sense. I mean, my mum and dad were waiting down the road. And were um, they all crying and stuff? Yeah, yeah. It, it was emotional stuff. Yeah. Uh, I drove down into the little town, got a brew, and obviously I had tears in my eyes back in the back Weber of the car. <laughs> back to yeah, Back to Weber Spoons. Um, so I'm sat in the car then. Then I think you think, there's part of you that thinks, I can't wait, because I had a two and a half hour, three hour journey home. There's a lot of thinking time. Again, all thinking time thinking fucking hell what I'm going to do when I get back right I'll go here I'll go there I'll go and see him I'll go that you're exhausted mate your head's fucked all I did when I got home I just went straight to bed Yeah. now some people would say oh I'd be going around to your mates get partying doing whatever I just wanted to lay down how weird I wanted to lay down in a room on my own mm. the same room that I craved all throughout my prison sentence I got straight back to my room and just laid down and I think I was knackered. Even even for, it went on for a few days. That it was almost like a like a shock. Mm. You know, a lot of relation, a lot of uh, emotions, and then I started to kind of get back into life. And the noise, you know, like there's the constant noise in prison. Yeah, wasn't it weird then to be in like a bedroom? Because I went back to my parents' house where I grew up as a kid, and the, you know the quiet and and the no noise and, and the calm. Yeah, the calm's is a weird thing because you're yeah. for two. It's a very hypercharged atmosphere, is prison. So that so the adrenaline is always there, always going. So when you get to a calm environment, it's also like your body's thinking. It's it's in shock because it's thinking, well, where's all this adrenaline gone now? Yeah. So yeah. it's 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 a tough one to negate around. You have to readjust. It is, and it, I mean, I'm not talking like sat here like I've done some whopping sentence. You know, you've mm. done yours. I'm talking only two years. Mm. But two years is two years of intensity. Yeah. Yeah, it is, mate. So, things don't go so well for you to the point where you get in a very bad state. What led up to that then? What was... So, I've described to you, I struggled to... The town I lived in, everybody knew me. By this point, everybody had knew, known what had gone on. This is Lancaster, is Lancaster. it? Lancaster. So, I was applying for jobs coming out. 
Now, I've never not got a job in my life leading up to that regards. I was all right at interviews. I had a reasonable skill set. And I'd never not got a job. I was going for jobs, Sean. The interview would go fantastically well, and I'd recognise someone on the way out working for a company, and all of a sudden it'd come back, you've been unlucky this time. Now, again, that's there's a bit of paranoia involved in that, but I'll tell you some stories. I would know this was what was going on. Mm. So I've applied. I mean, this had gone on three or four times. I couldn't get back on the job ladder. I didn't know what I wanted to do. I knew that I needed to do something, so I enrolled again on the electrical course, which I lost out on in Sudbury due to the copper. So I enrolled on that again. So at night time, I'd be working in the bars, you know, just to earn a few pennies to get by. Um, and then I finished the electrical course and someone said, why don't you go and work for BT, you know, as an engineer? So I thought, yeah, you know what, it's not a bad shout. BT are all over the shop, big national company. I needed to make up time in my career at that point. So I thought I need to get into somewhere and make, make headway quick. So I started, I went to the job centre, and I had to sign on at that point as well because I was working less than however many hours a week. You get a little sub. And so I had to cancel that. They gave me the number for BT and said Manpower are taking on. Now, Manpower are an agent that BT use um, so they can basically fuck people off. They're an agency. If you do well with Manpower, you will get a full-time BT contract. They said, we're not taking on for engineers at the moment. We're taking on for staff in the call centre. I'm thinking, I think at that point, mate, a job was a job. I just needed money. I needed somewhere to go. Mm. I needed a focus because that had started to become a problem again, as mm. to the drugs did, the cocaine. So I was in a bad place. So I thought anything at the moment, I'll take with both hands. No airs, no graces. I am what I am. So I went to do the interview with them. They said, fantastic. On the form, do you have any unspent convictions? Honest on the form. Yes. All right. Okay. No problem. What was it? Yep. All right, okay. The job centre knew. The beat manpower knew. And I had to do a final form for BT. They knew. I've done six weeks training in a classroom environment for them on sales techniques, all that. Going onto the phone, selling BT services, internet, broadband, all that stuff. Six weeks has passed. I've come through the training with flying colours. Gone on to what they call live on the shop floor, answering the phones, talking to customers. The first week I've sold the most that anyone from a new recruit course has ever sold. The first week. Wow. So I'm now thinking, fucking, I'm back. You know, I'm back in life. Uh, I can, I've proven myself and I'm happy, really happy. Mon listen, Monday morning. Hi, Lee, can I have a word? Yeah, what's up? It was the woman who worked for Manpower, the manager. She said, uh, can you come and have a word, please, with, with Andy? She said, I'm, I'm really sorry, but we've made a mistake. I said, what do you mean a mistake? She said, our head office have been in touch. We're not technically allowed to employ anyone who has got an unspent conviction. I said, and a fucking rage went at that point. I said, are you taking the piss? I have disclosed this three times throughout a two, three month period on forms for you now to, and she went, I, she was pretty much in tears. She said, I can't do anything about it. I'm really sorry. And it was a case of, right, off you pop. So I've, I've invested Eight weeks of my life, I've sold the most that anyone's ever sold from a new recruit course, so I could clearly do a job. But then, you know, the computer says no, they've made an error, and you released. Because I was on a temp contract, Sean, get out on that street, and you're back in again. My mind at that point, like I said, I was doing a lot of that. What do you do? Straight into Weatherspoons, fucking angry, pissed. That went on and on and on. A few more examples from that. Fast forward a couple of years. This one is a real ass kick up this. I wasn't doing myself any favours, mate. By that point, the doctors were medicating me, the antidepressants. I was self-medicating. Uh, I was not engaging with the world. I fucked everyone off because I was having to ask people for money to pay for my addictions. Uh, I was unreliable. I was dishonest. All the classic, you know, um, traits of, a, of an addict person going through whatever. <clears throat> so I'd managed to get an interview at, now bear in mind I had an electrical background at that point, I'd done a bit on site, struggling to get a proper job as an electrician because unless you've got experience, certainly with people knowing my background and thinking why is this kid starting this late on in life, people do the Google, fucking straight away, mugshot comes up. No, I mean it is, people do discriminate and whether it's right or whether it's wrong, it's natural for a human 
to discriminate. We try not to because it's not the right thing to do, but we do it down the street, don't we? You know, if you see someone, you have a picture in your mind, oh, he looks like he's in the army, he looks like a copper. It's just instinct. It's not the right way to do it. But So I, at that point, like I said, was struggling, mate. Um, I couldn't get proper work on an electrical site. Local companies wouldn't go near me. Maybe they knew that I was struggling with that. Maybe they, they obviously knew my background. And I just couldn't find any way into life again. And all this negativity I was feeding my paranoia, was feeding my addiction, was feeding my woe is me kind of victim mentality. And once you get in that cycle, it's, it's deadly. Um, so I think at that point, I pretty much fucking had enough, pal. Um, I saw no way back from us. In fact, remind me about the job again in a minute because that comes after what we're going to talk about now. I would saw no way back for me in my life, community-wise. I'd isolated all my friends. I'd isolated. I'd disappointed my family on numerous occasions. I'd disappointed myself. Um, I was heavily involved in drugs, alcohol, and I thought, I've done it legitimately. I've told everyone about my conviction. I still can't get back. I just thought there's no route for me anymore. I've had enough. Uh, and when I say by had enough, I mean one night, I'd, I think a couple of days, throughout the day, I'd had a couple of bottles of brandy, a fuckload of cocaine, um, prescription pills. And that night, obviously I was heavily under the influence. Um, that night I thought, right, this is it, I've had enough. And just nailed everything in sight in the cupboard. Um, so that... Obviously, that's it's not, it's not a nice thing for people to listen to, but I think the point that I'm trying to make with that is that initial fucking 400 quid through my own doing has led me to what we're going to get onto now through thinking that's enough. So the point being here is the quick book and the stupid decision has led a trail of destruction that I participated in and continue to participate in because my head was up my ass. I didn't know who I was, didn't know what I was. So I've tried to obviously end myself. I took enough tablets to fucking knock an horse out. The next thing I know, I mean, how bad's this, mate? That's in my parents' house. So you can imagine the mental state. I mean, that's how selfish is that, the mental state. But I think when you get to that point, all morals have gone out of the window. I, I just thought I'd be better off if they, if I wasn't about anymore being the burden. So I've gone for it. The next thing I know, I kind of open my eyes and I'm slumped in the corner. I can see a paramedic or what I thought was a paramedic with a high-vis vest. Um, and she's saying, Lee, 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 um, are you all right? Are you all right? Come on, Lee, Lee. And she's fucking like round the face. They've put me into like a chair. I remember having loads of wires strapped to me in a chair, you know, heart monitors, this, that, and the other. And I couldn't, I couldn't speak, mate. I was fucked. And it was a girl that I used to work with. So in the ambulance, obviously blue light to the hospital, in the ambulance, she's saying, fucking hell, what have you done to yourself? Why are you doing this? Got into the hospital. Um, I, I don't remember much about the hospital, pal. I just remember thinking that I was fucking dancing on a bed. You know, my mind was obviously that twisted. I remember thinking that my feet were on fire. That's the last I remember of that night. I woke up in the morning. I've woke up, I looked at the end of the bed and I can see like a, the shape of a female at the end of the bed probably I'm thinking what the fucking hell is that and she's gone are you alright Lee and I've looked and it was a girl who I used to know from going out and drinking in town she just started a nurse training she'd apparently been sat there bless her thank you again I've, I've said it before but thank you Katie she'd sat there all night finished her shift and sat there all night to make sure I was alright mm. so I had someone sat with me because they wouldn't let my mum and dad in at that point because I was under a lot of assessment um, the morning after how fucked up is this Sean the morning after, I've, I've had my face down on the bed and all I can hear is, Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis. Fucking again, not like the cleaner, but Mr. Davis. And it was a doctor, I'm doctor, it was an old boy. He turned, I turned over like that and he went, what the hell is this? Is this a cry for help? I just fucking looked at him, well, the best I could. I said, what? He said, what is all this about? Is it a cry for help? Now, obviously, I've got no history of doing anything like that. It was a one-off shot and I intended to do it. There's no one more disappointed waking up that morning than me, trust me. He said that, and I've just turned around again, I said, just fuck off out of my face. Spent, must have spent another, I think probably another afternoon in hospital, got released. Um, the, the upshot of that is, mate, that the, the mental health side of things after it, non-existent. 
I got a phone call a week later, I think, to find out if I was getting on all right. Oh, sorry, in the first 24 hours, I got a phone call from the hospital. Now, if you're in that mental state, mate, and they say, are you going to harm yourself in the next 24 hours? I'm not going to fucking tell you, am I? Now, I know there's a protocol to fall, to sorry, to follow, but there was just nothing. It was non-existent. So again, I found myself in that void of nothing's changed. I wasn't what? helping myself because I didn't, I didn't know how to. What was your first interaction with your parents after the attempt? Um... Obviously, a lot of upset, a lot of tears. Where were they when they saw you for the first time? Uh, I I was picked up by my dad, not by my mum, and he took me home. And again, sim similar to the prison conversation, we sat in the front room. My mum was hysterical in tears. Um, my dad was just obviously crestfallen. Um, I'm there. I'm still that fucked up. I can't tell them what's going on. I'm just... I'm. I'm it's like being numb. You know, it's... I, Full Again, on, full on depression, full on de massive depression in the midst of it. Now, not only have I disappointed them doing what I was doing, I've now actually can't even fucking kill myself. You know, I can't even do that right. You've got that in your head, aren't you? And it's, it's not a nice place to be. And anybody who's going through it, please, I didn't speak to anyone. I am the world's worst at speaking to anyone, trying to open up about stuff. And for 10 years, it crucified me. Now I'm a lot better. How did you get break free of that mental prison? Do you know what, mate? It hasn't been until the last couple of years I've started to give myself a break. All, all, all this that's gone on is not anybody else having a go at me. It's not the world. It's me against me. It's me not giving myself a break. It's me seeing myself as an absolute shitbag. And it manifested itself in all these ways. And I've, I've pissed off that many people, disappointed, upset. And that's part of it. But until you say, now is the time, to break free, and I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna say it was a one day. I was still addicted to drugs and alcohol, but I started to just release myself from it. And I don't know how I did it, mate. There was no, I went to things like Narcotics Anonymous, I went to Alcoholics Anonymous. They weren't for me, but I started to explore the fact that no one else is gonna drag me out of this shit. The mental health system isn't, medication isn't. I just started to cross everything, started to cross it off. No one's helping me here, no one's coming for me. Least of all you know, the system. They don't give two fucks about you. So I think it was a realisation of just fucking growing a set and becoming a man and saying, I'm not helping myself. What what people were you surrounded by after you got released? So there's your parents. Yeah. Did you have siblings or your ex-girlfriend no, or did you have a new girlfriend? Bugger all, mate, as in I'd that relationship had gone by the wayside as I transitioned into, period, uh, into prison. Did you ever bump into her around town? Very, only three or four times. Was there a conversation? Nothing, absolutely nothing. nothing, because she'd then found out, obviously, what was going on. She'd got with a new fellow while I was in prison. Um, so, yeah, there was no interest from that. There was no reconcile there. And were you not interested in forming a new relationship? You were just too lost? I'd say too lost, mate. Too lost in every way. And I didn't have, dare I say it, I used to be quite a confident lad. Um, all that went. I didn't think it had gone, but it really had. I didn't want to approach people because I. you're always second-guessing. Meeting a girl, meeting a, a new lad in a bar, you know, for a bit, you say, you know, my name's Lee. And before you know it, mate, with social media, she's fucking added you on Instagram. She's got 10 common mates. She'll message one of them. I have just started seeing a new lad, Lee. Do you know he's been in prison four years? The alarm bells start to ring. It really is hard to come back when people know your story and when you're trying to hide it as well, mate. So there's a theory... I think it was Carl Jung, perhaps, um, mm. about our shadow side. Okay. How we all have a shadow side. Yeah. You said about, you know, being such a fuck up and all this. But actually, you're just a human who made mm. mistakes, and that's mm. what happens in life. We have challenges, and we all make mistakes. Yeah. But inside us, we do have like a, a, a dark... Um, a darkness, a dark energy yeah. that can lead to doing bad things. Of course. But once you're able to transform that dark energy into something positive into the world, you begin yeah. to heal. Yeah. Would you say that, did you recognise any of that? Uh, what, what I started to do, it's going to sound really weird. Um, I started to, I removed myself from all social things, football, drinking, at what I do, I'd find myself drinking at home, taking drugs at home. I went to, I actually saved a cat 
from two drug addicts. I know that it's fucking weird. This run it down. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, yeah, I saved it after I'd run it down. Yeah. How um, how how did this happen? Right. So there was a cat being um, abused. I actually did start seeing a girl, but it was very brief. Was how more, did you know the cat was being abused? It would used to come into the girl's garden, and she used to say, "Look, the people next door are not looking after him." And he had fucking hair missing. It looked like you know, scraggy cat. So I said, right, well, if you don't go around and tell them, I'll fucking go around and tell them. Because I'm, I'm an animal lover, mate. <laughs> I said, if you don't want to tell them, I'll fucking tell them. This had gone on for a few more weeks. And I said, right, bang, bang, bang on the door. Nothing. They won't come out to me because they knew what was going to go on. So I catnapped this cat. <laughs> fucked up. I'm, it sounds like some psychedelic story, this, doesn't it? But this, is, this was the, the road to redemption in the sense of I'd catnapped a cat and I'd taken it to an animal rescue centre. There's the cat. Fine, okay. They've got a cafe there. I've had a cup of tea. Volunteers wanted. Now, like I said, I was a lost soul at that point. Volunteers wanted. And she said to me, why don't you do that? You know, you're good with animals. You love animals. You, you know, you, you've got manual skills. You can help them. And I, th I thought, uh, anyway, this cat, this cat was on my mind. I used to go and visit it. It was in the fucking sanctuary. <laughs> <laughs> I used to... I used to go and visit it. I called it. They, they said, what's the cat called? I said, I've no idea. It's not my fucking cat. And they said, well, you're going to have to give it a name. I said, Sylvan. I don't know why Sylvan, the French cat, because it's black and white. So I've gone to see this cat two times, three times in the next week to make sure it was all right. So it's the seeds in my head. So I started volunteering at this animal sanctuary. So it gave me a, a kind of purpose again. Um, there was emotion. There was love. The community up there, mate, is fantastic, lovely people, older people who were not involved in crime, and it kind of gave me that way out to say, there is maybe another life. You're not ready for that yet because you're still involved in doing what you're doing, but there is another life. And I, st I actually engaged in it and started to do that. And that's probably the catalyst, to be fair, looking is, back on it. That is fascinating. So you said you cut off the social circles of the supplies of the alcohol and the cocaine. Yeah, because... And at the same time, you met someone, found out about the cat, and now you're channeling your energy into a positive thing. Yeah. And you've got a new social circle, and love is involved, whether it's love for a human or love for an animal. Yep. I mean, these are all really powerful things. It sounds like a simple story, but they're very powerful things psychologically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So when you've been, like we've said, prison, stripped back to... Being who you are, survival, eating, you, there's no love or nothing. Two years, there's no love, there's no, you know, no one comes and gives you a cuddle. Just animalistic Just survival. Just fucking animalistic bullshit. So you turn off, subconsciously, you turn off that need or that part of your brain that says, I want to engage in, you know, whatever. So I think that was the first spark that showed me that I need to change direction. I need to do something else. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I'm not going to lie, we're still drinking still taking drugs at certain points, but it gave me the seed that thought, right, let's go. This is what I need to do. It's like, I'd like taking a horse to water, isn't it? Did your parents see the change in you at this point? Yeah, I think they did. I think they did. I mean, there's been mishaps in between. Um, you know, I've relapsed a few times. I mean, I've been talking a fair few years ago now. Um, so I started to try and engage more on that side of things. I then applied for a job at a local electrical firm who built electrical cabinets 20 miles from a house so this is going to be another job story showing you the difficulties of when you come out of prison so 20 miles from my house is a big firm that do electrical cabinets that you would send onto sites uh, again i've gone for an interview absolutely smashed it out of the park when can you start because i had all the right qualifications i had a bit of experience but it was based again i thought i'll get in somewhere get out so I've started there on a temporary contract three months. Things are going amazingly well. Three of us have started at the same time. Going about my business, doing really well, decent money. Again, ploughing into the positive direction. Uh, the manager, I've gone in one morning, the manager has said, I've said this on Neil's podcast, whenever I hear the words, Lee, can I have a word? I get an instant shiver down my spine. Lee, can I have a word a minute? I said, yeah, 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 what's up? Can you come in the office? And I thought, maybe he's going to offer me a contract. You know, because you do three months, then you get your contract. He went, he fucking literally shone, he went white. He said, please don't tell me it's true. And I said, what? And he said, and he showed like a, a clip of my thing in the paper. 
please don't tell me it's true. And I said, he said, is it unspent? And I said, yeah. And he said, is it on your form? And I said, nope. Because, because of what had happened at BT, I thought, you know what, I'll try and be a clever bastard now and get away with it and not disclose it on a form. The job centre told me to do that. Do well, no, they, they, they sent me to telly sales interviews, I disclosed it. They said, you've got to stop disclosing it. If you want to get a job, otherwise you're never going to get a job. <laughs> what the fuck is that about? So how, how do we expect people to, you know, if you're up against that, that's just another barrier, isn't it? Yeah. So again, what does that lead? Someone who's of a, who hasn't got the support, if they're now getting these answers, what's the easiest way to make a book? Fucking crime. What does that fill the void? Go right so, back to the lifestyle. Right back to the lifestyle. So he said, I said, how, how has this come about? And he went, I, you know, I can't disclose this. He said, but I'm going to have to let you go. So I'm now, this. I tell you when it happened, Sean, on my birthday, 6th of December. So I'm now in fucking 20 miles away from my house. I get a lift off a lad to work. I'm stranded in a little village. Yet again, the anger, the fucking rage. Mm. And I'm raging now. I'm thinking, what do I have to do? Mm. Gone into the Weatherspoons. It was my birthday anyway. I'd sunk about six or seven pints, run my dad. He said, happy birthday. How are you getting on, son? I said, you want the truth? Just lost my job. And he was like, what? I'm in Bolton. Where are you at? I said, I'm in Kendall. I'm in Bolton now. I'll come and get you. He'd come up to get me. I fucking... It, the, they're not tears of sadness now, mate. It was tears of anger. Gone home that night. One of the lads has rung me, said, don't worry about it. I'm going to find out how it's happened. You know, I was quite pally with the lad up there. Two or three days later, he's come round to see me, said, I know how it's, I know how it's happened. He said, do you know uh, someone called Officer whatever? I said, yeah. He said, did he used to work on your prison wing I said yeah and he said his son works at that factory his son has recognised me working there what a little shit house trick this is but each to your own mate his son's recognised me he's gone home to his dad and said is that the lad who nearly got you arrested dad unbeknownst to me when I got nabbed for doing what I'm doing Sean they pulled four other officers in for questioning but I didn't know this so he's gone is that him and I've gone, he's gone, yeah. So he's run to the bosses in the morning and said, do you know you're employing a criminal? It's an unspent conviction. So they've had to investigate it. That's how it's come about. So again, mm. that was about seven or eight years. It's following you. The trail of shit is following you. It's tough. Again, don't commit the crime in the first place. So what year was that? I'm going to say 2017, 18-ish, okay. around that period. How did you rebound from that? Uh, I got a job working. I was actually at the time, I applied for a job out of probably about another 20 miles from my house. They were construction based, working all over the UK. I applied for the job again. Again, I didn't disclose it initially. So I've not learned a lesson ever, but I've just, I've, I hate the world at that point, Sean, and I think it's trying to have me off. So I'm trying to be a, a clever bastard again. They've invited me for an interview. I've got it. Really impressed with what I've got to say. Um, she's then said, don't worry about the application form. We'll fill it in when you come in. Right. On the Monday morning, I get a thing through, um, request for CRB check, and I thought, oh, fucking hell. CRB check for overseas audience is a security background check. Some jobs, quite a lot of companies these days, require you to have a check in place. So she sent me the paperwork through for a check. Now, obviously, my arse has fallen out. So I've rung her and I've said, I've just got your form through. It says about a conviction. I just want to be honest with you. I have got a conviction. Uh, it's not spent. So I got the opportunity to come clean then, and I did. And she said, right, okay, you're going to have to leave this with me because we've not come up against this before. So obviously I thought, well, that's the end of that then. So I've gone home then, just waited for another day or two. Nothing's come back. I've just emailed her and said, I, is any, do we have any news? And she said, we've just contacted a few of our major clients to see if they've got a problem with it. The construction industry, Sean, to be fair, is quite good. There's a lot of lads who've been involved in, you know, activities and whatnot that are now working in construction and on site. So it isn't a big, it's just best that you're honest. So she's gone to, to their leading customers and they've said, yeah, no, that's fine, as long as you've disclosed it, as long as you're upfront about it, and as long as you guys basically take the responsibility should anything happen, I mean, not that it was going to. So, yeah, I got a job for them, mate, working all over the UK, staying away Monday to Friday, you know, with some decent lads. I even got the chance to go and work in Dublin uh, on a big uh, football arena there. So things started to fall into place. 
bit of purpose. For once in my life, I was upfront about the crime. People knew about my crime and I didn't have anything to worry about employment-wise or where my next meal was coming from. So I think it started to, good things started to happen. Um, and then, unfortunately, family have, have not been too well, maybe a year or two back. So I thought maybe from working away all the time, I need to be locally. So I started working for a local firm who have been phenomenal, mate. They've been really supportive. Um, even to the point of, I'll give you another employment story. I've worked for them now for for a couple of years. Um, they know everything. Everything's up front. Um, electrical work. We do a lot of work at a local university. Um, and at that local university is a lot of ex-prison officers. Because prison officers now are leaving HMP and thinking, fuck that. They're now getting jobs in security and universities, shops, arcades, whatever. That's a natural flow for a prison officer. So... We do a lot of work at this university. There's a lot of ex-prison staff. My work have called me in. Lee, can we have a word? This was uh, two and a half months ago. So we're now in 2000. We're now 13 years on from my crime. And I'm two months ago still getting a call to come into the office. Lee, can we have a word, please? Right, it's been met apparent that you've done... a. This was with Sam. He said, we've seen some videos on YouTube. I said, right, okay thinking, well, I know what they are. And they said, um, obviously, Lancaster University have contacted us because you work up at the uni. Someone has gone to them in the staff and said, do you know there's a criminal on site? Mm -hmm. Thankfully, my work are brilliant. Um, they were like, yep, he's fully checked. Everything is all above board. Um, he's worked for us for two years. All the checks are in place. But yeah, so still dealing with that shit now. You've just got to, you, you can't let it get to you, mate, because, and again, I'm lucky because I'm working. I'm lucky because I've had support. I'm lucky because I've had a decent education to get myself back to where I am. My my point here is that if lads haven't had that, again, what you spoke about, it's feeding into that shit again, mate. How is lads ever supposed to break free? What made you want to just start telling your story? It was, I'd, I'd actually started, I'd watched, I think Sam on James English's podcast. Now, obviously, Sam being ex-job, I was quite intrigued by his story, and I actually think I'd read his book before I knew who he was. Um, and I'd watched him on there, and I'd watched... When did you do yours with him? The first one must have been about two or three years yeah. ago, and the second one with Wild Man yep. yeah, must, yeah, yeah. must have Bless been him. about a year and a half ago. Right. Yeah. So it started from him, and it sold the seed, and I thought, People were always telling me, Lee, you need to get... Like I said, I'm a bottler. This has eaten away at me for years, Sean, to my detriment, to other people's detriment. I'd got in contact with Sam. I'd added him on Instagram. Um, and I'd watched his with you, his with him. I'd then seen, like, Billy Moores, and I thought... Ugh. Sam, apparently, he, he said he knew roughly who I was, but he didn't labour it in the comments. I used to have a bit of chat with him on Instagram. Um, he then said, how do you feel about coming on? He said, I've started my own podcast. How do you feel about coming on? And it was just that. It was a, a spare of the moment thing, mate. And do you know what? It was probably one of the, in fact, it's one of the best things I've ever done to actually start speaking about it. I don't have to walk around a street corner now and worry about, does he know me? Does she know the crime? Do, when, when, in a relationship, when do you tell someone? Like, do you bowl in with it in a bar straight away? By the way, love, um, I've done four years in prison for fucking drug smuggling. Um, da, 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 da. I'm a fucking cocaine addict. I'm an alcoholic. When in a relationship do you get to that point where you don't become a cross a maniac? I didn't, I didn't tell anyone for a long time. It's the, A funny thing happened the other day. Um, so let's say I went on some dates when I go out of prison. <laughs> this is back when I was living in my parents' house. And um, I took a woman to... Watch the mechanical spider that was running around the field. There's this giant mechanical yeah, spider. Yeah, I remember, yeah. <laughs> I got an email the other day. <laughs> she said, she said, do you remember me? You took me on a date. Um, we watched the mechanical spider. <laughs> I think there's a few gaps in your life that you didn't tell me about. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Congratulations on your success, blah, blah, blah. Fucking brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Because I was, you know, I, I'm thinking... People are going to cross the road. I've been in prison. They're, they're, they're going to be like, they don't want to go near this guy. Yeah. I won't be able to get a girlfriend. Yeah. I was so stressed out. Mental torture, isn't it? Yeah. Because you, all, yeah. a lot of it is guilt-driven, isn't it? You yeah. think, an embarrassment. 
yeah, especially yeah. in a small place as well. So yeah, it's a, especially it's a, if, you, if they can just Google your name and find it like that, it's all, it's all over, isn't it? Fucking like I said, Instagram. If, you, yeah. if I meet a girl this afternoon, she's got ten mates who know it, who know me. Yeah. One of them I might have slept with ten years ago who hasn't got a great report on you. Yeah. All of a sudden, he's a fucking drug dealer. He's an addict, and you think well, that's thirteen years ago. Yeah, it's yeah. It, it's a tough one, mate, and that is mm. it's hard for people. Yeah, it really yeah. is. But you've got to get back on that horse, haven't you? So you went on. Sam's podcast then yeah. and what was it like then um to go in and tell your story for the first time did you come out thinking a weight had been lifted not off the first one so really? me and Sam met we'd spoke on the phone uh we don't we didn't know each other other than the social media so we'd had an odd chat on the phone nothing story related I just he got the basic guts of what I was about he come up to my town to meet me uh, in his in his camper van, um, so obviously meeting him for the first time, there was apprehension because I'm second guessing. What does this guy think of me? Does he think I'm a corrupt bastard, or does he understand that I might have got involved in something that I shouldn't have done? You, you're playing tennis straight away, aren't you? Trying to well, he's very open, isn't he? He's very yeah, he like loud and um, yeah. He's got a, quite a personality, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. There's a big aura yeah. about him, so yeah, that he kind of yeah. got me about that first, and I thought. He said, right, well, where are we going to do this? And I said, well, right, well, if we drive out of town 10 minutes, I knew a little place, like a little football pitch that we could just sit and do it. Fuck me, mate. It was, I mean, I'd been up early that morning wondering, had I done the right thing? Wondering, what shall I say? What shall I not say? Do I really be honest or do I just give people what they want to know? I was questioning myself. There was torture going on of why are you doing it? Why have you done this? Are you doing it because your ego needs filling because you need a like? You know, that. I got into the chat with him and it was very, very, very intense, the first one. Um, first time I'd ever come out with it. So there was a lot of embarrassment from my side. There was a lot of, there was nervous energy in there. We did, I think the first one lasted about two hours. And even he said at the end of it, he said, fucking hell, my head's hurting. He's like, he was like, listen, we need to go for a walk. He said, this is intense shit, it, my head's hurting. Um, so we went for a walk around the local park and we kind of left it at that. And he said, right, well, we're going to do, obviously we only got to, I think, me getting to prison at that point. It was gone very much on how it happened. Um, so we've come back and we've met, we've done a part two, uh, met him at Bolton uh, on the retail park. Much more, I wouldn't say much more relaxed, more relaxed on the first one. We did a part three and part four. And by then we'd kind of built up a rapport. Part three and part four were, were just like, you know, just a chat. Um, but yeah, at first, mate, it was fucking hard. What about reading the comments? How did that affect you? Comments, mate. Uh, I, because of what I've told you, I thought the public would absolutely hammer the living shit out of me um, because of the offence. I remember logging on. I was working down in Liverpool at that point on the docks. And I told my mate who I worked with in the van, I said, that podcast going out today. And I looked in the afternoon and I think it, the, the mark, let's say it was out for an hour or so, it had like a thousand views or something like that. And there was comments coming underneath and I was working and I was kind of just kind of, it's addictive, isn't it? You look at it and you think, you fucking what? <laughs> so you have to reply, I, I, I bit at the first one. I was fucking biting back. Um, but if we look at the, if you ever get a chance to see him, mate, I'd say it's 96% positive. And for me as a person who struggled with my crime, who struggled with what I've done, for me, reading the comments from the public uh, and the support that I've had throughout all the podcasts with Sam, Billy's, and hopefully yours, um, it's it really has given me a wealth of confidence Good. To, to just be me again, to just say, look, put it in that box 10 years ago. You're not that man anymore. Get on with your life because people actually quite like you. Your temperament has changed from that first podcast you did with Sam. Yeah. Because I watched it. Yeah. You become more relaxed yeah. and... The way you tell your story, um, it, it, there's a really good structure to it. And yeah. man, we've sat here for four hours. I've been like on the edge of my seat, grip, just wondering what was going to happen. It's been next. brilliant, mate. I've looked, you know, I've I've loved it. Um, so for young people then tempted into these gang and drug lifestyles, what do you yeah. say to them? It's it's a very easy message. Like I've just mentioned, well mentioned before, if you listen to this story for the last four hours, four hundred quid of temptation pretty much nearly ended my life. It, it was, you know, it would have been an hour away from my life. Um, the hurt and destruction that I've caused people around me, the relationships that I've, well, severed 
you know, good pals, um, to which I'm now I've now been fortunate enough to try and rebuild some. It just really isn't worth that uh, that quick fix. Try and channel your you know your energy into something positive. I mentioned about the fire brigade and the prison service. I took the prison service on a whim. What I should have done is stuck to my guns and stuck to what I wanted to do. Um, and again, it don't matter what that is in your life, but just stick to your passion, stick to what you feel is right for you. Don't be swayed by a quick book or an unpromised dream, maybe. Have you thought about publishing a book? Just a couple of people have mentioned it, but I, I wouldn't know where to go with it, mate. I don't. Well, your story's so gripping. It's so relevant. And, you know, as a protagonist, um, people are really rooting for you. I'm sure as they've rooted for you all the way through this, rooting for you surviving in prison, rooting for you, yeah. your battle with your own demons. Um, it's It would make a really good book. I have a publishing company. I'd be happy to publish it. Yep. It's just, you know, getting getting it all written down. Um, yep. Four hours? A, a book is, an audio book is mm. nine hours. Okay. So you just wrote half your book today. Yeah, yeah, all yeah. And as I say, we've, we've really, <laughs> and even with it being four hours, we've kind of, yeah. you know, even I, you know, I can feel myself thinking, right, come on, get to the, there's plenty more to it, as yeah. I'm sure there yeah. is with yours. You um, just need to sit down and add all that plenty more to it to yeah. get a book out. Yeah, yeah, that might yeah. be a good shout out. Actually, People right? watching this, I'm sure some of them are going to be really moved and want to reach out to you. Yeah. Where, where can they support you on socials? Yeah, uh, Instagram. Um, I'm, you're going to put my Instagram. We'll put all your links yeah, down. Yeah, the links. Yeah. Email me. Listen, if you're struggling, if you just want to have a chat, um, if you want to call me a dickhead, don't bother. Um, but if you're struggling with anything and you just want somebody to vent to, I do speak to quite a lot of people from podcasts that I've done earlier. I'm more than happy, you know. Uh, I'm an open book in that sense. And if I can help you in any way, um, trust me, I will. Um, and the Instagram is Lee Pablo. Oh no, man! I, don't, yeah, it, I know the connotations for I that. I write a lot. Of, yeah. I've written a lot yeah. of books about Escobar. Oh, mate! It's it is that where that comes from? No, it isn't. No. It's, it's actually listen to this, and I've been hammered for it in the comments. Like, yeah. look at him; he's still calling himself Pablo. Pablo, I want to get to it now. <laughs> I used to love back in. This is a genuine suntan. Back in the day, I loved a sunbed. Yeah, like a sunbed, and we'd gone to Benidorm on a stag do. Um, and because I was that tanned up before I got there, when I got there, I effectively come out a black man. The bar woman, the barman used to call me Pablo, <laughs> as in taking the piss. Look yeah, at this fella. Yeah. So that's it, it stuck with me all the way through. So there's no connotations to our Colombian mm. friend. Um, Is there anything else you want to clear up? No, that's it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we'll, li we'll leave it at that. <laughs> oh, absolutely fantastic, man. So please, if you want to support... Lee, um, do you just want to include your Instagram link or do you want to also include your email address? Put my email on there, pal. Um, there's, yeah. con you can contact him through Instagram or through his email. Yeah. Let us know in the comments what you thought about this. Huge thank you to all people who've subscribed to the channel. Subscription logo is in the corner of the screen. Um, biggest thank you of all to Lee for coming in today and just sharing this fantastic story with its highs and lows, being so authentic and so nice and um you know it's yeah. it, it, it's good to see him get through that lowest moment when he, he could have ended his life and to be where he is today because when you're depressed you don't understand the miracle of your own existence but you can see the joy back in him now he's just started telling his story on the socials and i imagine that's going to open many big doors for him as it has done for many other people who go on podcasts doors are opened they get out, get out there and, and do events and get books and, and educate young people through schools talks. Mm. So hopefully we'll see Lee on a very similar path. We do usually end the podcast with a hug, but because the thing going around the world is spreading so rapidly right now, we are abiding by the um, social distancing guidelines for media workers. Um, so that is the end of this podcast. Let us know in the comments what you thought and huge thank you to you, Lee, for coming on. Thank Cheers. you, mate. I appreciate your time yeah, and yeah. making this uh, a stress-free environment <laughs> and I've enjoyed meeting you, mate, the story, uh, and I wish you all the best in the future. Touche. Cheers, Lee. Thank you. Cheers, bud. Yeah, thanks. Thanks.